Hey everyone, I'm a huge fan of all scary things, and even the unexplained. I even have my own YouTube channel, where I post interviews that I have done with people who have experienced any sort of paranormal activity. However, there is one thing that I've always been, well, quite a skeptic about, and that is skinwalkers. I mean, witches who transform into animals? and apparently are only confined to a specific area within America. To me it always sounded like the typical legends and stories about the boogeyman, you know, that parents tell you about. However, there are some events that have been happening that have actually made me doubt everything. And now I'm sharing this story so that you all can avoid what I did and also see if anyone out there can actually help me. My friend Zanny is of Navajo descent. He always shared cultural insights and stories of the res with me. It was during one of our discussions over text that he first introduced me to the legends of the skinwalkers. He said something about shape-shifting humans. And with curiosity, I gladly accepted his invite to visit the res. Being a YouTuber or media creator, I plan to stay for a week hoping to go deeper into these stories, do some research, capture photos of notable sites, and gather first-hand accounts from the locals. The res was unlike any place I've been to. With its landscapes perfect for photos, it was both beautiful and eerie. Over the first few days, I kept finding myself busy from visiting the local trading post, hanging out at community events, I learned about their daily lives, taking photos and setting up casual interviews with all sorts of people and the locals about these so-called skinwalkers. However, of course, the people of the rest met my questions about skinwalkers with different reactions. Some would actually cast their eyes downward, offering nothing more than a no comment. Others stared back with a stern look warning me of the consequences of prying too deep into the things that are best left alone. Yet, a few brave souls did share stories about so-called coyotes who transform into humans. Apparently, they can mimic certain voices and animal sounds. How one should not whistle at night, as it's believed that this might actually invite or summon a skinwalker. So during my time there, I stayed in the Hogan that belonged to Sani's grandma. But at the moment, nobody was staying in it, except for Sani. For those unfamiliar, a Hogan is a traditional Navajo dwelling place. Constructed from a mixture of logs, there's actually some spiritual significance for the Navajo. It's almost like you can feel a connection to the land, and the door to the Hogan always faces east to greet the morning sun which apparently is important in their daily rituals and traditions. After my string of interviews and questions on the res, words seemed to have traveled fast. On the fifth day of my stay, I was outside the Hogan trying to capture photos of the beautiful sunset when I noticed an older man approaching. He moved with a slow pace and his clothing was traditional and around his neck were hanging all sorts of amulets that were making noise with each step that he took. Zanny, who had been inside the Hogan, stepped out and immediately went silent upon seeing this man. He whispered to me, that's Tahoma, one of the respected medicine men around these parts. Before I could ask more, Tahoma was already within earshot. His piercing eyes, set deep and locked with mine, you're the one asking about those whom walk on all fours, he stated, more than ask. I hesitated for a moment, taken back by his statement. Uh, yeah, I am, I admit it, extending my hand in greeting. I'm just curious about the legends and he ignored my hand, cutting me off with a stern. Curiosity can lead to places from where there's no return. I felt a knot tighten in my stomach. I was trying to keep the conversation going. Hey, no disrespect. I'm just here to learn more about the culture and the stories. 
Tahoma stared deep into my eyes, as if he was studying my words. After what felt like an eternity, he spoke in a grave tone. There are things on this land that you don't understand, that you cannot comprehend, with your questions and your cameras. You awaken things best left, undisturbed. I gulp, the weight of his words pressing down on me. Hey man, I apologize if I offended or overstepped, I said. He leaned in closer, and with a hushed voice filled with urgency, he warned, leave this place. They have taken notice of you, and they don't like you watching them. With that, he turned and walked away, leaving behind the silence. My friend, looking as pale as I felt, said, when Tahoma speaks, we listen. I've been trying to tell you that these things are real, man. That night, the environment of the Hogan felt different, more ominous, if anything. Every small noise outside made me jump, and the once comfortable walls felt suffocating. I couldn't shake off the medicine man's warning, even though, to be honest, I didn't believe him. Despite the tension that hung in the air that night, a part of me still doubted most of these things. I hadn't personally witnessed any evidence of skinwalkers or the supernatural during my stay so far. And stories and legends were one thing, but tangible proof was another thing. The medicine man's warning, a little scary I will admit, could just be a way to dissuade outsiders like me from prying too deep into Navajo traditions, I thought. I'm not gonna lie, that night, all the skinwalker talk had me a bit on edge. I guess the fact of being out here kind of didn't help. I had to use the restroom so I stepped out the Hogan and walked towards the dimly lit outhouse. As I was sitting down remembering that next time to not indulge in other cultural food so quickly, the distant sounds of the wilderness were interrupted by other noises that I started to hear, which were soft footsteps. The rustle of brush nearby and the quiet creak of shifting dirt, it felt as if someone or something was slowly circling the outhouse, each footstep sounding closer than the last. Drawing in a silent breath, I waited, heart pounding, straining my eyes to see any trace of movement through the small cracks in the wooden structure, but I didn't see anything. Then. A tap at the door. Keep in mind this was around 11 at night. So I said out loud. Hey I'm in here. No response. Then. I heard what sounded like. Perhaps a dog scampering away on all fours. With the running steps fading into the distance. Well. That was weird. I thought. As I finished up handling my business. I slowly unlatched the door and stepped out. Cautiously scanning the darkness. I kid you not. As soon as I took two, three steps from behind me, I felt a force clamp down on my shoulder, causing me to jump nearly out of my skin. That's when I turned around and I saw it. The face of Zanny with a roaring sound and then a loud laugh. Catching my breath and shaking my head, I said, Well, all right, you got me, dude. I admit it. He started to laugh, throwing an arm around my shoulders as we began to walk back to the Hogan. You have to admit, he began, sweeping an arm out and pointing to the landscape. The rest is beautiful out here at night. Without the bright city lights, everything feels more alive, more connected. I took a moment to appreciate the beauty around us, the clear sky filled with numerous stars. It's beautiful out here, Sani. But I do want to let you know, it feels like we're the only ones out here. Some of these stories, legends, they just seem like traditions to be honest. Passed down to make sure that everybody respects the land. He looked at me, then nodded. Well, that's fair. But some traditions are born from truth that has actually been forgotten. Sani said as we continue our walk back to the Hogan. On my last night at the res, I decided to indulge in a bit of mischief and to get back at Zanny for the prank he pulled. 
While heading back from the outhouse again, I tiptoe around the Hogan, tapping gently on its walls and trying to mimic the eerie skinwalker sounds I heard they made. I was hoping that maybe Sani would start reciting a prayer that he told me that the people do whenever there's a skinwalker around. I was waiting to see if Sani came out when I noticed little bundles near the Hogan's base. With curiosity, I took out my phone and captured a few pictures, thinking it would add a unique touch to my video. And nearby, I saw stones, fixed in a way that seemed to be a ritual circle. I moved a few rocks to get a better picture. Then, laughing quietly to myself, and seeing that Sani was not reacting to this, I began to whistle. And then, in a mocking demonic voice, I called out, Zanny, it is I who walk on all fours. There was only silence. And after about five more minutes, and seeing that he still wasn't coming, I decided to take some last final shots of the beautiful landscape, as I knew this was my last night there. When I finally returned inside, Zanny was there, snoring away. I chuckled to myself, thinking, well, if a real skinwalker ever shows up, you'll be of no help with that deep sleep. The next morning I said bye to Zanny and his grandma and thanked them for their hospitality. I also told Zanny I would contact him once I put a video together and that before publishing, I would send it to him to make sure he was okay with it. When I returned home to edit some of the videos and pictures, I noticed that something was off. In the background of many interviews, were shadows flickering in and out of the frame. Even when I was trying to edit some of the interviews I had done, the audio itself sounded distorted with what sounded like whispering echoes behind the words of those whom I interviewed. However, it was the pictures that really disturbed me. Every single image that I had taken, even in the daylight, had a faint shadow figure growing more and more clear with each picture. And the most scary picture was the last few that I took after rearranging those stones. The picture was supposed to be of the landscape, but instead there was a blurry silhouette of what looked to be a person. It had elongated limbs and also a twisted, unnatural posture. Nervously, I contacted Zanny and after explaining everything, he went quiet, saying that he would ask the local medicine man for advice. The next day Zanny called, his voice sounded worried. He told me I might have caught the attention of something and that he's communicating with Tahoma, the medicine man, to perform a ceremony. They believe it might help cleanse whatever I had caught the attention of. That same night, as I was asleep in my room, I was awoken by what sounded like whistling outside my window. I woke up half asleep, and I swear, I heard a voice coming from my closet, saying, I'm in here, mimicking my response that I gave when I was in the bathroom that night in the res. I'm posting this here because, out of all the places on the internet, I figure this community might be the most understanding. If anyone knows what I can do to make things right, or how to protect myself, please let me know. I will provide an update tomorrow once Annie tells me how the ceremony went. But please, take this serious. I'm starting to panic as I'm typing this. And I swear, every time I glance at the dim reflection on my PC, when I change a window or tab, that distorted, twisted figure from that last photo I took seems to be standing right behind me. I'm not scared of anything. That's what I yelled to my brother as I slammed the door to my car shut. But things have changed. I have changed. I remember his smirk, how he was holding out my jacket, 
the way he spouted off an endless list of things I should be scared of. Skinwalkers, wendigos, witches, and even other humans. He presented each one as reason after reason of why this idea was stupid, saying that I still had time to flake out and save face. I remember rolling my eyes, snatching my jacket from him, sliding into my car, and yelling that I'm not scared before speeding away into the dark outline of the mountains. They stood out stark against the setting sun, and boy, how I wish I would have listened. I was wrong, and he was right. Now, I'm scared. But let me back up a bit. It all started about two days ago. I was out of my mind depressed. I could barely get out of bed. I thought about throwing myself in front of cars, over bridges, off buildings, just dying. I thought about dying all the time, and enough was enough. One of the few friends I had brought up the idea that I should try solo camping, and it might clear my mind that the wilderness, the silence, the solitude would do me good. He gave me a list of spots. Some were more isolated than the others. And of course, being in the situation that I was, I decided on the most isolated one. This one was about a three hour hike from the last campsite, far out in the Rocky Mountain National Forest. I remember his face, the surprise, the acceptance. Are you sure about this? His voice cracked. I nodded, saying nothing. It's a pretty secluded place, especially for a first time camper. He shrugged. But then again, it's a beautiful spot. It'll definitely give you some perspective. And the night sky out there is insane. I said thanks and turned to leave, but he spoke up again. A word of advice from a veteran. Don't go out at night, no matter what you hear. You might end up getting fucked up by a bear or lion. The drive up the mountains was soothing. The gently curving roads that wove their way through the trees and up the rocks were exciting to navigate. And soon, my mind was now in a peaceful state. I decided to leave electronics this trip, even going as far as securing my phone in my glove box. I wanted to be completely free of all that shit, able to focus on the moment, then to let my mind wander into the past or fear the future. I would be gone for five days and four nights. Enough time for me to hopefully recover and reassess my life and what I was doing with it. I found the entrance to the park with ease and continued to the closest lot to my campsite. Nighttime was arriving and I silently cursed myself for leaving so late. I sat in my vehicle for a good 30 minutes before deciding that it would be too risky hiking three hours in near pitch black. There were four other tents set up in the lot. I found some room for one more, and soon, I had my own tent set up. The night was very comfortable. I was surrounded by people talking, laughing people and happy children who ran around and round screaming. A few of them offered me roasted hot dogs and s'mores, and even beers and I filled my belly. I was rolled up in my sleeping bag before the last dying embers faded away. The second night didn't go as smooth. I woke up late, well rested, but still groggy and took my time repacking my tent. I hesitated at first, wondering if I should just stay there. But at 3 p.m. another family showed up with proof they had reserved the site. So I gathered my things and set off, and I quickly got lost. Navigating by map and compass for the first time and alone is a lot more difficult than it sounds. And the trees, the trees can be misleading. They can turn you around, make you think you're on the right path. When really, you're miles from where you're supposed to be. Instead of taking me three hours to get to the site, it took me almost twice that time. And I was quickly losing what little light was left in the day. Finally, I found the site. I quickly set up my tent building a small fire in front. It was dark now, and I was jumpy. 
Every sound I heard was magnified. Every shadow cast by the dim light of the fire. A menace. With fear, I crawled into the tent and crawled up in my bag, trying to will myself into sleep. After a while, I was snoozing, about to drift off, when I heard it. The sound of a foot crunching outside. My eyes shot open, and I reached for my flashlight, but didn't turn it on. I waited. I heard the sound again. Someone, or something, was definitely walking around my tent. It sounded like whoever this was, was trying to be quiet. It went on for hours in inconsistent bursts, until I finally decided it was an animal, scavenging for the scraps or inspecting my tent. By dawn I was snoozing again, and the noise had finally stopped. I told myself I would sleep for an hour or two, giving myself time to rest up. I woke up confused, exhausted, and groggy, and started to panic before remembering I was out camping, and that I needed to start hiking back now. But when I came out the tent, I saw that the sun was already setting. To say I was upset would be an understatement. I hesitated for a moment, trying to decide what to do. I wanted to go home. I wanted to leave, see how far I could get out there. But deep down I knew I would get lost, and most likely end up in a worse situation. So I began collecting as much wood as I could to build a big ass fire and get ready to hunker down for the night. The light from the sun seemed to disappear fast. The third night was pretty problematic. I sat awake in my tent for hours after the sun went down, waiting. The darkness around me seemed to crush the light from the fire, making it seem like a small tiny candle in a sea of shadows. For hours I sat there, listening, afraid. Finally, I realized I was just being ridiculous. That what I heard the night before was actually nothing to fear. That my monkey mind was just playing tricks on me, keeping me alert for no reason. So I bundled myself up and lay down, and that's when I heard it. Softly at first. A footstep. Then two. Three. Growing louder. I sat up and felt my eyes increase to the size of saucers, and my breath quickened. What was that? I had to know. I was operating purely off of fear. I heard the noise. It sounded like something running and running around and around my tent. Suddenly, the side of my tent pushed in as if someone was slapping it from the outside. Hey, I'm awake. I'm in here. I tried to stand, tripping myself up in my sleeping bag in the process, and slammed into the front of my tent. Scrambling up, I quickly unzipped the flap and ran outside with a red tinted flashlight. That's when I saw a shape scurry away, and I quickly followed. And there, standing at the edge of the firelight, barely visible, was the silhouette of a person. They were standing with their back towards me. Their arms were hanging in strange positions by their sides. Their head pointed straight away from me. I took a step towards them, and a branch cracked underneath me. The sound seemed to startle the person, and they turned their head so slightly. Hey, I said again. What, what the, the fuck, fuck, man? A sound that crescended into a scream. It was a laughing sound, and it echoed around me rattling around in my head. I ran, leaping into my tent, sipping it up behind me, crawling into my sleeping bag, crying. And that's when the world around me exploded, or rather imploded. The walls of the tent shook, like hundreds of hands were slapping it, poking it, punching it. Outside, what sounded like dozens of people running around shattered the silence. I don't know how or when I fell asleep, I actually think I fainted. Either way, I woke up the next day to a reddish glow surrounding me. I sat up and ran outside, looking around for proof of what I heard. But there was nothing. No footprints, handprints, or any disturbance at all. Man, fuck all this, I said to myself, throwing my things chaotically into my bag. 
I'm gonna leave today, in the dark. I couldn't stay another night here. I was just starting to unpull the tent when I heard it. A sound in the distance, perhaps carried to me by the wind, which was picking up around me. Help me, help me, please. Oh God, oh God, help me. I reacted more out of instinct than logic and began running towards the sound before realizing that I, in no way, was in a place to help whoever was screaming. Still, I tried to locate the source of the sound, following the voice for about 30 minutes. Where are you? I yelled looking around me through the maze of trees. I'm here. I'm over here. Where are you? I'm over here. Where are you? Where are you? Cleta's screams descended into a deep unsettling laughter. Scared out of my mind, I turned and ran back the way I came. By some miracle, I made it back to my site, grabbed my pack, and uprooted the post of the tent, thinking that I would just roll it up and carry it back, instead of taking the time to fold it neatly and shove it into its bag. As I pulled each pole, the tent was falling a little bit, but it was only on the third pole out of six that I realized it wasn't falling fully flat. Confused, I peered into the tent and reeled in horror, too afraid to even scream. There was someone sitting inside, but not just anyone. It was me sitting there, pale and bone thin, a too wide grin plaster on my face. A single droplet of blood rolled down from each eye, which instead of having green eyes were totally black. I jumped back, tripping over my own feet. Laughing rose up around me again as I scrambled up to my feet, and I saw my hand that was in my hand reach out from the tent, followed by the other, then the head. This face looked up at me, still smiling, then laughed again. I screamed and I ran, and I kept running. I don't even know if I was running the right way, but I couldn't even use the sun anymore for guidance since it had almost fully set. I ran without looking where I was going. I kept looking behind me to see if that thing was following me. I could feel the trees scratching me up, pushing against me like they were trying to hold me back, almost holding me still until that thing came for me. Suddenly, a light flashed in my face and I ran into something solid, something black, something that wrapped around me. I instantly cowered, hiding my face in my hands. Fuck. Oh, please, God, no. I heard my own voice, terrified, shaking. Hey, calm down. It's all right. You just scared me. What's wrong? I looked up into the gray eyes of a human face. The face of a middle-aged man, to be exact. He was holding me up. The flashlight he was using lay falling at our feet. I looked back, fearful of what I might see. But there was nothing. Only trees swinging slowly in the slight breeze. Hey, um, was that you? Screaming? I came out here to check. I couldn't speak. I was too terrified. I shook my head. Were you camping out there alone? He asked, letting me go and bending down to retrieve the flashlight. I nodded, then began crying. Hey, it's alright. It can be spooky out here. My car is right over there. He gestured with his head back behind him. I wiped my nose and blinked, finally finding my voice. Who are you? He glanced at me then away. Um, a park ranger. But he didn't look like one. He was wearing a smooth black suit, black tie, and white shirt. And his shoes were polished leather, not even hiking boots. Come on now, he said again taking my pack and swinging it into his back. As he did so, his jacket flapped slightly and I saw what looked like a handgun strapped to his belt. How did you find me? He shrugged. Good hearing, I guess. We entered a small clearing and I saw a black SUV with tinted windows, headlights flaring, with the engine still running. He popped the trunk and threw my bag in as I climbed into the passenger's side seat. He climbed into the driver's seat and asked me where he should take me. I told him the lot number and we were on our way. 
he flipped the cubby between us open and pulled out a bag. Do you want corn nuts? He asked, holding out the bag to me. I took it gratefully and began chomping away. I licked my fingers then looked back at him. So, are you really a park ranger? He looked at me, then back to the road. But still, I stared at him, transfixed. He looked exhausted, his wood-colored hair dirty from the forest. I, um... The SUV jerked to a sudden stop and the man let out a slow, low breath. His eyes narrowed and he looked over at me, then back to the dirt trail in front of us. I followed his gaze, feeling the fear churning up inside me. And there, in the middle of the road, was me. The other me. Its limbs were hanging limply, as if they were broken, and that sickly smile was still plastered across its face. Then, it waved. The man looked back at me, then back at this thing that wasn't me, then back at me, and then again, I met his gaze. Alright, fuck that, I don't get paid enough for this shit. The man said before slamming his foot on the accelerator straight towards the thing. We both felt the impact. The car bounced over the body and the man kept driving. But around us, in between the trees, stirred into the darkness, the laughing sound boiled up again. We finally reached the lot, bathed in the first light of the rising sun. The man behind me seemed to be deep in thought, distracted. I was still scared, but hopeful that whatever that thing was, it was now dead, crushed by the car, or at least so badly wounded that it would soon die. The SUV slowed to a stop, and the man popped the trunk and hopped out. He walked to the back and grabbed my pack as I jumped out. He handed it to me and I took it, then thanked him for everything. Not a problem, he said. All in a day's or night's work. His lips quiver as if he was about to smile. I turned to leave, but he spoke up again. Hey, I turned to face him again. If you ever want to talk about what you um saw, or, you know, just talk, call me. He held out a card. I took it and looked down at it. It was a black card, and only had a single number on it. There was no area code. So, um, I began, but I heard a door slam and looked up. The man was already back in his car. He waved at me, then sped off back the way we had come, back towards that thing. I shoved the card in my pocket, climbed into my car, and left. I still haven't told anyone about what happened, even when they ask why I refuse to go camping ever again. I just shrug and tell them that it wasn't my thing, that I prefer a warm bed, and the sounds of a busy city. Ever so often though, I'll sometimes pull out this card, my fingers lingering over the phone, wondering who the man really was, and if he would really be able to explain what happened to me. I'm gonna start off this story by explaining that it's not mine. I'm just the one who wrote it all down. I'm not Denye the actual name of the Navajo and this is how I'm going to refer to them from here on out I have never lived on a reservation and I know very little about their folklore I was actually in between of believing all these paranormal things for a really long time until something happened to me a few years ago that made me into a believer nothing to do with skinwalkers or things of that nature but it definitely made me believe in ghosts. This story was told by my Denia friend Sam and comes from his own experience. I met Sam on a photo gig a few years after graduating art school and we connected through our shared interest in the paranormal. We would tell stories about our personal paranormal experiences. All names have been changed at Sam's request for privacy and I'm using a different account. Sam also gave me permission to write this and fully cooperated with me as I put this together. According to him, he's too lazy and I have too much time on my hands, so he was fine with me putting this together for him. Sam is a full-blooded Denye 
His mother and father grew up in the nation near New Mexico. They had Sam at a very young age and broke up a few years after he was born. His mother moved back to Illinois with his now stepfather, who is white and Catholic. Sam grew up in Chicago suburb and lived the most of his childhood and teenage years there. He would visit his dad for a couple weeks a few times a year, but never really spent a huge amount of time out on the res. It was at 20 that Sam moved in with his dad on the reservation. He said to get a better understanding of his heritage, as he said it, and stay there till he was about 24. He was very interested in his Denia heritage, especially when he started developing his art practice as a painter and photographer. As he spent more and more time on the res, he grew a deep interest in Denia superstition. I guess as a way to connect to his culture that he felt he didn't do enough to be a part of during his childhood and teenage years, since he was raised in Midwestern suburban white culture because of his mother and stepdad. While on the res, he made friends with and eventually dated a girl that we're going to call Jess, who had fully grown up on the res. She was a little older than Sam and got her teaching degree in another state before coming back to the res to teach high school. She was basically agnostic, but had a very superstitious family. In fact, her great uncle, who we're gonna call John, was a medicine man. I'm not really familiar with the details surrounding this practice, and Sam also didn't talk too much about this, but basically, he was a very respected elder and was extremely superstitious. He often spoke of Dania folklore, creatures, magic, etc., and took it all very serious. John was pretty old and often needed help around his property, so Sam was quite often over there helping him out with odd jobs. Sam felt weird taking money from the old man, especially since Sam already had a part-time job as an art teacher and sold his paintings and photos in Santa Fe art markets. So as payment, Sam would ask John to share some of his knowledge with him. It was Sam's way of connecting to his heritage. He told me that they would talk for an hour or two every night that Sam came over to help. Sam would basically grill him on every random, denier related thing under the sun and would generally get an earful about it, except when it came to one specific topic, Yinadroshi. Sam, having spent most of his childhood with his mom and stepdad off the res, didn't have the same outlook on skinwalkers that other Denia did. The whole thing about not speaking about them wasn't something he subscribed to, mainly because A, Sam grew up in the Chicago area where no skinwalkers would be around anyways, and B, he was raised Catholic and didn't believe in Denia superstitions. He was pretty interested in this part of Denia culture because of how common skinwalkers were on the internet. So naturally, his interest in them disturbed John and he generally shut down any discussion of them. She got visibly upset and told him to never speak of them to her or her great uncle ever again. This was really weird to Sam since Jess wasn't superstitious or even religious for that matter. He thought that his agnostic girlfriend wouldn't be so weird about these things. She explained to Sam that, despite her being agnostic, that was one thing she knew was real, because she and other members of her family had experiences. She told him a very similar story to the types you'll see posted online. Late at night on the res, driving home, and seeing what you think is a coyote or a sheep following you at a great speed only upon closer inspection, see what appears to be human underneath animal skin, or a half man, half coyote kind of creature. This happened to Jess when she was a little girl, while being driven home by her father. Great Uncle John came and performed some sort of protection cleansing ritual that they thought would cover them, at least for a few years. It wasn't until Jess moved back after getting her degree did she encounter one again, this time running along the rooftops of some homes and buildings in town. She thought somehow someone's dog got up on their roof. 
but it would then get on two legs and jump to the next building. After landing, it would stay up there, sitting cross-legged, staring at her with yellow eyes. She ended up speeding home so fast that she got pulled over by the tribal police. When she explained what she saw and why she was speeding, the officer told her to be quiet, tore up the ticket he was writing, and told her to get her ass home. Uncle John came by again and performed the ritual. Jess said that according to John, the creature wasn't after her and was caught in the act of stalking someone else. That made it set its eyes upon her, so she was to be extra cautious. And this is why she stands firm by the words of, shut the fuck up about them forever. She only told Sam all of this to keep the things off her and her family. But wouldn't you know it, that just made him more interested. And who could blame him? It seems as though Sam kind of whittled down John's resolve on the issue. Because eventually, the old man budged a little bit. He revealed to Sam a few bits and pieces of information over the years. I'm just going to copy and paste from some Instagram messages he sent me. Please note that the only changes I made to his messages were the names of those involved. Also, in case it isn't obvious, Sam likes to abbreviate Skinwalker to SW. The first thing John told me about skinwalkers was that they can't actually read minds like they say in the stories and stuff. It was basically what you'll call an old wife's tale because they didn't want their kids talking about that shit and spreading the idea that this was something people could do. I actually think they wanted the practice of being skinwalkers to die out completely. So they thought by forbidding people from talking about it, nobody would be curious enough to try out black magic and shit. I think because Denye are so steeped in oral traditions that they basically believe that if enough people stop talking about a thing, it dies forever. But you know real well that you can't tell people not to talk about something. So they said that if you talk about skinwalkers, it will make them interested in you and seek you out. It was just them trying to scare kids. The other thing is that they are just regular people, not monsters. They don't have any special powers. They just know a lot about certain things that a lot of us don't. Like how there are things you know how to do as a video guy for example. That regular people who never done it don't. Like when you show them a really cool edit you did or shots you pulled off. And they're like how did you do that? It's the same kind of stuff. They just spend a lot of time learning about stuff that makes them able to do what they do. They studied animals and how they move. Making suits. Studied poisons. Shit like that. They're actually medicine men just like John. In fact, a lot of them are openly good medicine men in the community. And nobody knows they practice this stuff. It's just another form of their medicine men stuff. But they use it for people who want to harm or scare others. Like they get hired to fuck with people. John told me this one story about a close friend who was also a medicine man in the city area. That had an asshole in the neighborhood who kept bitching about his property lines or something like that. He was building a fence and there was a big fuss about it. The guy was harassing the shit out of his next door neighbor because of it. But the neighbor knew where his land started and ended so he didn't budge. Eventually some weird shit started to go down. The asshole's neighbor was talking about how there was a giant coyote in his backyard that would look in the windows at night and scare the fuck out of him and his girlfriend. He would hang in his backyard with a shotgun around sundown, which of course would weird out everyone in the neighborhood, and a lot of folks were saying that he was mentally unstable. But then people in the neighborhood started hearing fucked up noises, and someone saw a coyote stand on its hind legs and look in the windows. Then one day, the guy's girlfriend drove him back to the emergency room, because he was having a really bad trip apparently, hallucinating and talking about this coyote man who was saying that he was going to kill him. John doesn't know what he was on, if it was some kind of drug or something. He came down a few hours later and a lot of people in town laughed it off, but John's friend and a few other people in the neighborhood, like I assume the ones who actually saw the coyote man, knew that it was most likely a skinwalker fucking with him. 
John said that skinwalkers know a lot about medicine, how to get the results they want from them, and how to administer them to victims without them knowing. Like they know so much about the compounds and shit, that they know exactly how it will affect you, and how to fuck with you when you're on them. So John's friend came by to bless the place, and perform a ritual, and the weird shit stopped. Because skinwalkers are medicine men themselves, they also believe in the power of the rituals that are used against them. That's how I would say these things work. Nothing super magical or paranormal about it. They just have strong beliefs and know what to fuck with and what not to. Anywho, so he thinks that this asshole neighbor got a skinwalker on him to get him to move out of town or something like that. The last thing John told me for a really long time was about how skinwalkers were actually good guys at one time. They created that whole practice to fuck with the colonizers. They protected other people and scared away anybody trying to take the land. But some started using the practice for their own gain. And once the treaties were signed and we got land back and all that, they just started using it to do bad stuff to other Denye. After this, John basically closed the door on the skinwalker talk. Sam told me he thought it was weird that John didn't want to talk about them. After all, John said it himself that skinwalkers can't read minds and talking about them didn't draw their attention to you. As Sam said, it's an old wife's tale. He even told this to Jess but she shot him down. She actually kind of insulted him apparently, telling Sam that he's not a real Denye. So he doesn't understand, and him trying to get into this deep skinwalker stuff was actually offensive to their heritage. And that's part one. I will be posting the second part soon, which will begin to cover some more elements of skinwalker lore that I thought was a lot more interesting than what John initially led on. I realized that the last post presented a grounded realistic idea of the skinwalker. But this is where we start getting into some real supernatural shit. And because of that, I do want to say everything with a disclaimer. That what I'm about to tell you, I cannot verify. I am not Denye, and I know very few folks who are native, much less culturally native. I don't live anywhere near the four corners either. This is all from the recollection of one Dania friend of mine who is retelling stories and information given to him by a much older man. Believe what you can or take everything with a grain of salt. I hope it's a fun read. I'm warning you, it's much longer this time around. After learning the truth about skinwalkers and being scolded by his girlfriend, Sam took the clue and for a while focused his time spent with John on things the old man actually wanted to talk about. Sam learned a lot about his culture and the practice of medicine man and worked on this gorgeous 4x5 portrait series of elderly folks on the res. Sam told me that it was around this time that he realized he was pretty cautious in the way he approached the skinwalker subject. He was just a dumb kid raised in white America who thought he was being curious about his native culture, when actually, he was spending more time chasing scary stories than actually learning about his people. By the time Sam had been living on the rest for about four or so years, he even got a full-time teaching job at one of the reservation schools. He moved out of his dad's place and got his own. Sam always had planned to move back to Illinois or to some bigger city with more of an art scene, but wanted to spend much more time on the res, at least another five years or so. Despite that desire to stay and his new job, he and Jess ended up moving to my city only a few months into his full-time position, and that's around the time that I actually met him. His usual response to why they both left was that he needed to be somewhere with a bigger art scene and community and Jess wanted to go back to school to get an MSW. But it wasn't until I got to know him well and we started bonding over our shared interest in the paranormal that he actually tell me why they left. Here are the DMs that he sent me. John was getting up there in age, late 80s. The guy lived a long life, 
had some cancer in his 60s and beat it. But he would tell me that he always wondered when it would come back to take him. I think it was like in 2014 or something. As a side note, Sam moved to the res in 2010 and met John a few months after that. So he was diagnosed with lung cancer that spread to his liver, colon, and he was only given a few months to a year to live. Fucking sucked to hear because we were basically brothers by this point. For being as old as he was, he was really sharp. After being diagnosed with cancer, Jess, her father, and Sam spent a lot more time with the old man helping him around the house. At this point in his life he was only in bed and had refused to be put in hospice care as he thought it was a waste of the family's money for, as Sam put it, a more comfortable way of dying. A few months in, Sam received a call from John asking him to come over that evening. And here's the message from Sam. He told me that he had some stuff he wanted to tell me that he didn't want to die with him. I assume he felt like he was on his way out based on that. I packed my recorder in case he was okay with me recording him. When Sam arrived, John was just sitting in his porch, watching the sunset. He beckoned Sam to sit next to him and told him that he had some last bits of knowledge to share with him. When Sam mentioned that he brought his camera with him, John allowed him to film, with his only request being that he wouldn't show it to anyone and that he would stop recording when he told him to. This is what Sam sent me. We spent like an hour or so just talking about whatever came to his mind. It was a lot of stuff like I told you before. Stuff like parts of the reservation that are cursed. Pathways or portals to other dimensions. And then stuff like how to bless your home. What plants do what. How to find your way home if you're lost in the desert. Also some songs and prayers that I had to have on tape because it was in the language and I'm actually trash at it. It was like he was trying to cover everything he felt like he hadn't told me before, as he never actually passed on his knowledge to one before. He said he was keeping some knowledge for himself, but he still wanted to share what he felt comfortable with. It was here that I asked Sam why John would tell his great niece's boyfriend from Chicago out of this, if it's supposed to be secrets and stuff that stay within the Dania people. It's a little bit different than that. Like I did a lot for him. Renovated his home. Built him a patio. Even helped him get internet. And gave him my old MacBook and showed him how to use it. I gave him my old Wii. And he became fucking obsessed with Wii Sports. Pretty sure he felt like he owed me because of everything I helped him with. And I always refused to take a single penny. I get why it seems weird. But... Also, I feel like he didn't have anyone interested enough to just sit down and hear him talk for hours on end. So I guess he appreciated me for that or something. Or maybe he was actually just fucking with me. But I doubt it. He was pretty sharp in his old age and also was a genuine guy. After the sun went down, John requested that they turn off the camera and go inside. Once inside, he told Sam to turn on the TV and raise the volume. He explained that it was important that no one hear their conversation. According to Sam, the old man didn't have any neighbors for miles, so he actually found that strange, at least until he learned what their conversation was about. I haven't been honest with you about Yina Droshi, he said. He then requested that Sam burn some plants, herbs, mixtures of some sort that he had to put on top of the logs in his fireplace. This was so that, according to John, no one in this world, or the other, could hear them. It seems, and this is just Sam's reading of the situation, that John thought by writing skinwalkers off as just assholes who dress in animal skins and drug people with shrooms to fuck with them, he would discourage the young man from ever looking any further into the legends. And while that was definitely true, there were skinwalkers who had no powers, no connection with the supernatural, and were just Dania fanatics who played dress up. That was only part of the story. Yina Droshis exist in two different natures. The first kind, John had already explained to Sam. 
medicine man with no actual supernatural powers, just a very extensive knowledge of various medicine compounds, able to craft very convincing outfits of animal pelts, and can move and behave very similar to whatever animal they wish to mimic. These folks were accessible to the general population on the res. When I say accessible, of course, I don't mean just anyone can seek them out. It takes someone well connected. These skinwalkers would often receive monetary compensation for their deeds. They based this entire practice on the legends of the shapeshifters and dark witches in Denye folklore. This explains a good portion of skinwalker stories and lore that you see posted online. Large coyotes or sheep behaving strange, only to, upon closer inspection, reveal that they are a person wearing animal skins. But what about the other stories? The stories of these creatures, half man, half beast, pulling off on natural speeds around the res, running alongside cars at top speed, mimicking voices, reading and even controlling minds, immune to firearms, shape-shifting into incredibly convincing, terrifying wolf-like creatures, glowing red or yellow eyes and faces that are not human or animal. Well, you guessed it. Those are real Yinadroshis powerful, dark witches who have scared the Denye and sometimes others for centuries. John said that skinwalkers developed around the time when the first colonizers arrived. Medicine men and the tribes were incredibly cautious of these visitors and as time went on they revealed themselves to be conquerors. The medicine man, as Sam put it, turn to the dark side. In order to scare them off, medicine men back then knew that by turning to the practice of black magic, there wasn't really any turning back. Black magic robs them of humanity and corrupts their souls, but they believed that they could do this for the good of their people. And then, once the colonizers were driven out, be dealt with by their own people. In fact, some medicine men revealed their plans for this to other members of their practice who opted not to participate in the rituals. They gave them detailed instructions on how to protect themselves and even kill them when necessary. Unfortunately, we know how this turned out. And now, we have the unique Denia problem of the skinwalkers. And unlike the other skinwalkers, the pretenders in animal fur these Yinadroshis are not human, or at least not in the sense that is recognized by the Denye. In order to become one of these things, they must participate in a ceremony that essentially robs them of their humanity, and after a long enough time living as one of them, they barely even resemble a human in appearance. Think of the Wendigo, a creature that was once human but through some horrific, twisted process or ritual, became something else. The practice of being a skinwalker is guarded, even more so than that of the pretenders. It requires committing horrible acts, murder, or torture of a family member or friend, ingesting poisons and human flesh, and communicating with entities from other dimensions. Skinwalkers are also a people unto themselves, an isolated subculture of the Denye that branched off a long time ago. Even though they make their home in the same region as the Denye, they generally do not live among them. They are a completely separate community. John did not go into great detail on the process of becoming a skinwalker. He said no man who calls himself Denye would ever know such things. That might have been true a century ago, when skinwalkers still lived among the people, but in this day and age, the skinwalker is much too concerned with being found out, and so they isolate themselves, and brought all knowledge with them. Think of those tribes that are still being discovered in the jungles of Africa and South America, completely cut off from the rest of the world. Only this tribe 
is aware of the rest of the people and actually chooses to isolate. That all being said, of course, they still do go out among the people. It's just always at night, among only a small group of folks, and only for their own dark purposes. Exactly what skinwalkers gain from their behavior towards the Denye is disrupted among medicine men. John's understanding was that, aside from stealing livestock, their abilities feed off the fear that they instill in others, and to their connection to whatever dark entities. But somebody dying directly at the hands of a skinwalker is extremely rare. John then went on to say how a lot of things that are sometimes attributed to deaths of despair, such as suicide, overdose, alcohol poisoning, etc., could be traced to very powerful skinwalkers. It said that a basic trait of the skinwalker is being able to instill fear in their victims, like a weak form of mind control. More powerful skinwalkers can actually cause folks to harm themselves. However, John wasn't sure if the mind control rumors were true. The powder of a corpse, the fable favorite weapon of the skinwalker, blown on their victims' faces, could actually be how they make these things happen. While some say that the powder of a corpse is a powerful poison that slowly kills over the course of a few days, leaving no trace of itself in one system. I heard of things like this before. Criminals in some parts of South America use something similar to make their marks essentially empty their bank accounts for them. John believes in both of these explanations. It is sometimes a cocktail of poison and human bone, and sometimes it's a drug, and the skinwalker uses this to instruct the victim to harm or kill themselves somehow. Having contact directly with their victims is too risky both for the individual skinwalker as well as their clan and is likely frowned upon. When a skinwalker does physically kill someone, the person either disappears or has their body found much later with their death ruled as an animal attack. John says that this is more common among weaker skinwalkers. One detail that stood out to Sam was the idea that skinwalkers communicate with other entities from other dimensions and he pressed John on this a bit more in Sam's words he knew I was raised Catholic so he explained them to me as basically being demons I don't remember what it was but even if I did I most likely couldn't spell it they are evil inhuman spirits that try and come into our realm or dimension or plane or whatever but don't exactly have a physical presence, so they possess people. Or in the case of skinwalkers, they use them as their connection to this world. So some skinwalkers do the bidding of demons, and in return, the demons give them powers. But John also said that some really old skinwalkers aren't even people anymore. They're only living as empty vessels, but demons live inside them. I guess the idea is that demons give them powers in exchange for letting the demon possess their body by using it as their flesh puppet after they die. According to John, they communicate with these beings through their knowledge of the portal system in the America Southwest. This included places that are off the reservation. Even though skinwalkers are careful about going off the res as it can be more densely populated and carries with it a risk of being discovered. The few times they do, they are good at keeping a low profile, being actual shapeshifters and all. But because of their nature, they can't resist feeding off the fear of others. So small groups of campers and people driving alone at night off the res have stories as well. Sometimes lone visitors outside the reservation, but that are close to a portal who are off camping, hiking, will straight up disappear under weird circumstances. This may be a stretch, but this reminded me of David's missing 411 research. I highly doubt skinwalkers are to blame for the majority of these mysterious disappearances. But what if John is saying is true, 
a few of them could have possibly fallen prey to one. These portals often exist in caves and small canyons and require a full ritual, offerings, dances, and a sacrifice to open. What the sacrifice is, John isn't sure, but he guesses that disappearing hikers may have something to do with it. When the portals open, they are used for different things, communicating with spirits and demons, gaining more power, summoning other entities into our world, or even throwing themselves or others into the portals and leaving this world. Sam asked why they would go into the portals and what existed beyond them. It was another dimension that allowed them to observe our world but not interact with it, as well as see things and beings that we cannot see or interact with in our own plane. He said that they would interact in that dimension with these things called Chendis, which are the evil spirits of those deceased said to be a manifestation of everything that was bad about a person. They would send Chendis out to not only harm others and spread illness, but also report on which people were growing wise to the skinwalkers. This was where the belief that skinwalkers are not to be discussed come from. Chendis can listen to your conversations and report back to the skinwalkers who commune with them, and then using portals, show them where the offending individual lived. It was very important to the skinwalkers that much of the general population know nothing about them, their culture, their practices, and most importantly, who they are. Nowadays, of course, because skinwalkers isolate, protecting their identities was not as crucial, as anyone who saw their original forms would never be able to recognize them as they were not members of the community. But John noted that there were select skinwalkers who would live alongside the communities, and sometimes in them, as a way of feeding off others' energy without directly stalking or scaring them. He told me a little story about this group of folks who lived near a weird old witch. This was back in the 1980s, I think. She would come into town but never buy anything from the stores or the markets or anything like that. Just walk around, stare at people. One day, a guy and his wife went into one of the cities off the rest for the weekend. And while they were at a restaurant, they saw her looking through the window at them. I actually painted this scene a while back. So they were wondering how the fuck she got out there and it scared the shit out of them. Like she just lived in a Hogan and she didn't even have a car. She ended up disappearing and that night the wife had a dream that the old lady had gone down on all fours and turned into a fucked up looking coyote. On their way back to the res the next evening they saw what they thought was an injured coyote on the side of the road. The husband was gonna get out to see what was up but the wife made him stop. The coyote was looking straight at her with the same stare that she saw in the old woman's eyes. It leapt up on its hind legs and ran off. The next day, the wife told everyone she could that the old lady was a skinwalker. Rumor has it that the old witch got sick and died the next day. Do take notice of the words, rumor has it. Many people believe that if you learn and tell others of a skinwalker's identity, it can spell disaster for them and is one of the few ways an average person can kill them. However, this is only partially true. It weakens the skinwalker by not only robbing them of their prey, but it doesn't kill them. But what does actually kill them? Other skinwalkers. According to John, the woman did not die of a random sudden illness. She simply left town. He believes to go back to her local skinwalker community. However, the next day she was found, not far from her own Hogan, dead and mauled by a pack of animals, wolf bites, bear claw marks, and even evidence of being trampled by a horse were found on her body. When the authorities found the body, 
a local medicine man, whom John actually knew, instructed the police to say that she died of an illness. He wanted people to remain unaware that a community of skinwalkers was in her midst, so no curious, stupid folks would go looking for them. And that's part two. I'll post part three tomorrow. Third part will go into detail on why Sam left the reservation. So again, full disclaimer, I cannot verify any of these stories. Believe what you can, or take it all with a grain of salt. So if skinwalkers are, say for a select few, an isolated group, how do they add more to their ranks? They used to be easier to join, like if you were a medicine man and knew how to find them and had completed the first ritual on your own. They will let you go through the rituals and train you. You have to complete the first ritual before even looking for the skinwalkers. That way they know that you reached the point of no return. John said that he didn't know the actual rituals, but he assumed it was the part where you kill a close friend or family member. So you couldn't really go back to your regular way of living. And so you robbed yourself of your humanity too. It's how they know that you're real. Otherwise, they just kill you on the spot. John told Sam he had no idea how skinwalkers were recruited. The most likely scenario would most likely be kidnapping someone very young and grooming them to murder the family they were taken from or choosing to share their knowledge with people that the demons have scouted out as a spirit and potential addition to their ranks. It should be noted that according to John, pretenders almost never became real skinwalkers. No info on why. Sam and I guess that they most likely want the pretenders to do their thing and continue to exist, to throw folks off their trail. Finally, John had one last piece of information to share. Yes, these skinwalkers actually did transform into animals, and it was often to varying degrees of success. The more skilled skinwalkers could mimic an animal perfectly to the point where you wouldn't be able to pick them out among a pack. But the issue is, a normal old coyote or sheep isn't scary if it looks and behaves exactly as it should. So skinwalkers on purpose transform into imperfect or unnatural creatures. Things such as larger size, weird proportions, even human features mixed in. One story that stood out to me in regards to the way skinwalkers present, mainly because it had to do with the infamous skinwalker ranch. My personal least favorite skinwalker story because it sounds so ridiculous and is barely even about actual skinwalkers. Okay, so first of all, let me say I think skinwalker ranch is mostly bullshit. John's heard the stories and says it's white people crap. People say it's land is cursed by Denye because it was stolen from us and they think we got a skinwalker on it but we know that's not possible because they exist separate to the Denye and we can't summon them but there was a skinwalker on the land several most likely a tribe of skinwalkers that just refused to leave so people said it was a Denye curse but most of the crazy UFO shit just doesn't track with me or John Maybe some of it because Denya have seen shit, but I don't know, a lot of it sounds bunk. But anyways, the reason I bring up Skinwalker Ranch is because one of the stories from the white people who lived there was that they saw this big ass wolf, like bigger than any wolf in existence, the size of a horse maybe. This was actually true, I'm sure of it at least. They most likely added the UFO stuff for fun because just saying you saw a big wolf isn't a crazy enough story, but this wolf is an example of how they'll become a real animal, but they'll add some detail that doesn't add up or doesn't look right and actually makes it 10 times scarier. And sometimes the transformations aren't perfect anyways, and they keep it that way instead of trying to perfect it. 
There was this other story I heard online. Most likely about a guy who saw a giant Doberman looking thing with yellow eyes. But looked like it had bits of flesh hanging off. Almost like a zombie dog. I don't know how true the story is. But it does point out this characteristic. What happens when a skinwalker absorbs the skin of the animal they kill. But it's not a perfect animal. Or the skin has started to decompose before they absorb it. But it looks scary as fuck so they don't mind. I bet some of them even wait for the flesh to rot before it's absorbed. What Sam is talking about here is how they transform. Basically, they can only transform into animals they kill themselves. They must skin the animal and cover themselves in the pelt, often while it is still warm and bloody. After a certain period of time, the animal skin will be absorbed by the skinwalker, and not only will they gain the ability to transform into the animal at will, but some of the features of the beast will begin to show in the skinwalker's human form. This is how many older skinwalkers, as they age, begin to gradually lose human features, only to be replaced with more animal ones. Their human skin ages, even decays, while their animal skin does not, remaining in the same state it was when they absorbed it. This is where the stench of decay that many associate with skinwalkers comes from. It's the human being, rotting. John began noticing that the fire was dying down, and it was getting late. He told Sam that he is not to speak a word of what he was told while on the reservation. The only way in which their speech was protected from the prying demons was the mixture in the fireplace and the blessings that John had performed earlier in the day. The loud TV was there just in case anyone, human or skinwalker, was in the area and walked by to listen. He gave Sam a small wooden box filled with the same mixture he threw on the fire, as well as a few other various things that John said would protect him. He told Sam not to take his possessions of these things as some sort of free ticket to talk freely about skinwalkers. However, he said something about how he had many decades of experience in these matters and felt safe. Plus, he was going to die soon, so if a skinwalker took him out of his misery, so be it. Sam didn't have that luck, so he needed to walk on the side of caution. Off the res, he was free to blab all he wanted about the shapeshifters because as Sam said, who the fuck would believe me anyways? The next day, as Sam was getting ready to pack up and leave school, he received a call from John. Shouldn't have told you that stuff, he said, and then told him not to come by the property for a few days. He assured Sam that he had everything taken care of and was safe, but wanted to be sure. He hung up before Sam could even get a word in. He let Jess know what her great uncle had said over the phone, and naturally, Jess had to know what it was John told him about. Sam, hesitating, told her point blank that John had given him more info on the skinwalkers. He did not go into any level of detail on what it was John said, out of respect for the old man's wishes. Jess, according to Sam, went pale. It's so weird seeing your partner who you know is a big skeptic get scared by something like this. But I guess it just goes back to being raised Denya, hearing these stories and stuff. Also, just because you're agnostic doesn't mean you just don't have some belief in the paranormal. She told me that John most likely attracted someone's attention by talking about that shit. But that we have to trust that he knows what he's doing. And then she told me I can't speak a single word of what I heard. And I am never to ask or even allow John to tell me anything anymore. She said something like words have power. You're not culturally then yet, so you wouldn't get it. She laid into me a bit after that. I was kind of insulted, but in retrospect, she was right. It hurts to hear, but I think we all gotta take a step back. But Jess, alarmed as she was, put her trust in John and told Sam that they weren't to contact or visit his property until he said everything was okay. 
but that day never came. Two nights later, Sam and Jess were awoken by a phone call from Jess's father. John was in the hospital. His body was taking a turn for the worse. The two rushed to the hospital, but John had passed away of a heart attack before they got there. For a while after John's passing, Sam, Jess, and their families lived in a pretty uneventful life. Sam thinks it was a period of about three or four months of relative calm. Jess had started looking into getting an MSW out of state, and Sam was grappling with a decision of whether or not he wanted to stay on the res or follow Jess wherever she would go. I asked Sam if there was any tension between him and Jess because of everything that happened, but he said they both sort of dropped the entire argument about Sam messing with Skinwalker knowledge. He does not think that Jess attributes what happened to John as a result of bringing Skinwalker attention onto him. After these three to four months of calm were up, strange things began happening to Jess's family members. Her father, mother, and younger brother all complained of a group of coyotes that ran around their property, keeping them up several nights a week with their noises and scratching on the side of the house. Her father had taken to standing on the porch with a shotgun some nights, but he never saw anything. Her cousin complained about missing livestock. They would completely disappear, but every once in a while, the corpse of a cow would be found a few yards from the property. Sometimes it was a cow that was missing days earlier and looked only freshly slaughtered. Then one night, Sam was staying over at Jess's house. While they were having dinner, Sam noticed it had gotten quiet outside. He told me it was windy outside, when all of a sudden, the wind could not be heard, and that's when he actually heard something tapping on the window. Jess pointed at the window behind Sam. When he turned around to look, he caught a glimpse of a figure for only a split second before it vanished. But he could hear it walking away from the window as the thing was very close to the house. The two were frozen in fear for a few seconds before the sound of the wind returned. They drew the blinds. Sam said they barely slept that night. Jess told him that she saw a large wolf with glowing yellow eyes looking into their window. She said it was a weird looking wolf and that it was smiling, almost like how a man smiles. There was a row of yellow teeth that looked strange like human teeth. Jess found herself in the coming days bothered by this. She told Sam it reminded her all too well of the two beings she saw all those years ago. They had someone come by the property to bless it and that was that for everything that transpired at Jess's home. A few weeks after the incident, Sam was awoken by a series of noises. The noises, he said, started far away but were loud enough to wake him up. He said they grew in volume as they grew closer. He estimated that there were about a minute or so in between. Each noise was getting closer. From far away, they sounded like your typical wolf or dog. But as they got closer, they sounded more bizarre. As he said it, it's really hard to say exactly why these noises were so scary. Like, I was shivering in fear. Wave after wave. And after a wave of chills, dude, my eyes were watering. I felt like I was having a panic episode. They didn't sound like any animals I knew. It started like a wolf howl, but then made weird gurgling noises that went on for a few more seconds after. The noises were really loud at the front end, violent, like they were a warning. Suddenly, Sam heard a noise from inside his own home. He tells me he grabbed his pistol from his closet and burst through his bedroom door only to see an empty house with the front and back doors wide open, swaying in the wind. Looking out the back door, he said he saw two wolves running away in the moonlight, but their gait was off, as though they had the wrong set of hind legs. 
The next day, Sam dialed the medicine man who blessed Jess's place. He was an old friend of John's. When he came by, he first listened to Sam's story and then inspected the home. The medicine man, in a sort of roundabout way, told him it was indeed a Yinadroshi and that he had caught the attention of something very old, very powerful, and very evil. In fact, the medicine man had never heard of any being of the sort to actually enter another person's dwelling place. That fact alone terrified the man, enough to where he said, I don't know what my blessing will do. Best case scenario, it'll keep it off your property. It won't keep it off you. Worst case scenario, it'll make it mad. I thought, shit, well, it was worth it just to try for the possibility of it working, I guess. How fucked up is all this? Sam also showed the man the box of items that John had given him to see if they held any significance. The man frowned, saying he didn't wish to speak ill of the dead. But John had made a small error in giving Sam what he thought were things that would protect him. The man went to his truck and came back with another item. Sam won't tell me what the items were. This is out of respect for the Dinya traditions. He also says that he didn't even know what half of the stuff was. So the medicine man told Sam to put that with the other things, but that it was no guarantee. He said there was no one-size-fits-all solution to warding off dark witches. Witches, which by the way, is how he refers to skinwalkers. So witches are superstitious, but some more than others. Some of them have learned that certain practices don't do anything, so they just laugh those off, while some others find it actually disrespectful. Finally, he performed a blessing. He told Sam that if things don't improve, he may need to get help from someone else, or multiple others. And then he gave him the info of some other medicine man whom he trusted. He closed out by saying that John was most likely the best person. He knew how to deal with these things in spite of the slip up with the items he gave Sam. That night, Sam said he was sleeping peacefully, which continued for about a week. Then one night, Sam woke up to use the bathroom. He didn't switch on any lights but noticed two very strange things. For one, it was freezing. We live in the desert, but it's never been that cold at night, that time of year. And I didn't have the AC on because I'm not a diva like you. And also, it fucking reeked. His house smelled of rotting flesh. After using the bathroom, he went back to bed and then had an incredibly vivid dream. Six tall, lanky, skinned men in animal pelts, wearing skulls with bits of flesh, still clinging to them. He remembers them clear as day. Two appear to be dressed as wolves, one as a sheep, one as a coyote, and another as a deer with broken antlers. They were standing around all glaring at him with striking yellow eyes. They barely moved. In the words of Sam, they looked like people who hadn't eaten in weeks, almost zero body fat or muscle, and one of them did not look well. The deer man, I'm talking about gray skin, infections, almost like a zombie. It was disgusting. Sam woke up in a cold sweat. He told me that in the dream, he was just standing there as their eyes bore into him. He actually knew he was dreaming while it was happening. His first and so far only instance of lucid dreaming. He told me of how desperate he wanted to wake up, but he couldn't. When he left his room, he saw five sets of footprints in dirt. There were no footprints leading to where they actually were. Just five sets of footprints, as though something had just appeared and disappeared in one spot out of thin air. There were also six men in his dream but he never found the other set of footprints, assuming that these prints belonged to the man in his dream. 
When he told the medicine man about this, he was rightfully baffled and terrified. He told Sam to call the others, but that he doubted the effectiveness of their practices in light of the information that he shared. He still offered a blessing, which Sam accepted. Sam did indeed make a few calls and told several other medicine men about what happened. They told him that something very dark had set its eyes on him and that he was to be very cautious. He basically lived with Jess until the semester ended, only going home to grab something every once in a while. Sam moved back to the Chicago area for a brief period before Jess started her first semester for her masters in another city where he joined her. That's around the time we met on a gig while he was working as a freelance photographer. Whether he left or not because of the encounters and the dream, he's never really actually said. I know he was looking to live in a city with an arts community, but I do think the encounters were the straw that broke the camel's back. Sam says that he doesn't know if he wants to return to the res, but he still goes every now and then to see his dad. I'm sure the skinwalkers miss him greatly. It was late June of 1968. My dad was 12. My grandparents had moved a few months earlier from Tucson, Arizona to Concho, Arizona. Concho was very different, both in landscape and temperature. Sitting at 5,000 feet above sea level, the summer temperatures were around 70 degrees versus the hundreds in summertime Tucson. Resting at the edge of the White Mountains, the land is red, yellow, and brown sandstone cliffs and buttes against a larger ancient basalt flow ridge that lines the north from the Springville Volcanic Range. Well, Old Concho, as it's referred to now, sits among the high desert with large basalt ridge bordering the east and north. In the valley, a dry riverbed was dotted by large cottonwood trees. The buttes and ridges boasted large twisted cedar trees. Only about 200 people lived in Concho at the time. It's in pretty close proximity to the petrified forest. Therefore, petrified wood was found on the valley floor. There were also numerous ancient Anasasi ruins scattered along the valley. My great uncle had moved his family to Concho as well. My grandpa had recently finished his engineering degree and he and my great uncle were doing highway construction all around the White Mountains. They had both purchased land in the Concho area for pretty cheap. My great uncle had two sons who were a year older and a year younger than my dad, Tony and Sack. Tony was 13 and Sack was 11. They would spend their days exploring the surrounding landscapes, joined by my dad's American Bulldog, Sarge. They had found quite a few ruins, numerous pictographs, and some old abandoned homesteads, most likely from the 19th century. Every morning, they would load up their bags with canteens, bologna sandwiches, and head out into the wilderness to play and explore. My grandparents and great aunt and uncles had only one rule that was for the children, and that was to return by sunset. As my dad recalls on one summer morning, they ended up hiking towards the edge of the giant basalt ridge to explore. After going for about a mile or so, they came upon an arroyo running adjacent to the ridge. Large black boulders and giant slabs of sandstone peppered the wash. The banks were pretty steep, but they would have to cross it if they want to explore the ridge on the other side. They made their way down slowly. Once in the arroyo, they realized that the opposite bank was too steep to climb, so they started following it west 
to find a better place to climb up. My dad said as soon as they got into the riverbed, he started getting an unnerving feeling, like they were being watched. He said it was extremely quiet. No birds or cicadas chirping. It was hot as well. No breeze stirred the air. The further they walked down the wash, the more a sense of urgency began to build in his gut. He didn't say anything though, for fear that his cousins would laugh at him. About a half mile or so down the wash, it made a bend around a large volcanic boulder. Suddenly, Sarge began a low growl, hair standing up on his back. This actually startled all three of the kids. Looking around, they didn't see anything. So encouraging the dog, they moved closer to the bend. Sarge stayed rooted to the spot, growling and barking. All three of the boys began to get scared. They agreed that maybe they should just turn around. They noticed that there was a spot where they could climb out of the wash. They hadn't noticed it at first, but it looked almost like a game trail. With adrenaline fueling them, they hauled ass up the side of the embarkment towards the ridge, the dog darting after them. The whole time the bad feeling was growing stronger with my dad. They stopped at the top to catch their breath. Sitting against a large boulder, they took some drinks from the canteen and assured each other that Sarge probably smelled a coyote or spotted a rabbit. Here, the game trail was more apparent. It had even worn into some of the volcanic and sandstone that protruded from the ground. They noticed that there were a lot of petroglyphs dotting the black rocks, geometric shapes, animal, human figures. There were so many. Finally, they found a large juniper with a trunk and ate their lunch in shade. Bellies full and excitement replacing fear. They hurried along the trail as it slowly sigged and sagged the side of the basalt ridge, avoiding large areas of rock falls. The pictographs began to change as well along the trails. Lots of spirals and horn looking men. My dad even said there was one that looked like a UFO. Turning around a bend, the trail disappeared. Only open space of the edge of a cliff. There was nowhere else to go. The cliff drop off to one side and a sheer cliff going up about 50 feet on the other side. My dad, he was disappointed, but also a little relieved as the sun was getting further west and they were pretty far from Concho now. They could see the town in the distance as well as the holy mountain and mesas that dotted the distant Navajo Res. Even though they were disappointed, they decided that it was worth looking at the view. They started making their way down the trail when they spotted an opening in the cliffside, a side canyon. They hadn't noticed it on the way up. It was behind a large twisted cedar. The tree's shadow had hidden it. It looked almost like there was another trail going into the divide. The opening was about four feet wide. Looking at it, that unnerving feeling returned to my dad. His stomach dropped and he felt like it was twisting in knots. The hair on the back neck stood up. Tony suggested that they should detour and check it out. My dad protested saying that they needed to get back. Zack stayed silent. He looked as scared as my dad felt. Tony laughed when looking at them and called them both sissies. He said if they didn't want to go, it was fine that they could wait there for him and be babies if they wanted. That's when Sarge ran down the trail and was out of sight. My dad whistled for him, but he didn't return. Zack decided he would follow Tony, so my dad stayed behind while they entered the narrow black walled canyon. When they moved out of my dad's field of vision, the wind picked up blowing through the canyon and trees, making a creepy sound. It was quiet except the wind, and my dad thought he heard faint voices on the air. He shivered, the ominous feeling growing stronger. Ten minutes passed, then twenty, and still, Tony and Zack had not returned. A large cloud had covered the sun, 
and drops of rain began to fall. My dad moved under the cedar to get out of the light rain that began to fall. He sat on a rock and began to shiver. Suddenly, something grabbed his shoulder. He jumped about three feet and screamed. Then he heard laughing. It was Tony and Zack. They looked extremely excited. Luke, you'll never believe what we found. They said, we found some Indian steps and they lead to a cave. They begged my dad to come see. It wasn't far, only about 10 minutes into the canyon. My dad ended up following them, knowing they weren't going to agree to go home until they showed them. Plus, he felt a little braver and more intrigued now. Sure enough, around a bend and about 20 yards into the canyon, the canyon was more wide, about 20 to 30 feet across, and there were indeed foot and handholds carved into the rock wall. My dad had seen steps like them before when his parents had taken him to Chaco Canyon National Park. They were smaller than the ones in Chaco and only went up about 20 feet to the darkened mouth of a small cave. He shivered from excitement or fear. He wasn't sure. From the bottom of the canyon, there was no way of telling how large the cave was. They dropped their packs and decided to use the foot and handholds to climb up to the cave against my dad's better judgment. The rain had stopped, but they slowly and carefully made their way because the rock had become slick. It took about 10 minutes to ascend. My dad called for Sarge from the top again, and the dog still hadn't returned. The cave was much larger and deeper than they expected and the entrance was decorated with hundreds of petroglyphs. The light didn't penetrate very far in, but they could see light in the distance from an opening in the roof. So they entered. Light adjusting to the dark, they started to notice that the ground was covered with objects. What looked like rocks and debris now revealed itself to be pots, beautiful painted pots of all shapes and sizes black on white, painted with geometric patterns, and animals, red pots and even some yellow ones, large pots holding dry corn and crusty squash and beans. There were also pots filled with arrowheads and beads. They even found some instruments like drums and flutes. They didn't touch anything and kept walking deeper into the cave. They looked around in shock and in awe. They had just discovered something big, something very big. They moved now towards the second bit of light streaming in from a crack in the roof. The cave was littered with all sorts of artifacts, stone axes, pots of all shapes, colors, and sizes. As they passed under the crack, they noticed now that there were objects and alcoves in the wall. My dad moved closer to one and his blood froze. He was looking at a human body. It was decayed skin and hair clinging to patches and its mouth open and what looked like a silent scream. He took a leap back. Tony and Zack also froze. The walls were lined with alcoves filled with dressed bodies, lining the walls as far as they could see into the darkness. Suddenly, an ominous and horrendous screech broke the silence of the cave. All three boys jumped, and my dad, looking in the direction from where the sound came, saw two red and glowing eyes. He froze, locked in place by those glowing red eyes. Suddenly, the cave was washed over with the stench of decay and death. The eyes began to move towards the boys. Slowly, another hideous growl, screech, jolted them from being petrified in place. The eyes were moving fast now, right towards them, and they heard what sounded like running footsteps. They turned and tore out of the cave as fast as they could. They ran as fast as their legs could carry them in a blind panic. 
The entrance to the cave was maybe 30 yards away. My dad looked back against his better judgment and saw a man on all fours or a giant coyote. He can't be sure. He pushed himself faster, screaming for the others to also run faster. They reached the edge of the cave, having to turn around to scrabble back down the foot and handholds. Zack got there first and began descending as fast as he could. Tony was next. His face turned into a wash of horror as he went down. My dad's heart was hammering into his brain by now. He turned and saw the eyes only about 20 feet from him. The stench of decay was overpowering. It made his stomach turn. As fast as he could, he placed his feet in the first set of footholds and started clambering down the rock face. He could hear the creature's breath now and even feel it. He refused to look up as he was going down, trying to concentrate on the hand and footholds. He heard Tony scream from below him and looked to see Tony lose his hold and slip about five feet from the bottom. He landed on his side and began to scream with pain. My dad slowed himself a bit, still not daring to look back up. After what seemed like an eternity, he leaped from the cliffside down the last two feet. Zack was helping Tony to his feet, and Tony was frozen looking at the cave and ancient staircase. All the color gone from his face. My dad was in full panic and not looking, grabbed Tony and helped Zack drag him away. They flew down the little canyon. Finally, before they passed the turn, my dad looked back to see the red eyes watching them from the darkness. Another screech rang from the cave, and at that moment, Sarge and a full run came from around the bend, growling and barking. He ran to the foot and handhold staircase and bellowed up that cave the hair on his back standing straight up, snarling and growling. The sounds of the dog filled the canyon. As my dad turned the corner, he saw those red eyes retreat back into the cave. They emerged from the small canyon and stopped briefly to catch their breath. The sounds of Sarge barking and growling echoing down the canyon. Tony at this point was now crying, his face washed with pain. His arm, he said, he thinks he broke it. Zack was silent. My dad was then asking Tony if he could make it home. Tony responded. He sure the hell wasn't staying anywhere near whatever that was. Suddenly, a shrill cry came from the canyon. It was a dog in pain. Sarge, my dad cried. But Tony and Zack had started running down the trail. My dad screamed again tears coming from his eyes. There was no response. It was quiet. My dad thinks he hears something. He looks up to the canyon entrance. It sounds like drums. My dad sits there confused. Drums? What the hell? Is he losing his mind? The drums are getting loud. Is this in his mind? Where is Sarge? He can't leave him. My dad sees Sag tearing back up the trail. Luke, we have to go. The drums are louder now, and he can hear faint chanting. Zack grabs my dad and jerks him to his feet. Don't you hear that? He screams and shakes my dad. We have to run, now. My dad is woken from his grief, as fear washes over him again. He runs down the trail with Zack. Tony is waiting at the edge of the arroyo, waiting for them. The wash is now running, about six inches deep. They notice for the first time that a large thunderhead has developed to the south. A huge large black storm dominating the southern horizon. Lightning flashing in the distance. A new source of danger crosses my dad's mind. He tells Tony and Zack they need to cross the arroyo as fast as possible. If it floods, they will be stuck on the side with the basalt ridge. With whatever that thing was. They make their way down carefully and slowly. Tony is having a hard time because of his injured arm. They now start hearing thunder rolling across the air and the wind has increased. My dad is keeping a close eye on the creek which has only risen a couple of more inches. They make all the way down and across the creek. 
the place where they crossed is only 30 yards or so ahead, so they scrabble their way towards it. The water starts rising now at an alarming rate. They start going as fast as their legs will carry them. They're exhausted, but keep pushing on. Suddenly, my dad who is in the rear starts to hear loud splashing coming from behind him. His heart drops. It followed them. It's getting closer. He closes his eyes, bracing for impact. That's when he feels something lick the back of his swinging hand. He turns, bracing for impact, and sees Sarge. Joy fills my dad. He bends down and gives Sarge a quick hug as the dog runs past, and the dog bounds after Tony and Zack as they climb out of the arroyo. My dad runs and begins to climb. When he's almost to the top, he hears crashing and loud snapping coming from the arroyo. Making it to the top, he sees a wave of brown debris filled water crash through the wash. He falls to his butt and watches as the flash flood fills the little canyon. Tony and Zack are lying on the ground, gasping for air. My dad tries to catch his breath. He feels dizzy. He feels tears welling up and Sarge comes and licks his face. My dad sees that Sarge is covered with blood. He looks over the dog and finds several slash wounds on his back. His ear is also torn. They don't look too deep, but he can't be sure. Zack is the first to speak. He is asking what it was, but no one responds. Tony's arm is beginning to swell pretty badly, and it's only a few hours till dusk. They're all thirsty, and realize in their panic, they left their packs in the small canyon, along with their canteens. They are no longer in a hurry. They are exhausted. They drink some rainwater that has pulled in one of the large sandstone boulders. They figure whatever that thing was, it's not going to be getting across the arroyo for a few hours. So they slowly make their way back to Concho as the Thunderhead to the south continues to fill the landscape. The three boys and Sarge make it home around 8. The sun has set and my grandparents and great uncle and aunt are worry sick. They are relieved and angry until they see the condition of the trio and the dog. The boys tell them about their horrendous tale and Tony's parents rush Tony to the nearest doctor. That night, my dad sleeps with Sarge at the end of his bed. Despite him being extremely exhausted, he is plagued with nightmares. One that he speaks about all the time is especially terrifying, where he sees the red eyes looking in through his window. When he wakes up though, in the morning, his curtains are closed. The rain continued for two or three days. The boys don't leave their homes, still terrified of what happened. My grandpa and great uncle are convinced what the boys encounter was a mountain lion, but they are intrigued by the story of the cave they found. A few days later, when the weather is clear, they tell the boys they want to see the cave. They make the journey faster this time, using my great uncle's jeep. My grandpa and great uncle also bring along a couple of shotguns and rifles in case this lion is still in the cave. The boys show them the arroyo which has been filled with new boulders and broken trees from the flooding. They find the trail and start making their way up. My grandpa on the front and great uncle taking the rear. They find the boys packs caught in a cedar bush. They have been shredded. My grandpa figures they must have been caught by another flood and they ended up in the trees. They finally make it to the little hidden canyon, which has been blocked by a juniper that washed down during the rain. My grandpa and great uncle get the log out of the way and they go to the canyon to the Indian staircase. When they look up though, they can make out the darkness of the cave. The water washed away all signs of the boy's previous passage. My grandpa figures maybe at this time of day, the cave is more illuminated. So he and my great uncle climb up the foot and handholds to the top. The boys wait at the bottom 
having no desire to go back up there again. It's only my dad and Zach. Tony with his broken arm stayed home. My grandpa calls down for them to climb up. They do as they are told and climb up. When my dad reaches the top, he is stunned. The cave is gone. It's only a 20 foot rock alcove next to a black basalt cliff covered with petroglyphs. He's confused, looks around. He goes over to the wall looking for cracks and sees nothing. My grandpa and great uncle end up questioning the boys. Were they making up stories? No, they weren't. Something attacked Sarge and the boys hadn't made up being that scared. The dads aren't mad. It's a neat area. Maybe some other weekend they will look for the cave again. My dad and Zach know that this is where the cave was. There's no doubt in their minds. They found their packs and even passed by the UFO petroglyph. But they can't convince the adults. So they make their way to the jeep that is parked on the far bank of the arroyo. As they load up, sun sinking low in the western sky. My dad looks back at the black basalt ridge, wondering if maybe it was all just a dream, but something in the shadow of a cliff catches his eye. He squints against the sun and sees two red shining eyes looking back at him. His blood goes cold. He turns around as the jeep pulls away. My grandparents only stayed in Concho for another few months. As soon as my grandpa finished the highway project, he got a job offer in the US Virgin Islands. My dad said after that encounter, he had nightmares every night and would swear that at night, he would see the red eyes outside of the house until they finally moved from Concho. After he moved, he never had a nightmare about the eyes again. But it wasn't his last encounter with the red-eyed creature. He would see it again when he became an adult. But that is a story for another time. I don't have much time on the cold floor of this prison cell. I find myself desperate, scribbling this letter. Not to simply recount the events that have led up to this, but as a warning to you all. The stories you have read, all the reports on the news, barely even scratch the surface of what we encountered that night. I turned myself in, not because of guilt or because I was trying to escape, but because it felt like the only option in order to escape whatever this thing was. I would much rather be writing this letter to Diego and Lucia to send them assurance of my safety and see if they even made it. However, the mysterious power outages, the noises at night, the shadows that are seen walking among us, it's become clear that this thing has actually followed us here. I beg you, or anyone that finds this letter, to share it, especially online, on TikTok. YouTube or any other place where people might actually believe in these things. Share it in places where people are asking questions. And I beg you, please, take this serious. Because this isn't just a story. It's a dire warning. The cold metal floor of the Suburban pressed against me. I could feel the shaking and the noises of it in my bones. I was sitting in the back between a father, Diego, and his young daughter, Lucia. The sounds of the engine, combined with the scraping noises of the tires against the gravel, filled the silence. In between all the noises, the dim light of the vehicle's interior showed Diego's face. He leaned in closer to me, making sure his daughter couldn't hear. Are you sure about this? Diego asked with a tone of anxiety and hope. His eyes, though, showed concern. I nodded, trying to show him confidence in my ability to get them across. However, inside of me, thoughts of doubt existed. 
Memories of the past, both successful and disastrous, flashed through my mind, reminded me of the weight, the responsibility, and the risk. Their desperate eyes looked to me for hope. They had paid 10000 each for this, a price that I knew too well. Most people think that as a coyote, all that money is for me, when actually, the money gets divided among many hands. First, there was Maria in Mexico. Her job was essential, to find people like Diego and Lucia, desperate enough to pay and believe. And of course, people were everywhere. So she was the first one to get her cut of the pie, you can say. Then, the driver Carlos. He was the one taking the biggest risk. The one who would face jail time if he was caught. Well, we would all face jail time if caught. But he would be considered the primary smuggler, with us acting as victims. He knew all the landscapes and the roads very well. We met a few years back, but we didn't go into business until around a year ago. He had the nerves and the courage. He knew all the roads to take, the shortcuts, what to avoid, and what to do when we came across a detour. And of course, Carlos came with a price tag. Every plan, every decision, every move was well crafted. Crossing the border wasn't just about getting up and going. It was a game of chess. One where everyone had its role. And our best piece was our inside man, Miguel. Miguel was different than the others. A border patrol agent who still remember his roots, you can say. Where he came from and the struggles of his family a generation or two before him. The system was his day job, but by night, he would quote unquote help those who are trying to find better opportunities. I say it this way because as you all know, people in life just don't help you freely. There is always something in exchange. And so Miguel would take his cut as well. And sometimes there were others too. Agents who we would turn a blind eye, getting their own payment as well. You see, decades ago, things were simple. Border patrol wasn't as advanced as they are now. Drones, which now patrol the skies, could see just about everything. And with technology advancing so quickly, there also came more hoops to jump through, more hands reaching out, more people wanting their own piece of the pie as well. The checkpoint lights of the border seemed to welcome us as we approached. The huge light slowing anyone to a stop and helping break the darkness of the night. The gate ahead stood as the final barrier to cross into Texas. As always, Miguel knew our deal and what day of the week we would come by. He was manning the controls as well. He recognized our approach, signaling us to pull up ahead with a friendly wave. He peeked inside the Suburban and he said, So there's two today. He remarked with a smile. No post, you're consistent, my friend. And sure it gets to the right place. He then signaled to his colleagues. And the massive gate bar slowly opened. As we drove ahead slowly, Miguel yelled at us to stop. Carlos then slowed the Suburban to a stop again. I rolled down the window and said, Hey, que pasa? What happened? Miguel then said, Get out of the car and come to the front, both of you. For a split second, as Miguel yelled at us, some thoughts were flashing through my mind. Was this the moment Miguel turned? Over the years, the risk of somebody betraying you was always there, especially with the pressure that everyone and the Border Patrol agents were under. One could never be sure. Carlos and I looked at each other nervously. Had Miguel finally decided to play it straight and turn us in? The nervousness grew as we exited the vehicle. The dry landscape around us was illuminated by the moon and stars, making everything around us appear even more isolated. The only sources of light were from the Border Patrol checkpoint. The floodlights and the distant sounds of generators and the occasional radio were the only sounds that interrupted this environment. Walking towards the front of the vehicle where Miguel was, I noticed his face was showing no emotion. And then, he finally broke into a chuckle. 
Gotta keep you on your toes, amigo, he said. Always making me sweat a little before letting me through, huh? I said. Miguel was one of those jokesters who liked to pull pranks and, as he said, keep us on our toes. I'm not sure if he did it on purpose or to throw his colleagues off. For example, one time, he made everyone I was transporting to get out of the truck and quote-unquote search us. Then, Miguel's demeanor then shifted to a more serious tone. Hey, listen, before I forget, there's something I think you should know. There's been some strange things happening lately. I stayed silent and nodded my head, urging him to continue. It's the disappearances, he said in a low voice. Whole entire groups have been vanishing. We had a family we let through earlier this week, and just last night, we found them. I held my breath. What do you mean found them? Miguel hesitated for a moment. They were dead but it wasn't like any scene I ever come across. The bodies, they were mangled, twisted in ways that don't seem natural. Their eyes were missing. It looked like some kind of animal attack, but it's nothing I had ever seen. The strange thing is, no bullet holes, no knife cuts. It's as if their bodies were broken and twisted everywhere. Even some limbs were ripped apart and others twisted in ways. I had never seen. I felt a shiver run down my spine. Do you think it's something to do with the cartels? He shrugged. Could be, but even the cartels have a specific way to their madness. This, it's different. Like, I'm not sure. Maybe someone or something, not human. It's weird, just keep your eyes open and stay safe out there. I nodded. All right, you're good to go ahead, Miguel said, but don't forget it. Climbing back into the Suburban, I got into the passenger seat while Diego and Lucia stayed in the back. I could sense their fear radiating from their looks of concern. As far as Miguel's mention of it, I knew he was talking about the payment for the two passengers. Yet my mind kept circling back to his warning. Most stories and crimes from the border are always linked to the cartels, but the way Miguel had described this situation, it was disturbing. I used to work with other coyotes, but as time went by, I realized just how dirty this business could be when it's in the wrong hands. Their methods were evil, just thinking about the money, not the well-being of the people we were transporting, cramming people into the backs of the trucks, trailers like livestock, often without water. If they were pulled over, it was every man for himself. The ones who had taken the responsibility for those lives would bolt, leaving scared families to fend for themselves. You hear reports all the time. I think it was a few years ago when Houston police found a huge rig with about a hundred immigrants trapped inside. Of course, we knew who it was and who did it, but it just shows you that once you get paid in advance, they don't care about you. There is one incident that stands out. Halfway through a journey, a young boy fell ill. Most likely from the extreme heat and lack of water, he slowed the group down. The other coyotes, with whom I was working with back then, decided he was a liability. They actually wanted to leave him and his mom behind in the middle of nowhere. The argument became heated and I stepped in managing to persuade the group to let them stay. However, that incident was the turning point for me. It was no longer just about the money. It's more sleeping without the guilt of things that you could have done in the past. They would abandon families halfway into the road. A father, a mother, a daughter, or son. It didn't even matter. If someone held us back, they would just be left alone. And well, this approach troubled me. They had already received their payment, and to them, anyone slowing the process was just added baggage. I had seen fathers get separated from their families. Mothers left crying for their children. These were humans, and for them to turn a blind eye was just wrong. I decided to break away from this group of coyotes 
It wasn't an easy decision, and it came with risk. Going without them meant that I had to build a new network, find people, and operate discreetly to avoid drawing attention from my former partners. But my guiding became clear, ensure the safety and well-being of every person under my care. Over time, I developed a reputation for fairness. Families trusted me to get them across because they had heard stories of my dedication. I may have charged less than the others, but I slept better at night, knowing that I wasn't sacrificing human lives. Furthermore, I would move people in much smaller groups of only couples or small families. The road was still dangerous, but now I had a plan. I was determined to make every journey as safe as possible. If a situation got risky at some point, we would stay in place for days until it was clear. I would always give the family the most a week to cross. If we didn't make it, I would rather return the payment than to put ourselves and them at risk. However, Miguel wasn't the last piece. The most significant cut went to Bill, a Native American who owned a vast, secluded farmland on the Texas border in Big Bend. His land was the safe passage, the bridge between dreams and reality. He demanded a steep price for turning a blind eye, for sheltering the hopeful souls on their journey. From the 20,000 I collected, only a fraction truly belonged to me. It was a risky venture, but to me, it was worth it. After successfully crossing the border from Mojinaga, the road ahead seemed both promising. The landscape transformed quickly, leaving behind the desert open landscapes and trading it for the beauty of the Big Bend region. This huge wilderness area seemed like the perfect cover. Our plan was to avoid the border towns and the watchful eyes of Border Patrol by cutting through the heart of Big Bend National Park. This road will lead us straight to Plata, Texas, where Bill was waiting. As we drove through, the landscape began to shift, a dense, small woodland between the mountains. This now meant that we were in the heart of Big Bend National Park. The natural beauty surrounding us was a testament to the park's untouched wilderness. However, with this beauty came an eerie silence, broken only by the sounds of our vehicle and the occasional rustling of leaves or distant animal calls. As Carlos drove ahead through the forest area, the dim glow of the dashboard was lighting up the interior. Carlos, always running in his mouth, had been rarely quiet for a while. I took a deep breath and broke the silence. You remember what Miguel mentioned about those bodies they found in areas like this? I said, trying to bring in a little humor. Carlos took a deep breath. Yeah, even I heard rumors back in Ohinaga, but I brushed them off. I thought they were just that, rumors. However, I seen rumors that some of the local ranchers have stumbled upon bodies not too far from here. Not just any bodies, but ones that, well, they weren't right. I frowned. What do you mean? Torn apart. Some of the older folks in town were saying something about old legends. Things that roamed the woods, especially near the border, Carlos said. You're talking about a chupacabra, aren't you? Carlos hesitated, then nodded, among other things and rumors. But whatever it was, it has people scared. Even the bravest of coyotes are steering clear of certain roads from what I heard. I never encounter anything around here though. Man, why did you have to bring up those stories now? This place is already scary enough. I smirked, just trying to lighten up the mood. He chuckled nervously. Well. It's not working, Karnat. As we were driving, every so often, the sounds of birds, I guess, echoed all around us. All the noises of the nightly critters could be heard with the steady hum of the suburban's engine, until suddenly, the engine sound turned into a sputter, groaned, and then after one last cough, fell silent. 
We knew that even though we were far from the border, we weren't safe. The 100 mile border law meant that patrols could stop and search any vehicle within that radius, hoping to catch people just like us. As the vehicle came to a stop, I looked back at Diego and Lucia. I could see Diego's grip on his daughter strong. Again, I could see fear in their faces. Carlos then said, let's see what's wrong. Grab the lights out the glove compartment. I grabbed them and gave one to Carlos and then the two of us stepped out into the darkness. The night was dark with only the lights of the stars and the moon above. There were no street lights here, no signs of people. We were alone. I held a flashlight while Carlos popped the hood, revealing a bunch of hoses, wires, and metal. As he started moving stuff around and trying to figure out the issue, I would try to crank the ignition, hoping for some sign of life. But the Suburban refused to turn on. Feeling the weight of the situation, I approached the back to reassure Diego and Lucia. We'll figure it out, I whisper my voice being a little shaky despite the situation. Lucia was holding a small doll, her source of comfort throughout this journey. As I walked back to the front of the vehicle where Carlos was, my feet started crunching on the dry gravel. I stopped as memories flooded back. I thought about all those who venture into these same fields, driven by the promise of a better life. I stared into the surrounding darkness. It felt pretty cool even though the temperature was still pretty high. As I was thinking, that's when I heard it. A faint whisper. It was coming from the tree line just a few yards from where we had stopped. Help, Help. it said. The voice of a young boy, fragile and on the verge of breaking. My heart raced as I tried to place the direction of the voice. But I froze, every instinct urging me to dismiss it as a figment of my imagination. But it sounded so real, with my flashlight pointing down, casting a small circle of light on the ground, I slowly raced it, allowing the beam to cut through the darkness and bring light to the edge of the woods. But there was nothing there, just trees, their leaves rustling gently in the night breeze. The sound, the voice had faded, but I felt shivers down my spine. I took a deep breath, trying to rationalize the experience. Maybe being exhausted and the stress of the journey were getting to me. Maybe it was just the wind playing tricks, but I couldn't shake off the feeling that I had actually heard something. Actually heard someone, that is. Nervously, I made my way back to the front of the Suburban where Carlos was still trying to figure out the engine's issue. As I approached him, I could hear him saying words under his breath, cursing at the vehicle. Carlos, I began, my voice low and cautious. Did you, um, hear that just now? He paused, looking up from the engine with a confused look. Um, hear what? A voice, I replied, swallowing the saliva in my throat from the woods. It was somebody saying help me. Cardo stared at me for a moment. The thought of hearing a voice was both scary and unexplainable. Ya no andes chingando cabron. Stop fucking around dude. He said. We both stood still in silence with only the calls of the night critters and the trees making sounds. The weight of our situation combined with this experience made the night feel even more scary. While waiting for the engine to respond, Carlos and I leaned on the vehicle's frame, both of us trying to plan out our next step. Well, Bill's farm isn't too far from here, Carlos said, wiping the sweat from his face, even though it wasn't that hot. If the Suburban doesn't start, we could possibly make it in foot in a couple of hours. I nodded, processing the idea, as it was our only option. With a heavy sigh, I made my way to the back of the Suburban, deciding to discuss the possible plan with Diego and Lucia. As I was walking back, I kept looking at the tree line to see if that voice would call out again. I'm not sure what I was looking for, but even if I did see something, 
I didn't know what I was going to do. It didn't help that everything was pitch black, as I could only distinguish a few things because of the moon. But overall, everything was dark. I found Diego and his daughter together, their eyes showing a mix of hope and nervousness. Hey, um, listen, I began. If we can't get the vehicle going, we might have to walk the rest of the way to Bill's farm. It's not too far. However, we would have to cross through this small patch of woods right here. Diego sat still for a while, and then he nodded, bringing Lucia close to him. I could see the weight of responsibility that he carried for his daughter, trying to protect her and provide comfort. I continue, it's going to be a long walk, but I promise you, it's safe. After talking with Diego about the plan and trying to make sure that they were okay with it, I turned my attention back to the hood of the car and to Carlos. But as I approached the front, the engine was quiet, the hood was still up, but Carlos, who was just there moments ago, was now gone. A rush of panic went through my whole body. The area was silent, except for the distant chirping of crickets. This is the reason drivers get paid, I thought to myself, trying to use my sense of humor to overcome the fear. Every story, every warning about the dangers of these roads rushed back to me. Carlos, I called out. The weight of silence bore down on me, making my voice actually sound low. I took a few steps in front of the Suburban, shining my flashlight around. There was no trace of him. I circled the vehicle, praying that maybe he had just gone off to relieve himself, or that he was trying to find a better view to see which way we could go. But there was nothing, no sign of him. My mind started to race to all things. Did he go to find help? Maybe he heard something, or saw a patrol and decided to hide? The possibility seemed endless, and none of them were reassuring. That's when I felt a chill run down my spine, as I thought back to that voice from the tree line. However, pushing aside the fear that I had, I knew I had to do something. I started to shine my flashlight everywhere, sweeping the area, looking for any sign of him. Carlos! I called out again, louder this time, hoping that he would answer. Suddenly, from deep within the trees, I heard a faint chuckle, followed by a voice that I instantly recognized. Hey, over here, we need to cut through here, it's the fastest way to Bill's farm. As the voice of Carlos came from the tree line, a confused feeling and concern gripped me. Why did he venture off without us? What could have possibly made him go disappear into the dark woods? Without a word, that is. I squinted my eyes, trying to make out more than just a faint shadow of Carlos against the trees. But the trees and the night sky covered him. The weight of bearing bad news was never easy, but I had no choice but to tell Diego that we would have to walk. As I turned, I was met with an unexpected sight, causing me to leap back in shock. Diego was standing there, inches from me, with Lucia clutching his hand. My heart raced, and a rush of adrenaline left me. Jeez, Diego, don't sneak up on me like that, man, I said, with my voice slightly shaky from the sudden surprise. Diego raised an eyebrow, a mix of concern on his face. Hey, uh, sorry, he replied with a grin. They didn't mean to scare you. It's alright, just give me a bit of warning next time, alright? I nodded towards the direction of the trees where the voice of Carlos had come from. Hey Diego, Carlos has gone up ahead, trying to sound as confident as possible. Diego, with a confused look, but why? Without telling us a thing, why would he do that? I'm not sure, man, I replied, but I heard his voice from the trees right there. I know he's waiting. So we should hurry up and regroup with him. Bill's farm isn't far, and we can make it if we move quickly. Let's go get the backpacks from the sub, and then we'll start walking towards the woods. As we went back to the Suburban, everything just seemed off. As we started walking a few feet to where I had seen Carlos by the tree line, that's when I heard it. Another voice. Hey, adonde van? Where y'all going? It was unmistakably the voice of Carlos again. But this time, it was filled with confusion. 
I turned sharply in the direction of the second voice, my flashlight revealing the familiar face of Carlos, looking just as confused as I was. As I looked back towards the tree line where the first voice had come from, there was nothing. No sound. No movement. Just the stillness of the night. Diego stepped in front of me with his voice shaky. What's going on? Carlos, now clearly behind us standing by the hood of the Suburban, looked at the tree line with a suspicious look. Hey, I just went to the trees to take a leak. I heard someone call out, and I thought you guys were leaving without me. The confusion hung heavy in the night air. My heart started to race, trying to process what just happened. Hey, get back in the vehicle, I said in my voice mixed with fear and urgency. I heard the voice of Carlos coming from that way that we were just going to go. Carlos interrupted his voice with concern. Hey, I wasn't anywhere near until now. We need to get out of here before somebody finds us. Nodding in agreement, I said. All right, let's all stick together. Nobody leaves the vehicle. And Carlos, if you think you can fix it, let's get out of here as quickly as possible. I think I know what's wrong with it. I was thinking about it when I was out there taking a lead, said Carlos. As I rushed Diego and his daughter to get back inside, Carlos got underneath the hood and told me to try to start cranking. I then got inside and saw Diego and Lucia in the very back, looking nervous. I cranked the vehicle and the engine came to life, breaking the long silence that was around us. A wave of relief flooded through me as I realized that we wouldn't have to walk through the woods. Carlos emerged from under the hood, his hands smeared with grease, but with a smile on his face. You're gonna find this crazy, but it was a loose wire. It should hold up now though. He said, wiping his hands on a rag. We stepped to the front of the vehicle, and I asked Carlos if this should hold up at least until we get to Bill's farm. He said it should, but we'll have to look into it as soon as we can. As we closed the hood of the sub, that's when we saw it. There was a dark figure, standing along the shadows of the tree line. A chill ran down my spine. As the silhouette, began to get revealed more and just like that a voice echoed calling out help me carlos and i stared at each other without saying a word driven by fear we sprinted back inside the suburban as we got inside my heart started to pound against my rib cage carlos floored the gas but i couldn't help myself i turned my head to see through the passenger mirror the figure was distorted and it was starting to move actually no it was twisting as it attempted to walk with its form growing smaller in the distance as we drove away that fucking voice carlos i whispered trying to make sure that diego and lucia didn't listen it's that same fucking voice i was telling you about carlos glanced over at me and with a concerned look in his eyes i heard it as well when i was taking a piss who knows what the fuck is going on here? Breaking the tension, I turned to face Diego and Lucia. Bill's farm is just ahead. I reassured them, trying my best to make sure they didn't question our looks of fear in our faces. The good thing is that the windows in the back of the Suburban were dark, so I know it was impossible for them to see out back. How much longer till we get to Bill's farm, Carlos? About 20 more minutes if this damn sub doesn't break down again. He responded. Memories of Bill surfaced, recalling our first meeting at a cultural festival in Texas. An event filled with tradition, dance, and music that celebrated native heritage. A moment where cultures intersected, bridging gaps and understanding each other. I met Bill during one of these cultural festivals in the heart of Texas. The festival aimed to showcase a fusion of traditions from native dances and Mexican mariachi music to all types of stuff crafted by natives and Mexicans. Bill actually had a stall there, demonstrating traditional Native American weaving techniques. The fabrics told stories with patterns and colors, speaking stories of their ancestors and the land they called home. Next to him was a group of people performing a traditional Mexican folk dance. The two cultures so different, 
yet with so much in common, was fascinating to learn about both. I approached where Bill was at, drawn by a design that to my surprise had patterns that I had seen back in Mexico. We began to talk and I learned that some patterns were universal, representing themes like life, death, and nature, which actually resonates across cultures. Bill, with his welcoming demeanor, expressed interest in my Mexican roots. As our conversation deepened, I learned about the expanse of land that belonged to his family for generations. I share stories of my hometown in Mexico, the traditions, the festivals, and all the challenges that we faced. Another common theme was that Bill was interested in creatures of lore and legends, some of which had roots in Native American stories passed down through generations. He spoke about a Wendigo, a creature born from greed and transformed into an evil spirit. I, in turn, would tell stories from my hometown, La Llorona, the weeping woman who wandered the rivers searching for her children, La Lechuza, the witch, El Nagual, the shapeshifter, and even El Chupacabra, the fear blood sucking creature, which I will actually tell you about if I have time later on. However, what caught my attention the most were the dream catchers that were designed to ward off evil spirits and apparently offer protection. Bill started speaking passionately about these items, explaining how some were made using traditional methods passed down through generations in his Native American community. You see, these are not just decorative items, he said, holding up a dream catcher. They're instruments to protect you. This dream catcher, for example, is said to protect your sleep from nightmares and negative energy. I found myself fascinated not just by the items he sold, but by the stories and traditions they represented. So through our discussions, Bill often talked about more intricate and custom pieces he had back at his home. You should come by sometime. I have pieces at home that I believe you'll find more fascinating, he said. Taking him up on the offer, a few weeks later, I found myself visiting Bill's farm. The property was a testament to his heritage and his deep-rooted connection to the land. It was here that our conversations grew, leading to confidence and deeper insights about our own journeys. When I first set foot on Bill's farm, I was immediately surprised by how big it was. The land was stretching out as far as the eye could see. Bill actually gave me a tour of the property, pointing out the different sections, and eventually taking me to a secluded work area. This space, covered by all the trees, was where he crafted his items and kept his collection. After this he invited me to the main house. The walls were lined with his handcrafted artifacts. Bill offered me a beverage. We settled into a comfortable conversation. You know, he began, sipping from his cup. From the discussions we've been having, I sense you have a rich history and culture behind you. Have you ever thought of crafting and possibly selling artifacts? I paused for a second, taking his words in, and with a deep breath, I said, Actually, Bill, I'm already involved in a different kind of business. What I would like to discuss is the possibility of using this land of yours as part of that business. Bill took a moment, processing what I had just offered. He studied me for a long moment. The weight of my request, evident in the air between us. Finally, he broke the silence. This land is sacred to me and my ancestors. It's a piece of our history, a testament to our survival and culture. If I let you use it, I need you to keep your word that you'll respect the traditions and use it only for good intentions. Bill leaned back on his chair. For every person, you bring through this land, he began, I will need a certain percentage. This land isn't just a piece of property, it's a part of my tradition, of my ancestors. Using it this way comes with its own cost and risk. We shook hands, sealing our agreement. As I made my way to the door, ready to leave, something caught my attention. 
there was a streak of what seemed to be black dirt or black dust lining the door frame. Curious, I pointed towards it. Hey Bill, what's this for? Bill hesitated for a split second. Then, he said, that's black ash. Then, in a low voice, that's, that's to too ward cool. off. Yinadroshi. His simple answer sent a shiver down my spine. I didn't ask him who Yinadroshi is, but I figured it was some kind of spirit, similar to the other ones that he had told me about when I was asking him about the dream catchers. And that's how me and Bill became partners. I had been using his farm for a while, and as a bonus, he treated us like royalty when we were there at the farm. He got along with everybody. After about 30 minutes and seeing familiar landmarks appearing, I realized we were approaching Bill's farm. As Carlos drove the Suburban down the driveway, leading to the main house, the land was very calm. Instead of animals grazing, the goats and sheep were laying dormant, apparently in a deep sleep. The closer we got to the main house, the more a creepy feeling came over us. The whole house was completely dark, no light filtering from any window. All the normal farm sounds were missing. Carlos brought the Suburban to a stop and said, something doesn't feel right, he whispered. I tried to remain optimistic and said, maybe Bill just went to sleep early. That's when Carlos pointed to the front door. It was slightly open, swaying gently with the breeze. Or maybe something's wrong, he said. Suddenly, the stillness was shattered by a distant scream. I reached and grabbed the flashlights. We need to check this out, I said. Carlos then nodded. As we both got off, I approached the back door and told Diego, Hey man, we're gonna go inside and see where Bill is at. Stay here and we'll be right back. He simply nodded still holding Lucia in his arms. As we approached the front door, I noticed signs of a struggle. A broken lamp was laying on the ground, the glass reflecting the moonlight. Tools and a basket of veggies laid on the ground as well. As we entered the house, the beam of the flashlight revealed the living room in a mess. Chairs were overturned, and a framed picture of Bill with his family was laying broken on the floor. Carlos called out, Bill, Bill are, are you here? here? His voice echoed through the silent house. Suddenly, from upstairs, we heard a small whimper, followed by a hushed voice murmuring. Drawn towards the sound, we made our way up the creaking staircase. The voice was growing louder, and as we reached the top of the stairs, we saw Bill. He was seated in a circle of what looked to be salt, surrounded by lit candles, holding onto a worn out book, his face pale, looking up, revealing a mixture of relief and fear. It looked like he was praying. He then looked at us and said, The, the movement, movement of people, people across, across the land, especially, especially during the night, has, has disturbed, disturbed the resting places of such things. His face then turned towards the window, opposite of us, where I saw a shadow quickly move out of sight. And then, he looked back at us, and whispered, Yinadroshi is here. The voice of Bill echoed in the room as he said, Yinadroshi is here. We looked around. The wind outside also seemed to pick up. With confused thoughts filling my head, I took a step. Bill, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. What's going on? What the hell are you talking about? Bill's face remained fixed, but then his expression started changing. It's not just a story, not just a legend. It's real, he said with his voice trembling. Because of our actions, we have awoken an ancient presence. We're all doomed. I turned to look at Carlos. His face was pale, 
and his eyes were wide. He then said, Let's get out of here. Vamonos. Glancing towards the exit. This guy's lost it. He's gone crazy. However, Bill started shaking his head slowly. Running won't save you, he said, reaching beside him to reveal a pile of small necklaces that looked similar to dream catchers. These, he began, these are the only things that might keep us safe, even if it's just for a little bit. He reached out his hand for me and Carlos to take one each, telling us to wear them. As I adjusted mine, trying to understand everything that was going on, I saw a shadow from the corner of my eye. My heart raised as I saw something standing by the window. It was tall and just standing still. It seemed to be watching us. All the candles that were surrounding Bill started to flicker, making the figure appear even more sinister. The wind continued blowing outside and the farmhouse started to creak. Bill, noticing our horrified stares, turned to see the figure as well. He then started whispering something towards it, almost mumbling under his breath. As the last word came out of his mouth, the room grew cold, and in a split second, the figure at the window vanished. Carlos was the first to move. Vamos, let's go, he urged, heading towards the door. Bill, who was holding onto a worn out book, quickly followed him, and I was right behind them. But just as we neared the exit, a loud crash echoed behind us, causing all three of us to freeze in our tracks. It was the sound of shattering glass, like a window breaking. I couldn't help but look back. The source of the noise was now clear. Through the broken window of the room that we had just left, a figure emerged from the room. It was huge, almost like a coyote. Its form was distorted, limbs twisted. The fur that covered it was patchy, revealing raw skin underneath. Its eyes were glowing and eerie yellow. A surge of adrenaline came and pushed me to run outside. The distance to the suburban seemed endless. My thoughts raced to Diego and Lucia, who were still inside the suburban. Were they safe, or were they even aware of the things that were going on? As we left the farmhouse, the darkness of the night was broken by the lights of the Suburban. To my surprise, Diego and Lucia were standing outside the vehicle. Their faces were full of confusion and fear. Hey, get back in! I screamed at them, with my voice echoing. Without thinking twice, they scrambled into the very back of the Suburban, while Carlos, taking the lead, jumped into the driver's seat. I slid into the passenger side, while Bill took a seat in the middle row. Cardo slammed his foot on the gas pedal, shooting the vehicle ahead. The tires kicked up dust and gravel as we made our desperate escape. As the Suburban raced away, I couldn't resist the urge to glance back at the farmhouse. I looked over at the passenger mirror and saw, there, against the moonlight, stood a creature in the doorway. A twisted coyote-like figure, those yellow eyes again, seemed to glow in the night, watching us. Yet it made no move to come towards us. It just stood there. And I swear, I saw this thing raise a limb, almost as to wave goodbye. As we sped down the driveway, everyone was shaken. The fear was evident in their eyes. As the headlights lit up the path ahead, the sight that met our eyes was one that I will never forget. Bill's livestock, which earlier had seemed to be resting, was now revealed by the light that they had been decapitated. Their lifeless bodies were laying all around, heads missing from each one of them, legs missing on others, and torsos cut in half. Bill, his voice breaking with fear, managed to speak. It did this. Yenadroshi, it's sending us a message. I turned my head to look at him. He then started to reach into his pocket, pulling out several more necklaces. You two, put these on. It might be our only defense. Diego and Lucia, who were still processing everything that just happened, I know they were still somewhat confused, so I simply told them to, Dice que se pongan los collares, por favor. Please put on the necklaces. 
They both then quickly took the necklaces from Bill and put them on. The Suburban's tires crunched against the gravel beneath. I gripped the dashboard tightly, my knuckles turning white from the pressure. Glancing briefly at Carlos, he kept his eyes trained on the road. I turned to face Bill. Alright Bill, what the fuck is going on? Bill, who was just staring down, looked up at me. He raised the worn book he had been holding all his time, and with the light of the dashboard slightly showing his eyes, he said, Long ago, before these lands were marked by fences or roads, this land was sacred, alive with ancient ceremonies by my ancestors. The Begais, my forefathers, were drawn to this place and soon encounter its guardian, Yinadroshi. These grounds echo with chants, or painted with spiritual dances. The Begais forged the pact with the Yinadroshi. We would dwell here, thrive from the land's gifts, but in turn, we vow to never disturb the sacred spaces that the spirits have called home. It was a pact of respect, of understanding, and this mutual agreement my ancestors flourish. The land was kind to them. He paused for a moment, looking out of the window. But as with most stories, time blurred the lines between real and fake. By the time I was a child, these stories were just not fireside stories. Legends that lost meaning with each retelling. Turning his attention back to us, then you two came along. Seeing potential in these lands, you began bringing people across trampling upon promises made ages ago. Every step they took, every night they traveled, the land was disturbed. The land, the big eyes, had vowed to protect. Each night, as individuals were guided across these grounds, they disturbed the ancient spirits and the resting place of Yinadroshi. His voice grew soft, almost a whisper. I began to notice, feel the changes around. The land seemed to cry out, its once welcoming embrace, now cold. Digging through the books of my family's history, I discovered everything, and I realized what we had done. He pointed around with his hands, all the items you saw in the room back at the farmhouse, the saw, and the words I was saying, the candles, were my desperate attempts, my plea to Yunadroshi to tell it that we didn't mean harm, to ask him for forgiveness. With this, Bill looked down and stood quiet. The voice of Carlos trembled slightly as he spoke. Look, we got Diego and Lucia with us. We can't just keep driving. We need to do something. Being out here in the dark isn't helping either. Border patrol could be anywhere. We need to find a secure spot. I nodded. I was struggling to believe anything that was happening or going on. Yet I know what we saw back at the farmhouse. These necklaces, Bill, I began, glancing at the charm around my neck. Are they going to keep that creature away from us? Bill looked up at me, his eyes filled with both hope and doubt. They are simply crafts that I used to make that my father taught me. I read in this book that they are used to ward off evil spirits around us, and I believe they can offer some protection, but against the Yenadroshi, I can't be sure. I turned to look at Diego and Lucia in the very back. Lucia was holding on to her father Diego, her face buried in his shoulder. Carlos, keeping his eyes on the road, turned and told us all, There's, um, Alpine, not too far from here. We can find a small motel for the night, just a place for Diego and Lucia to rest while we figure out our next move. I chimed in. Sounds like a plan. And Bill? I'm not sure, man, but I hesitated, trying to find the right words. This issue that you have has nothing to do with us. Bill looked straight ahead and then slowly turned to meet my gaze, his voice steady. This has everything to do with us. Every single one of us in this car. We cannot run from this forever, he warned. We might avoid it for a while. Find some temporary safe place. But it will always be there. Lurking. Waiting in the dark. 
The only true way out of this is to seek a cleansing from a medicine man. Carlos then turned around. A what? A medicine man? What is that? Bill sighed, taking a moment to gather his thoughts. A medicine man is someone who can heal others. Not only that, but they're a spiritual guide. They have the knowledge and understanding of rituals and ceremonies. They have the power to cleanse people, places, and even objects of dark energies and spirits. If anyone can help us, it would be a medicine man. The eyes of Cardos opened up, and he nodded slowly. I get it now. So you mean like a, como, como se dice, like a brujo. So you're talking about a witch doctor. Bill gave a small nod. Yeah, somewhat. Though every culture has its distinctions and practices, but the essence is the same. Someone who understands the rituals and ceremonies. In this case, we need their knowledge and rituals to protect and cleanse ourselves from Yenadroshi. Diego, who had been silent the whole time, suddenly spoke up, his voice filled with fear. My mother back in Mexico, she's what you might call a bruja or a witch doctor. She used to tell me and Lucia about other beings and even others that we don't see around us. Everyone in the vehicle turned their attention to him. Bill's eyes sharpened. Your mother knows about these things? Diego nodded. Yeah, she's been practicing for as long as I can remember. People from our small pueblo would come to her for help with things they couldn't explain or understand. Bill cleared his throat, breaking the heavy silence that followed what Diego had said. There's a medicine man that I know of. I actually met him during one of those cultural festivals that I attended a few years ago. He's respected and well known in the tribe. Carlo shifted uneasy in his seat, glancing over at Diego and then to Bill. Bill responded, he's in a reservation not far from here. It's actually right in Alpine. Bill unfolded a worn out map out of his pocket and he started to trace a road with his finger. In order to reach Alpine from here, we'll have to get on the main highway for a stretch. I know it's not ideal, especially given our activities. However, it will cut hours off of our journey. And just so you know, this isn't a guarantee solution, but it's the best chance we have. The main highway? That's risky, Bill. We're already trying to lay low. And the highways will have patrol cars, I said. Bill's eyes then locked with mine. I understand the risk, but we have something more serious behind us. Time isn't on our side. These back roads are twisty, poorly lit, and they add time to the journey. The highway, on the other hand, is direct and fast. Carlos then said, and it's more open. If all of this is true, and it will follow us wherever we go, then it will have a harder time catching up on a wide open road, I think. Bill then continued. Once we're past the main stretch of the highway, I know a series of back roads that will take us straight to the res, away from any dangers. All right, Bill, let's hope the highway is quiet tonight. As I mentioned in my previous letter, we always placed our trust in Carlos when it came to driving, yet this time was different. All our previous travels, following well-known roads we'd taken before, but now we have found ourselves threading through the unfamiliar countryside. As the hum of the engine filled the air and the miles rolled past, thoughts consumed my mind. The events of the day, once seeming so normal, had taken a dark and unexpected turn that I could never have imagined. I looked at the road in front of us, endless possibilities and so many dangers. The adrenaline rush from earlier began to go away. It was replaced by a sense of dread. I had been involved in several high-risk operations before. Running from law enforcement, dealing with unexpected complications. But nothing like this. This felt different. Supernatural. The things we had seen. The stuff Bill was talking about. It was all stuff straight from a horror film. Only this was no movie. This was real life. The heavy weight of fear pressed down on me. Were we actually being hunted by a creature of legend? 
that the actions we had done, or even the actions of Bill's ancestors, really did have consequences. How did a normal weekend like this go wrong? I glanced at Carlos. His face was filled with worry. As he gripped the steering wheel, his knuckles were white. He too must have been questioning everything, wondering how he ended up in this situation. Behind us was Bill sitting with a pensive look. His knowledge of the creature and what he had discovered possibly weighing heavy on him. This line of work is filled with known dangers, but there's also a certain code that we all understand. Along the border, there are trails and concealed roads that are passed down through word of mouth back in Mexico. These networks of towns and hideouts have been established over the years. And even though different coyotes might be in the passage, the roads remain the same. This shared knowledge sometimes means that we cross roads with other people. Such was the case about a year ago. We were escorting a family of four. The night was calm and quiet. We were guiding a family through a secluded trail when the narrow pathway suddenly expanded into a small clearing. Not surprised, we stumbled upon another group. The leader, or at least what I assume was the coyote, a tall white guy with scars crisscrossing down one cheek. It turned out that we had both decided to use this spot as a pickup for the people that we were crossing over. We had already told the family's contacts to meet us there, but the other group wasn't so friendly of sharing the space. Carlos attempted to defuse the tension, saying that we would leave and return in a few hours, but I guess they didn't want to hear it. The situation spiraled, and before we knew it, guns were drawn and threats were being shouted. Eventually, the tall white guy, quote unquote, granted us to leave and told us to not come back, and we actually relocated about 30 minutes away. Relieved, we settled down for the remainder of the night. However, I was awoken by the sound of gunshots, jumping me awake to the sight of our camp being destroyed. Some of our backpacks had been trashed and looted. It dawned on me that the other group had trailed us to rob us, and to make matters worse, the gunshots had attracted a nearby border patrol unit. The distant sound of the vehicles were getting closer. They had robbed us, and then shot in the air, drawing the attention of border patrol towards us. We barely managed to escape and return to safety, but this whole thing engraved a hard lesson into me. Since then, I've been cautious of coming across other people. I have learned to keep distance and move carefully if we ever come across other people. Then, there was a border patrol incident near the Rio Grande. We were making our way under the cover of night when suddenly, powerful floodlights washed over us. Someone had tipped off the border patrol, and they were on us faster than we could have thought. The sound of the police pierced the night. We were running for our lives. The adrenaline pumping through my veins that night was like nothing I had ever felt. The good thing though is that at this point, we were actually on our way back to Mexico after dropping a family off. With the sound of the river to one side, making ourselves harder targets if we did end up getting caught. It was close but we managed to escape them regrouping a few miles down into Mexico, where we always said we would meet up if something happened. While these past challenges were risky, they were regarding people, confrontations with fellow humans, a risk that came with the stuff we were doing. But what I saw back at the farmhouse, this, Yina Droshi, was something else. The tires crunched against the gravel as the narrow back roads gave way to smooth asphalt. The inside of the car was filled with tension. I could feel it. Each of us lost in our own thoughts, processing everything that was going on. As Carlos maneuvered the Suburban, the glaring headlights of one vehicle, driving on the opposite lane of us, served as a reminder that we were re-entering the real world. The highway was quiet, with only a few trucks and late night drivers sharing the road. The Suburban's tires hummed on the road surface, the only noise in a world that seemed much too silent. As we continue, a signpost loomed out of the darkness on the right side of the road, reflecting the headlights in a way that made the white lettering gleam brightly against its green backdrop. Marfa, Texas, 16 miles, it said pointing to the left. 
to the right, another arrow. Alpine, Texas, 13 miles. Good old Marfa, Texas, with its mysterious lights. And then there was Alpine, a connection to the Big Bend region, with its old historic downtown, and a lone university as well. Carlos adjusted his grip on the steering wheel. He briefly glanced at the sign, then set his eyes back on the road ahead. I turned to look at everybody in the back, and then I said, So whenever we get to Alpine, this is what we're going to do. We'll get a motel, get two rooms, I will contact Diego and Lucia's point of contact, and let them know where we are at. Bill, I know what you're going to say, but to be honest, I don't know what this thing was, but I think we're pretty clear from it. To be honest, I knew what I had seen, I know what we had all seen, but... It's been hours, and nothing's happened. We should be heading to the medicine man first, Bill said, frustration evident in his voice. Every minute we waste is taking us closer to more danger. Cardo shot a glance at him through the rearview mirror. We need to ensure Diego and Lucia are safe. Taking care of them is our first priority. We can't drag them further into this mess without some sort of plan. But you don't get it. None of you do, Bill said. This isn't like running from the border patrol or evading other people. This is something else we're dealing with. Every extra mile we drive away from the medicine man, it's placing us more in danger. We need a middle ground. We get Diego and Lucia to Alpine. We ensure they're safe. Then, without delay, we head to the medicine man with Bill and that's it. I said. Bill let out a frustrated breath, clearly unhappy, but he nodded. As Carlos continued driving, with his eyes straight ahead, it got silent for about five minutes. I turned to look at Carlos, and he kept his eyes straight ahead, but the silence was soon interrupted by my thoughts. I began my voice slightly shaky. Remember Miguel's warning back at the border about the families disappearing? Carlos exhaled deeply. Yeah, I remember. He told us to be more cautious in this area. Remember the other stories I had heard of people who went missing? And when they were found, their bodies were twisted in ways you couldn't imagine. His voice lowered, filled with dread. Do you think this thing, creature, this thing we encounter, could be behind it all? Bill's head snapped up, and with a voice of concern, what exactly did Miguel say? He pressed. Carlos hesitated for a moment, gauging Bill's reaction. He spoke of stuff that had been happening to people, and not just disappearing, but when some of them were eventually found, they were unrecognizable. Their bodies were mangled. Bill's gaze dropped to his hands, clenched tightly in his lap. He appeared to be grappling with his thoughts, choosing his words carefully. There are stories I have heard. Fuck, shouted Carlos. The familiar hum of the suburban's engine began sputter sounds, similar to the ones we had heard when we were driving to Bill's farm. Carlos gripped the wheel tightly as he quickly looked at the dashboard. Chingada madre. Fuck, he said, wielding the engine to maintain its momentum. But the sputtering got worse, becoming more desperate. Hijo de su puta madre, Carlos said smacking the steering wheel in frustration. His face was a mix of panic and disbelief, eyes darting to the fuel gauge, which still showed half a tank. Then, the engine struggling sound let out one final, defeated cough, before it gave out completely, sliding the vehicle into eerie silence except for the rolling of the tires against the asphalt. The Suburban's momentum carried it ahead for a few more seconds before it rolled to a stop. The headlights were starting to dim. Bill, Carlos, and I looked at each other, stranded in the middle of a highway with Diego and Lucia and with something following us. It was the last situation we thought we would be in. In the midst of this dread, the instincts of Carlos kicked in. With a sense of urgency and speed, he opened the central console revealing two guns. Without a second thought, he handed one to me. Our eyes met, and in that tense moment, we knew what was next. Morir matando, 
is la ley, he said. Going down dying while killing is the law. It sent a chill down my spine. It signified what we were ready to do in order to survive this situation. I know earlier I said how we were different from other coyotes, but just to prove to you, we never even showed our guns because we know it made people nervous. We wanted Diego and Lucia to feel the most comfortable they could be. Even though now, this seemed to be the worst situation I had ever been in myself. Carlos was the first to step out of the vehicle, his movements quick, following his lead. I flung my door open, taking a deep breath of the cold night air, turning to everybody else. My voice was firm, leaving no room for debate. All right, listen closely, I said. We're walking now. You will not speak. You will not make a sound. Just follow my lead and move fast. Assuming this role wasn't my preferred style, but the gravity of our situation demanded it. Our survival and being caught was dependent on many factors, and I wanted to make sure that nobody caused anything to put us at risk. Bill, get out, I said. Diego, help Lucia and stay close. As Bill climbed out of the car, Diego clutched his daughter's hand. Pulling her gently along with him, their eyes were filled with fear, reflecting the eerie glow of the dim headlights. All right, Bill and Diego. I glanced over at the dark outline of the trees in the distance. Start heading for that tree line over there. Stay low and move as quietly and quickly as possible. We'll catch up to you all. They nodded, their silhouettes fading quickly as they ran towards the cover of the forest. Every second was counting now, and our window of opportunity was closing. Carlos put the Suburban in neutral, and then we positioned ourselves at the rear of the Suburban, setting our stance to push the heavy vehicle, muscle straining as I pushed. As the Suburban's tires started crunching on the roadside gravel, my attention was caught by a distant glimmer, a small light in the distance, unmistakably a vehicle approaching. It became clear with every passing second. Even though it was still quite a distance away, it was getting closer. We need to hurry. There's a car coming, I urgently said to Carlos. With the weight of the Suburban starting to feel more heavy. I see it, Carlos said while pushing. The sight of those distant lights growing closer motivated us to get the vehicle off the road as fast as possible. Finally, we were able to push the Suburban as it came to rest in a ditch. Hidden from the main road, Carlos and I, gasping for air, looked at each other before breaking into a sprint, aiming to catch up with everyone else and disappear into the tree line before the coming vehicle reached the sub. The faint outline of Bill, Diego, and Lucia could barely be seen as they darted towards the tree line. Their forms were blending into the night. The distant hum of the incoming vehicle grew louder, adding urgency to our steps. We can't let them see us, Cardo said. We both knew that if the approaching vehicle decided to stop and investigate the abandoned suburban on the side of the road, we would most likely be in trouble. Every footstep felt heavy. The tree line, which initially seemed so distant, was slowly coming into clear focus. Suddenly, the noise of the vehicle's engine grew louder, indicating it was nearly close. Instead of making it to the tree line, I decided to fall and lay down as Carlos did the same thing our bodies flat against the dirt, praying that we wouldn't be seen. With its headlights glaring bright in the dark, raced by without even slowing down. We remained still for a few more moments, just to be sure. The sound of its engine gradually faded, swallowed by the night. Only then did we decide to exhale and stand up, sharing a glance of relief. I could make out the outlines of Bill, Diego, and Lucia, who had paused to wait for us. Just before we reached the spot where Bill, Diego, and Lucia were waiting, I turned to Carlos. How many vehicles are you down now with this one gone? Carlos, with a smirk, that one makes it a total of eight in the last two months. I raised an eyebrow. Man, you go through them like candy. Carlos then shrugged. It's all part of the game, my friend. These aren't your normal vehicles. They're not traceable. Seeing my puzzled expression, he continued. I got a few connections with a deal with an uncle who works for the Sinaloa cartel as a driver. They guard the GM factories down in Guanajuato that they are using as a cover for other businesses. He sells me vehicles with no trace, no history, completely clean. Once their job is done, I get rid of them. 
However, with the recent changes that GM had done, for example, by choosing to discontinue the Chevy Avalanche, which was always built and shipped out of Mexico, made it a little bit more difficult to get vehicles. Man, that's a dangerous game, I said, thinking of the high risk that was involved in dealing with the cartels. Carlos nodded, his smirk fading. It's either play the game or get played. Carlos mentioning ditching vehicles triggered a familiar memory, prompting a half chuckle from me. Remember that time when the vehicle started leaking, overheated smack in the middle of the road? Carlos laughed, the sound echoing slightly in the silence of the night. Oh man, that was a mess. I still blame that junk of a car you got me from that shady dealer in Nogales. I rolled my eyes, recalling the questionable choice. It was a bargain, man. But yeah, most likely not the best choice. The memory was both bitter and sweet. We ended up walking non-stop, Cardo said. Through that fucking hard terrain, all the way to Bill's fucking farm. It took us almost a day. Bill's place was always our fallback. Whenever things went south, we knew we could count on him. His farm was like a sanctuary, away from everybody. Plus, it was a pickup point for all the families that we would bring over. After the lesson we learned from the white guy that robbed us, we learned it was better to have a connection on this side of the border instead of relying on a motel, street corner, or even a store for pickup. As we finally reached the others, I placed a reassuring hand on the shoulder of Diego, noting the deep concern in his eyes. Hey, we're safe for now, I whispered. Bill, with his years of experience in this area, knew the terrain well. He adjusted the bag on his shoulder and looked at all of us. Alpine ain't too far from here, he said, pointing towards a faint silhouette of hills visible under the pale moonlight. We just need to cut through the woods and stay out of sight. As we started walking into the woods, I looked back to see the Suburban. It was completely pitch black. And for a quick second, I swear I was going to see that coyote figure standing somewhere in the open field looking at us. But there was nothing. As we walked into the woods, Lucia, clinging to her father Diego, kept looking around. Then, Diego's voice trembled. Hey, what about entering Alpine at this hour? Isn't that risky? Bill nodded. Diego's right. Arriving in the middle of the night, especially under these circumstances, might draw unwanted attention. Diego, his voice filled with anxiety, surprisingly started speaking more, as if something had changed. I was shocked. What about that thing? Are we really going to spend the night in the woods with that thing lurking behind us? Diego said. Lucia clung stronger to her father, her eyes filled with fear at the mention of this. Carlos glanced at the charm hanging around his neck, its gleam reflecting the faint moonlight. These necklaces, he said, gripping it tightly. They're supposed to keep us safe, right? Bill nodded and said, They're supposed to ward off evil. As long as we keep them on, we should be safe. But he hesitated for a moment. It's important that we don't remove them, not even for a second. Lucia then started looking at her own little necklace. But what if that creature doesn't follow us? Maybe it lost our trail, or maybe it wasn't even after us. Maybe it's just out there, I said. Carlos raised an eyebrow. It is weird though, if we did indeed encounter that thing, why isn't it chasing us? And why did it let us get away? Bill, looking at us, responded, There are things that just operate in ways we don't understand. Sometimes they hunt, sometimes they observe, and sometimes they just want to put fear. Diego then said, So you're saying we might be safe here? Bill exhaled slowly. I'm saying we have to be cautious and rely on our wits. These necklaces will provide protection, but we should not get carried away. Carlos then chimed in. It's been a long day. Maybe it's better if we find a spot and rest for the night here in the woods. At least for the next few hours till the sun comes up. Yeah, that sounds good. We'll find a spot deep enough in the woods. Maybe in a clearing. With the plan set, we began walking deeper into the woods. 
Every leaf and every snapping twig made our hearts race, reminding us that the unknown lurked in the unseen spaces around us. Eventually, after what felt like hours, we entered a small clearing. The trees were parted just enough to allow glimpses of the moonlight. Cardo scanning the area. This will do. We should rest here for a bit, he said, his voice echoing slightly in the stillness of the night. Alpine is basically 30 more minutes that way. Let's rest and go into town once the sun rises, Bill said. We sat down and took a moment to catch our air. I approached Diego and Lucia, who seemed extremely tired, sitting beside them. I offered a reassuring smile. Yamero llegamos. We're almost there, I whispered. Once we get to Alpine, we'll find a motel for you both. A safe place where you can rest, and then you can call your pickup to let them know your location. Everything will be okay. Maybe if I have time, I'll explain why when we cross someone over, nobody is allowed to carry a cell phone. Nobody, not even ourselves. Phone numbers were to be remembered. But let's just say that we didn't want no crazy emotional decisions being made by anybody. Not the family, not the people, and not even ourselves. We were to be disconnected from technology for a few days until we could make it. In case you didn't know, cell phones are traceable. And if you have time, I want you to look up what a geofence location warrant is. It's basically a warrant or a system that law enforcement reaches out to Google or any phone carrier and they can request a list of cell phones that have been connected to a cell phone tower from that radius and this is how they can track you down. It'll tell you the time, the location, the phone number, and the cell phone itself. Lucia then looked up at me, her big eyes filled with fear. Diego placing an arm around his daughter gave me a nod of gratitude. Confiamos en ti, gracias. We trust you, thanks, he murmured. The clearing had now become a resting stop for all of us. In the midst of all this, for a brief moment, it offered a much needed rest. The clearing was quiet, except for the distant calls of crickets chirping and the rustling of leaves above us. The moonlight would at times provide glimpses of the trees all around us. I walked over to Carlos and I sat next to him and said, Hey man, so I have a different idea. So instead of all of us walking into town together, don't you think it might seem off to somebody? I think it's better if I go alone. I get a room and then come back and we all walk into town at different times. Carlos looked at me. It's a good plan, he whispered, but it's risky. Are you sure you want to do this on your own? I nodded. Think about it, man. It's far less suspicious for one person to wander into town than all of us showing up together, especially at this time or even in the morning. I guess I wasn't whispering because out of nowhere, Bill chimed in. You're right. Alpine isn't too friendly to strangers, especially with a border patrol station in town as well. Carlos reached into his pocket, handed me some cash. Here, this should cover the room and anything else you might need. I went up to Diego and Lucia and explained to them the new plan. Lucia just kept staring at me with her eyes wide open. Diego looked at me worried, and I said, Hey, no te preocupes. Don't worry. I'll be back in a few. I know there was a huge fear building up inside of him. How many stories had he heard of coyotes abandoning families, and even couples, leaving them for dead? Diego didn't know me on a personal level, but I know we connected through word of mouth. As I said earlier, I was known for my safe reputation. Stay close to Carlos. He will take care of you both, I told him. As I started walking back towards the woods and continue my walk, each rustle of leaves or snapping twigs sent my heart racing. I could see the town coming into view as I got closer to the tree line. Gun in hand, I tried to regulate my breathing as well, telling myself that the mysterious creature wouldn't leave the property of Bill. It hadn't followed us so far. Bill seemed to know about what was going on. He always spoke of how the land had traces to his ancestors. Spirits and the unseen were topics that he always enjoyed discussing every time we met at his farmhouse or at the festivals. 
Maybe the creature was bound to the land. Or maybe there was something else keeping it at bay. You see, being in this business, you knew all the towns close to the border. However, getting there from the middle of nowhere was a whole different task. It seems like Bill was right. He was real familiar with these areas. Pushing aside the hanging branches, I began to notice the first signs of civilization. The distant sound of a car engine, the faint glow of lights, was close. I just had to hold my nerve a little longer. The woods started to get thin, and soon I found myself on the outskirts of Alpine. The streets were mostly alone, with just a couple of stray cats darting between parked vehicles. I kept my head down, making sure that I drew as little attention to myself as possible. With the border patrol station nearby, I couldn't afford any slip-ups. I couldn't afford a single mistake. After another 10 minutes of brisk walking, I spotted it. The motel. Its neon sign flickered, just as I remembered. Taking a deep breath of air, I approached the front door, ready to secure a room for all of us. As I walked into the motel lobby, a bell above the door chimed softly, announcing my entrance. The inside was dimly lit, with worn out laminated flooring. Behind the counter, an older woman with graying hair and a pair of reading glasses that were dangling from a chain around her neck. She looked up from a crossword puzzle. Morning, what can I do for you? She greeted. I'm looking for a room for the night. Just something simple. She looked at me curious, as if trying to gauge my story. Are you traveling alone? Yeah, I'm just passing through town, I said, attempting to keep the conversation brief. She nodded, scribbling something down on a notepad. All right, that'll be 45 for the night. I gave her the cash, noting the keys hanging on the wall behind her, each label with a room number. You'll be in room eight, she said, handing me a key with a faded plastic tag. It's just around the corner. Breakfast starts at 7 a.m. if you're interested. Coffee's always fresh. Thank you, I replied. Fresh coffee? Yeah, right. By the way, do the rooms have phone lines? Only phone available is the one right here in the lobby, sweetie. She offered a half smile. You take care now. Alpine's a quiet town, but it's always good to be careful. This voice of caution or warning in her voice caught me off guard. Taking the key, I made my way to room eight, feeling the weight of the night's events pressing down on me. I opened the door and looked around. Perfect. This room is perfect for Diego and Lucia until they get picked up. I closed the door, and I walked back towards the lobby as I overheard the TV news playing in the background. However, what caught my attention was what the news anchor was saying. I stepped closer to the counter again. More bodies being found along the border. Authorities have still not determined what could be the cause. Hey, you know, I began, pointing towards the TV. I've been hearing a lot about those disappearances lately, as I've been going on for a while. She looked up at me with a serious expression. It's been happening more frequently these past few months. People have gone missing. Then they find them in real bad shape near the border or sometimes they're not found at all. It's actually got a lot of people scared. Do you know what's going on? I asked, curious and trying to gauge if there was any connection to what we have experienced. She leaned in closer to the counter, her voice dropping to a whisper. Some people think it's related to the cartels, but there are talks in town about something else. I felt a shiver run down my spine. My mind instantly jumped to the creature from Bill's farm. Could this creature be responsible for these things? The lady continued. I lived in Alpine all my life, and I heard stories about strange things happening in these parts, but nothing like this. This is different. I nodded. Thanks for the heads up. I'll be sure to be careful. She gave me a worried look. Just stay safe, all right? I will. And by the way, can I trouble you for a cup of water? She sighed. She rose from her seat and retrieved the glass from beneath the counter, proceeding to the water dispenser that was behind her. As she filled the glass, I extended my hand to take it. 
quenching my thirst. And that's when she noticed my necklace. I looked down and grabbed the necklace. It's a necklace for good luck. I began. It was given to me by a longtime friend. It's also believed to ward off evil and harm. She leaned in, squinting at the detailed design on the necklace. For a moment, there was an awkward silence as her gaze seemed to pierce through the necklace and into my soul. She started to clear her throat. You know, it's strange. Over the past few months, that exact design has been popping up around here. Uh, what do you mean? I asked with a confused look. She hesitated for a moment. Those disappearances you were talking about. She whispered, her voice trembling slightly. Every single body that they have found in the last couple of months. They said they have found them with a necklace of that sort. It looks similar to that design. Her words made me freeze. The water glass slipped from my hand, shattering on impact and splashing the rest of the water on the floor. The noise echoed in the silence that followed. She rushed to hand me a paper towel. Here, sweetie, put these towels on top of that and just pick up the glass and throw it in that trash bin over there. The lady then looked at me. I'm just wondering where you got it from. Just be careful to be seen with it. That necklace, it actually might be the opposite that you think it is. Our annual camping trip was always a perfect time to get away from the daily busyness of life. A way to reconnect with nature and each other. It's something we had been doing since we had gotten out of high school. Every summer, my friends and I would choose a different, often remote location to explore and go camping. And so this summer, the six of us, Sarah, Mike, Jennifer, Luke, Emily, and I decided to go further up north in Utah into the Wasatch Cache National Forest. When the day finally arrived, we met at dawn. We had decided to take my beat up old van that my father had given me as a graduation gift after high school, around six years or so. It was a family possession that was being passed down, so you can imagine what it looked like. I do gotta say, even though I was embarrassed about it at first, it is still running and getting me from point A to point B without any issues. It was spacious and had enough seats for all of us to ride together, even with all of our gear, which included all of our tents and camping stuff. The drive to the National Forest was beautiful, and it also had amazing views. The road stretched before us as hours passed, and the landscape shifted from small roads to being surrounded by dense trees. We share stories and the occasional debate about the best path to take to reach our destination. Sarah, who was sitting in the front passenger seat, looked at the map that she had spread out, her finger tracing the various roads they could take. All right, folks, we got a couple of options here. The main road will take us through the heart of the forest but this secondary road might offer a more scenic journey. Before venturing into the wooded pines of Utah, we stopped by one of the local forest offices to gather information. Google and iPhones couldn't always be relied upon in these remote areas, so Sarah had purchased a detailed local paper map. She was always the one planning every trip down in detail. I know we're used to having technology guide us, but out here, it's best to rely on good old-fashioned paper," she said holding up the map with a grin. Mike, who was sitting behind me, leaned ahead, squinting at the map. Scenic is good, but how well maintained is that secondary road? The last thing we want is to get stuck out here in the middle of nowhere. Well, the map does say it's a bit longer, but it looks like it leads through some interesting landmarks. There's an old bridge marked here and it seems like a more direct path to the campsite, Sarah said. Luke, who was sitting in the far back, raised an eyebrow with a grin. An old bridge, huh? Are we talking wooden planks or Indiana Jones-style adventure? Jennifer laughed, 
Let's hope it's somewhere in between. I'm all for adventure, but I'd rather not end up in a river. Leo, as the driver, what do you think? Sarah asked me. Well, seeing that we still have sunlight on our side, I say we take the scenic road. I mean, what's the rush, right? I vote for the old bridge. I'm going to say the old bridge as well. Why don't we take a vote, Emily said. Everyone raised their hand except Mike. Sorry, Mike. Maybe next time you'll win, Sarah said. A decision had been reached. The secondary road, with its promise of scenic beauty. I veered onto the road, the wilderness and trees closing in. The path was narrow, flanked by dense woods that only gave way to small rays of the sunlight. After hours had passed and the sun began to set, we found ourselves coming across the bridge that spanned the river. The water reflecting the fading light, a contrast to the woods that lay ahead. It looks like this is the old bridge Sarah mentioned, Mike remarked as I slowed down the van. Sarah peered out of the window, her eyes scanning the bridge. It definitely has that rustic charm, but I hope it's sturdy enough to support the van. Luke's grin returned as he leaned, his excitement evident. Well, there's only one way to find out. Jennifer laughed. All right, but if we end up in the river, Luke, you're swimming back to the campsite. I'm not going to lie. I was nervous. The bridge looked like it was a mixture of concrete and wood. What if we didn't make it? When was the last time this bridge was used? I eased the van slowly onto the creaky bridge, not even knowing what the point of driving slowly was, because if it was to break, it was going to break. The warm planks made noises beneath the weight of the van as the river flowed gently below. I looked in the rearview mirror to see everyone's scared faces as we crossed still maintaining my eyes on the road back and forth. I saw Emily's eyes as she gazed out the water below. This is something like an adventure out of a movie, isn't it? I'm expecting to see hidden treasure on the banks, she said. Mike chuckled, his grip steady on one of the handlebars. Yeah, you're right. We're gonna find out what adventure this is if we end up falling, because you all decided to come through this raggedy bridge. Mike was always the more serious one but courageous in the group. He always took challenges head on and nothing ever seemed to scare him. Luke was the joker of the group. His sense of humor was always there, even in the most serious moments. Sarah, on the other hand, was our friend who was the most caring of the group. As I said, she always assumed the role of our mom, always making sure everything is planned to the detail. Emily was just silly all around. She was a close friend of all of us, that we simply enjoyed her company. She was the most serious female of the group, but didn't have the seriousness of Mike. Well, if that even makes sense. We ended up making it across the bridge, which I do want to point out, it's not even a long bridge. It simply looked like a small construction bridge that someone built to be able to get across. As the sun started going down, we continued driving with the trees closing in around us even more, almost creating what looked like a tunnel with the headlights of the van being the only source now piercing the darkness. After what felt like an eternity, we finally reached our destination. A dirt open field that looked like where vehicles had parked in the past. Tall pine trees stood around the field forming a natural dome that seemed to welcome us from the outside world. All right, everyone, this is it, I said as I parked the van and stepped out the air carrying a smell that hinted at the adventures that awaited us. There was a small stream nearby, its gentle flowing of water adding to the nature that surrounded us. We unloaded everything and we walked a little bit deeper into the woods until we stumbled upon a clearing not too far from where we had parked. We began the process of setting up camp, pitching tents, arranging firewood, and establishing a central gathering point where the campfire would soon be set ablaze. As the sun finished dipping below the horizon, casting the area in complete darkness, the tent stood up and the campfire pit awaited. We were all fascinated by the beauty of this place, away from the busyness and the stresses of every day in our life. So the first night there started fine, but as the campfire flames flicker in the breeze, we huddle around the fire, sharing stories and laughing with a sense of security over us just because of the presence of each other. With the trees casting long shadows over our campsite, 
and the branches creaking softly in the night wind. Our voices would rise and fall as we took turns recounting past stories and adventures. We talked the normal things when you hang out with friends and family, the same old stories from the past. Hey, remember that time Luke tripped over his own shoelaces and didn't have anything else to wear? Emily giggled, making fun of Luke. He chuckled and rubbed the back of his neck. Yeah, I remember. And I'm still going to say that the tree root came out of nowhere. Jennifer leaned in. Or what about that haunted house we dared each other to explore? I'm pretty sure we all had nightmares for weeks after that. Sarah with a smirk. Alright, but what about this, y'all? The time we heard those strange noises outside our tents during that camping trip in the mountains. Mike's face turned serious and said, Man, I thought we were being surrounded by wild animals or something. That's right, and then we found out it was just a bunch of raccoons having a party in the woods, I said. Of course, throughout this whole time, Emily couldn't say anything but laugh. The night continued on, and it was always a great time to gather with my friends, especially after not seeing them for so long. As we were telling and recounting past adventures, something caught my attention. I was looking over to Mike as he was talking and for a quick glimpse, at the edge of the woods, where the firelight struggled to penetrate the darkness, there was movement, a flicker of shadow that seemed to move between the trees. I quickly stood up and focused with my head to look over towards the tree line as I exchanged glances with the others. Did any of you see that? I whispered. Luke turned to look where I was looking and squinted into the darkness. What did you see? Maybe a deer or something? It moved kind of strange for a deer, I said. Jennifer leaned closer to the fire. I hope you're not trying to pull a prank, Leo. As I looked deeper into the tree line, still trying to get my eyes adjusted from staring at the fire for too long, I saw that the movement in the trees and branches was getting closer. It was something or someone. I kept staring out into the tree line. This movement was drawing closer, slowly becoming visible by the light the fire was giving out. And that's when I noticed a silhouette of a hunched figure and I guess that's when Luke finally saw it because he said it looks like a person do you think it's someone lost in the woods Emily whispered I hope it's not someone who's hurt Sarah said with concern in her voice Luke chuckled well if this person is hurt they're sure moving better than I would be who even goes wandering around the woods at this hour Emily said at this point, all of us were standing, and that's when I decided to say, Who's out there? I yelled. Then, just as the silhouette became clear in the tree line, that's when a voice broke the silence. Greetings, young ones. This person said in a voice that held both wisdom and innocence. Emerging from the trees, I saw it was an older man. Forgive my intrusion. I spied the glow of your campfire from afar and was drawn hoping it wasn't a wildfire that I would have to put out. This land, you see, holds a history long forgotten by many. His steps and his form, revealing his age not only in his slightly stooped posture, but also in the deep lines engraved on his face. It was as though he was an extension of the trees surrounding us. As he drew closer, the crackling of the fire and the distant sounds of the forest underscored the quiet intensity of the moment. Finally, he approached the campfire revealing his full features as he introduced himself. Pardon me, my name is Tog. His voice, very old and raspy, with one of his eyes semi-shut, scars and years of life showing on his face. I offer a friendly smile. Hey... I'm Leo, and this is Luke, Sarah, Emily, Jennifer, and Mike. We, um, didn't expect to have company out here. What brings you to these woods at this hour? He stared at us with his one eye. The woods have always been my refuge, my sanctuary, my safe place. I come here to remember the old ways, to honor the native land that sustained my ancestors. Native land? Jennifer questioned. 
her voice in a serious manner. The old man nodded, his gaze fixed on the flickering flames. Staring at them, he said, Yes, this land was once home to my ancestors, and I have wandered these woods to honor their memory. But in all my years, it's very rare when I encounter fellow souls under these stars. Mike leaned in with curiosity but in a serious tone. So what brought you here tonight? With a faint smile, Tog said, Your fire, as I said before. But then I heard the laughing that echoed through the trees. It reminded me of times in the past where I shared and bonds were forged around similar fires. Are you telling us that you're camping out here too? Emily asked. Tog's chuckle was like the rustling leaves themselves. Well, not quite. My old bones prefer the comforts of a proper bed, but I do find peace in these woods, even under the cover of night. As the conversation flowed, Tog's words painted a picture of his relationship with the woods. The way he spoke, the stuff he was saying, seemed like he was one with the forest. There is nothing like finding peace and comfort within your own self and the beauty of nature. There are hidden trails that go through the forest, roads known only to those who have taken the time to listen to the whispers of the woods. Every rustle of leaves, every flowing stream, and every whisper of the wind carries echoes of the past. His voice full of reverence of the woods. Listen, the ancient wisdom of this land has much to teach if one is willing to listen. I'm not sure what it was, but the way he spoke and the way he looked seemed like he was just a hippie who loved the outdoors. Pretty harmless in my opinion. I took a step towards him and put my hand on his shoulder. Uh, Tog? Well, how do you spell your name? I asked. My name? Well, that's the first time that somebody has ever asked me how to spell it. As I mentioned, I have a native background, so it's spelled T-A-O-G. I figured that's how you spell it. Just wanted to make sure. Well, Tog, we're sharing stories ourselves, and it seems you have quite a few to tell. Would you care to join our campfire? His eye glinted with appreciation. I would be honored to, young man. As he settled into a log near the fire, and we all sat down, his presence seemed to infuse the night with a deeper sense of connection. He started telling stories of the hidden trails, the forgotten stories, and the ancient wisdom that whispered through the leaves, blending with the crackling of the fire and the rustling of the trees. He spoke not just of the past, but of the living spirit of the woods, a spirit that resonated with each of us, as we gather around the fire, as he delved into his stories and what seemed to be a TED talk on how we need to respect the woods and nature, he told us how he comes into the forest to spend seasons, to honor his spiritual ancestors, how he owns a few remote cabins and has learned to be self-sufficient just like his ancestors. However, one specific story caught the attention of all of us. He told the story of a supposed creature that haunted these very woods for generations. Then, his voice took on a somber tone, and even the crackling fire seemed to be quiet, as if the forest itself was holding its breath to listen. The whispering goat, he began, his words dripping with a mixture of reverence and dread, is a creature of darkness, a shapeshifter that walks a fine line between man and beast. It has a twisted power, the ability to mimic the voices of those it encounters, drawing them into its trap. As he detailed this supposed creature, our circle grew tense. I could see the eyes of everyone else that they were paying attention to this specific story. He then lowered his gaze and his voice, almost a whisper, he said, a few decades ago, my brother ventured into these woods, drawn by the whispers of familiar voices, as I was searching for him. 
I heard my own voice calling out to him, but it wasn't me. It was someone else calling out to him. That's when I think my brother believed he was responding to my call, but it was the whispering goat's deceit. And so he never returned and I never found him. His fate shrouded in mystery. I have carried the weight of that loss ever since, haunted by the knowledge that he may have fallen prey to the whispering goat. A shiver crept down my spine as we all listened. When he concluded his tale, there was silence. Even the fire seemed to have absorbed the weight of his story as it started to go down. With a slow and crippled movement struggling to get up, he rose from his seat, his eye meeting each of ours in turn. I thank you all for allowing an old man to share his stories with you. But the night grows old, and it's time for me to return to the embrace of these ancient trees. He said in a voice that contained gratitude and sorrow. As he stepped away from the fire, he turned around and said, I almost forgot. Stay close. He said in a warning voice, And do not be swayed by the voices that you think you know. The darkness seemed to cover him as he walked away, making him one with the shadows of the woods. It's almost like he was part of this landscape. We watched in silence as he receded into the darkness, each of us lost in our own thoughts. Even the noises of the forest seemed to hold its breath, a quiet reverence for the figure that had imparted both wisdom and a warning. And as the echoes of his footsteps crunching the leaves faded, the woods returned to their symphony of rustling leaves and distant whispers. A heavy silence fell within our group. Well, what the fuck was all that about? This hippie love-making tree hugger most likely has his tent somewhere out there and lives out here in the woods, Luke said. We tried shaking off the feeling, but I could tell the anxiety had filled everyone, thanks to the power of a supposed well-told ghost story. But as the night deepened, the campfire had dwindled to embers, and a thick blanket of darkness fell over the campsite. I do want to point out that whenever we went camping, we always either slept inside a tent or outside altogether by the campfire. I guess nothing like actually experiencing the beauty of nature. Tonight, we decided to all sleep in our sleeping bags around the dying campfire as the events of the evening and the stories still linger in our heads. We all decided to go to sleep and as I was falling asleep in the dead of the night, that's when I heard it, a whisper that seemed to move through the air. It was a voice, soft and insistent, calling my name, Leo. I fully woke up. I sat up in my sleeping bag with my senses on high alert. My eyes widened, scanning the darkness and everyone else laying down, the faint glimmer of dying embers offering little comfort. Did anybody hear that? I whispered, hoping to see if anyone around me was awake and heard. Mike who was sleeping next to me, sat up and said in a groggy voice, uh, hear what? Someone whispered my name. It sounded like, like you, Mike. Mike's expression shifted from grogginess to a growing sense of unease. That's not possible, Mike said, his eyes flickering to the dark woods that surrounded them. I was asleep. Jennifer then arose with a voice of mixture. Are you sure you didn't dream it, Leo? I know that we're all on edge after the story told by Tog. I haven't even gone to sleep. Every noise out here is making me stay awake. I know what I heard. It was right here in the camp, I said. Man, go to sleep, bro. You're hearing things now. Stop being such a wuss. There's nothing out here, Mike said. But then... Just on the edge after Mike's last word, the faintest whisper, Leo. Everyone fell silent. The voice was real, undeniable, and it sounded like it was next to our campfire. We all looked to Mike, 
What? I didn't say anything. Mike said. Of course, it was complete darkness. So we couldn't even really see each other out there. So we all just huddle even closer with everyone else waking up groggy as well and getting closer together too. Seeking refuge in our shared presence. Okay. Um, what's going on y'all? I said. It's most likely that old Papa trying to prank us. He's most likely out there with more people scaring campers. Mike said. Well, one of us should stand watch and just be on the lookout. It's already 4 a.m. and the sun will begin to rise in a few hours. I said. Of course, none of us ended up going back to sleep. And we all just stood awake with eyes wide open. The morning couldn't come soon enough. Seeing the daylight brought relief. But as we remember the night, others, including Luke, Sarah, and Emily, admitted, hearing whispers as well, each in the voice of a different member of our group. We try brushing it off as imagination, simply fueled by the stories that told was telling us last night. We got ready for the day, and the sun climbed higher in the sky, casting shadows on the forest floor. Emily suggested that we take a hike, along one of the nearby trails that's on the map. Maybe some fresh air and a change of scenery will help us relax, she said, her voice trying to sound hopeful. Mike and Luke exchanged glances, their expressions a mix of curiosity. I guess it wouldn't hurt to explore a bit. I'm sure it was that old man whispering our names out from the trees last night. If I find him, once we go out there, he's really gonna be looking like an old dead beat up tree. Thanks to stupid Leo for telling him our names, Mike said. Sorry guys, I seriously thought he was just an old hermit walking through, I chuckled. There have been times in the past when we became friends with other campers in our annual trips and we all shared names, even phone numbers to communicate in the future. So I actually didn't think too much of it. We set off on the trail, our footsteps breaking the silence of the woods. The sunlight filtering through the leaves and patches of gold. As we walked, our conversation gradually shifted from the events of the previous night to lighter topics. Remembering old camping trips, sharing funny stories, and debating the best way to make s'mores. It was almost like the woods were allowing us a moment of peace. A chance to reconnect and find comfort in each other's company. Hours passed and we eventually found ourselves in a small clearing by a small stream. The sun was beginning its descent. We took a break, sitting by the water's edge, dipping our fingers in the cool stream. Check this out, y'all, Luke said, his voice with a mixture of excitement. He pointed to the tree where patterns had been carved into the bark. Sarah stepped closer, her fingers tracing the carvings with a sense of wonder. It's like a message left behind, she said as her eyes traced the lines. As we looked around more, we discover other things. Small artifacts hanging from branches, crafted from natural materials, by sticks and stones, and even with symbols painted onto the stones. Hey, it's like the woods are trying to tell us something similar to what Togue said, Emily slightly giggled. Mike raised an eyebrow or maybe it's just people messing around in the woods you know leaving their mark luke nodded in agreement and branches crafted into what looks like symbols they could be signs that they communicated like this back in the day i guess the stories that Tog was sharing with us last night really did prove that we were in the midst of native american land and all these symbols and sticks and stones we found only reinforced that belief who knows, we might be standing on ground that's witnessed generations. Maybe these woods have secrets that date back centuries, Jennifer said. Look guys, I get that this all seems interesting and everything, but let's not forget that we've been on these trips every year, and every time, there's some sort of spooky tale or mysterious superstition that pops up. Remember the haunted lake we stumbled upon two years ago? Mike said. Emily chuckled. Her eyes with amusement, the one with the vengeful water spirit that would drag people under if they swam too far out. 
Mike with a grin. Exactly. And what did we find? A perfectly serene lake where we spent a whole day swimming and goofing off. Luke chimed in. And don't forget the enchanted forest last year where we were told that we would get lost if we ventured too far into the deep woods. Jennifer with a laughing tone said, Right. We found a trail with signs pointing us to various landmarks. Sarah joined in. And let's not even talk about the cursed campground, where they said that we would have to ward off evil spirits to make it through the night. As everybody was laughing, Mike nodded, his point emphasized. See y'all, it's always been a bit of fun and games, fueled by local legends. I'm not saying I don't appreciate the spooky environments, especially by the campfire. But come on y'all, this is just the same old stuff we have encountered before. Emily grinned in a sarcastic and playful tone. So you're telling us you don't believe in any of this? Not even a tiny bit? Mike shrugged. I'm not saying I'm a complete non-believer, but I do think a lot of people exaggerate. Like, what are the odds that we stumble upon some mystical artifacts on this trip, right? Or a whispering goat? Luke raised his eyebrows and said, Maybe... The woods are trying to prove you wrong, Mike. The back and forth continued with everybody as Mike reminded us that we were all friends who had been through it all before. As the day transitioned into evening, we made our way back to the campsite. The sinking sun painted the sky orange and pink. We couldn't ignore the fact that another night was approaching. A night that, given recent events, filled us with a mix of anticipation and dread. Back at the campsite, we set up and got dinner ready. The campfire crackled to life, with its flames dancing. And the forest too, seemed to come alive with the chorus of all the critters starting to make noises. As darkness settled over the campsite, we gathered around the campfire once again. The events of the previous nights were still fresh in our minds. As the evening went on, a thick fog started to surround the entire campsite, and as our campfire struggled, its light barely puncturing the fog, Mike, always the brave one, volunteered to gather more firewood. He ventured out into the mist, his flashlight being gradually merging with the surroundings. This is when everything went to hell. As the fog started getting more thick, and it was getting even more darker, we realized that Mike had been gone for a while. The minutes felt like hours. We exchanged glances. He's been gone for quite a while, y'all. Shouldn't he have been back by now? Emily said with a concerned voice. Maybe he got lost in the fog. One of us should have gone with him, Luke said. Jennifer's eyes were wide. What if he's hurt? What if he encounters something out there? After about 30 minutes, the environment grew heavy. The campfire's embers started to sputter. The fog had taken on an almost suffocating presence. Maybe we should go find them. We can't just wait here in the dark, Sarah said. And that's when I decided to get up. And I said, I'll go look for him. I mean, how far can he be, right? I took about two steps the way Mike had left. And that's when I saw a figure emerging through the fog. It was Mike, and he was coming back with firewood, except the way he was walking was very dull. As he approached the campfire, his movements were mechanical, almost as if he was in a trance. Sarah, always the one to confront difficult situations, broke the silence. Did you get lost or something? He turned to look at her. I'm fine. I found firewood. The unease in the air deepened each of us sensing that something was wrong. Mike's presence fell off. It was as if a shadow had draped itself over his being, distorting his familiar features. His whole demeanor was replaced by an emotionless state. I couldn't help but notice something strange about Mike. He was sitting slightly apart from the group, staring directly at the flames, not even saying anything. I was thinking he was just tired or scared, so I tried to engage him in conversation. Hey Mike, 
Remember that one time we got lost and had to spend an extra night out? But he didn't respond. Well, he did, but his response was delayed. And when he did answer, his tone was off. It lacked the seriousness I was used to. It was almost like he was hearing us talk, but responding to questions a moment too late. You mean, when we thought the squirrels were plotting against us? Luke chimed in, trying to break the growing tension. Yeah, that's right, and you were convinced that the woods had eyes and ears. Mike's laugh, if you could even call it that, sounded forced. A hollow echo, you can say. Yeah, good times. He replied, his gaze distant. Emily leaned ahead with a concerned voice. Hey, Mike, are you okay? You're acting different. Mike then looked at her. I'm not sure. Something about this place. It's like it's under my skin. Jennifer's voice held a note of unease. Weird things have been happening tonight. The voices, the fog, I think we should consider leaving. Mike's gaze remained fixed on the flames. His voice almost lowered to a whisper. Maybe that's not a bad idea. The gravity of his words hung heavy in the air. We exchanged uneasy glances. The weight of the strange things happening, now impossible to ignore. I looked around at my friends, each face reflecting a mix of fear. It was a painful realization that the place that had once been our escape was now a source of unease. Well, we should leave. Something isn't right here, I said. Nods of agreement follow, the decision being unanimous this time. The prospect of abandoning our camping trip was sad, but the safety of our group came first, and so we started packing everything. It took about 30 minutes to break everything down, and by then, it was now completely dark. However, as we finished packing our gear and glanced around to make sure everything was ready, a sinking feeling settled in our stomachs. Mike, who had been acting distant and detached, was just standing by the edge of the clearing, staring into the depths of the woods. Unlike the rest of us, he hadn't lifted a finger to help with the packing and his usual seriousness energetic self replaced by an almost trance-like state. Hey Mike, are you alright man? I said with a concerned tone. Mike's response was slow and distant, as though his mind was somewhere far away. Yeah, I'm fine. Just thinking. Jennifer, exchanging a worried look with all of us, it was clear that something had changed in Mike. As we started getting ready to walk from the campfire back to the van, that's when we heard it. Somewhere in the distance, we heard another voice. It sounded like Mike's voice, and it was calling out, sounding confused and pleading for help. And that's when Emily said, So if that's Mike calling out to us, then who is? As we turned around, Mike was still staring into the woods, but that's when his body started contorting, almost glitching like. Chaos erupted. Jennifer, always quick thinking, threw a log towards this Mike that was standing on the edge of the campsite and yelled everyone to run back to the van. Guided by adrenaline and our flashlights, we dashed through the woods. As we all ran with our belongings, I dared to not look back. But still, a horrible screech drew my attention back to see what had caused this. And that's when I stopped in my tracks to see that whatever this thing was now had its limbs stretched and twisted, reshaping into something that defied the laws of nature. But it was the face that sent a shockwave of terror through me. The human features contorted and elongated the skin stretching and warping as if it was struggling to contain the monstrosity beneath. The eyes, once familiar and warm, became stretched out and unnaturally slanted, their color shifting to an abyss-like blackness that seemed to absorb all light. The nose receded, 
that resembled the snout of a goat. The mouth was a grotesque smile, its lips curling back to reveal rows of jagged, pointed teeth. Every detail was a horrifying mixture of human and animal. That's when I felt my body come back to life, and I yelled to keep running and to not look back, not knowing that even if they got to the van, how would they even get inside because I had the key. I kept running and running thinking what would happen if this thing caught up to us. And then, there, in the distance, I saw the clearing of the trees and familiar sight of the van and heard my friends screaming to hurry up. As I neared the van I saw that the real Mike, with his clothes torn, was there with the rest of the group. With no time to lose, we crammed into the van and sped off. As I looked in the rearview mirror, I saw this creature standing where we had parked at. After about five minutes of driving, Luke finally spoke and said, What the fuck was that? That's when Mike finally spoke and said, When I ventured into the woods, the fog seemed to grow denser with each step I was taking. Soon, my flashlight was the only thing piercing the gloom. I had collected some firewood when I heard whispers. I heard y'all's voices calling out to me. I tried tracing them but got lost. Then, I saw me, or a copy of me. It looked like my reflection in a murky pond. Mike then stopped talking, struggling to find the words. This other me was trying to draw me closer with words and voices that belonged to you all. That's when I decided to hide behind a tree, using the shadows as cover. And every time I try to make a move towards the camp, it seemed to sense me always blocking my path. I thought I was done for, but then I remember a stream we crossed earlier. That's when I made a dash for it and jumped in. The flow carried me downstream, away from that thing. I crawled out, exhausted, and walked towards the van. That's when I started yelling for you all, and that's when you all came running from the forest. As we were speeding away, all the trees were whipping past us their branches scratching the sides of my van, almost like desperate fingers trying to pull us back over the noise of the engine and the pounding of my heart. That's when we heard a low, guttural growl that seemed to come from everywhere all at once. As I kept my eyes on the road, the headlights briefly illuminated, a monstrous form darting between the trees. The creature was a horrible version of a goat, but massive in scale, murky gray, almost appearing slick in the dim light, with rag scars and patches of bare skin. Its eyes, though, were the most terrifying. Deep, soulless pits of black. What the hell is that? Screamed Emily, clutching her seat. I pressed the gas pedal to the floor. With the van's engine roaring, the creature, with an incredible speed, moved through the dense forest. It's every leap and bound bringing it closer to us. As we went through a sharp bend, this thing launched its massive jaw snapping inches from the rear window. Luke, who was in the back seat, rummaged through our camping supplies and hurled a flare out the window. It lit up the surrounding area in a bright crimson glow, distracting the creature for a few seconds. I continued speeding, tires screeching, and for a moment, it seemed we had lost it, but then, a screeching noise that echoed through the woods. The creature resumed its relentless pursuit, its form now even more twisted and grotesque under the flickering light of the flare. The road ahead clear, revealing the bridge we had crossed earlier. Realizing this might be our only chance, Sarah shouted, Get across the bridge, now! We barrel into the bridge, the van shaking under the strained boards. As we reached the halfway point, a deafening roar filled the air. Looking back, we saw the creature stop at the bridge's edge with what looked to be an evil smirk, an image that still haunts me to this day. I'll even provide a drawing at the end if anybody wants to see it. After a few hours of driving, we finally left the woods and found the safety of the dim lit streets of a nearby town. We pulled into a Waffle House, 
and we sat in a corner booth as we recounted the evening's events, trying to make sense of it all. Jennifer, her hands wrapped around her mug. That old man, Tog, she began. He knew too much about the whispering goat. Don't you think? There was agreement between us. I started rubbing my head and responded. It's not just that he knew about it. Remember how he just appeared out of nowhere? And how, after he left, things immediately took a turn for the worse. The eyes of Sarah widened and the way he emphasized not to trust familiar voices. Almost like he was setting us up, giving us a clue about the thing we were about to face. Mike, looking more pale than usual, added, when I was in the woods, trying to escape that thing, I heard more than our voices. I swear, I heard the voice of that old man calling me, trying to draw me in. I think he might have been the whispering goat himself. We all exchanged glances. The thought was too horrific to fully grasp had this creature taken on the look of an old man to toy with us, to get close, to study us. But why would he warn us about himself? It doesn't make sense, I said, unless he enjoys the chase, the fear. Maybe for an old creature, the hunting is more thrilling, Luke said. We all sat in heavy silence, pondering the possibility as we pieced it all together. The sudden appearance of Tog, his detailed stories, and the haunting events. The conclusion became clear. The old man, with deep-set wrinkles and tales of old, had likely been the whispering goat himself. That happened a few months ago, and the trauma still lingers. First up was when we lost touch with Mike, who moved to another state, I guess to escape the memories. From that moment on, everything else changed. The once tight bonds between us frayed. Our group chats grew quiet and any future gathering ceased. And the annual camping trip became nothing more than a distant memory. The haunting echoes of that night lingered and every rustling of leaves, every faint whisper served as a chilling reminder of the presence that lurked in the woods. The memory of the whispering goat and twisted grin haunted my dreams. A constant replay of the terror that unfolded before us. The mere thought of venturing into the wilderness sent shivers down my spine. A sensation of impending doom that I couldn't shake. As time passed, the memory of that horrifying encounter began to fade. We did all end up going separate ways and I found methods to cope with the nightmares I experienced afterwards. I even went and talked with a counselor, because every corner that I looked, every voice I heard, at night when I was falling asleep, I swear I would sometimes hear those faint whispers. Last night, I was walking alone in a park near my apartment. The sun had set, and the moon was shining bright. I quickened my pace as the nighttime brought back episodes and bad memories of the night in the forest. With my heart racing as the memories of that night flooded back, that's when I heard it. A faint distant sound that sent shivers down my spine. Whispers, soft, as if carried by the wind itself. I stopped in my tracks, straining to make out the words, feeling a cold sweat forming on my forehead. I heard my name Leo my heart raced and my instinct screamed at me to run but my feet felt rooted to the ground and the whispering seemed to grow near and then I heard something else a low guttural growl much like the one we had heard that night in the woods fear flooded my veins and I finally tore my gaze away from the darkness fleeing from the park as if my life depended on it, which at this point it most likely did. The whispers and the noises seemed to chase me, echoing in my ears, and I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being pursued. When I finally reached the safety of my home, I locked every door and window, 
heart pounding like a drum. I try to rationalize what happened, telling myself it was all in my head. Anxiety and a product of what happened in the past in the woods. But deep down, I knew it was the whispering goat. As the night continued, I couldn't escape the feeling that I was being watched. That something evil lurked just beyond my vision. And just as I was about to close my eyes that night to try to sleep, I heard it again. The whispers. Closer now. Almost like a soft breath against my ear. Leo. Leo. My blood turned to ice and I clutched my cover. And then, from the corner of my eye, I saw movement. A shadowy figure. Its eyes reflecting the dim light like deep, soulless pits. The figure's mouth opened and it spoke. Its voice using all of my friends' voices, distorted and nightmarish. We missed you, Leo. With my eyes never leaving the figure, with trembling hands, I rushed to the front door, my heart pounding so loud that I couldn't even hear anything else. And then, just as I reached past the door, I heard one last whisper, faint but unmistakable, run. I bursted out the house, leaving everything behind. I got inside my old trusted van and sped away to my parents' house, who lived about two hours away. And I never went back again. It's almost midnight. I'm at my parents' house. And here I am, sharing and writing this to you all, in the hopes to warn you. Everything is real. It's not in my head. And it's still out there waiting in the shadows, whispering a taunting lullaby. Those moments when you second guess a distant call your name, when you are alone at home tonight, in bed, falling asleep, do not be swayed by the voices that you think you know. After what happened to me all those years ago, the one place in the whole world that still rattles my body and sends chills up my spine happens to be my grandmother's farm. When my parents and I would go visit my grandma's one-story farm every three years, I was put in the same room. The room and all its velvet blankets and puffy pillows had a cozy vibe to it, along with the rest of the house. But at night time, the large window in front of the bed painted a picture of the unsettling wilderness outside, which wouldn't help with my imagination. And ever since I was six, my brain terrified me with that imagination, using vivid nightmares, sleep paralysis, and everything else in between. So naturally, my fear of the window was always there. You see, most kids have monsters underneath their beds or in their closets. But at my grandma's house, there was something that lurked outside that window. The first time I ever saw it was at two in the morning. The creature, which I assume was just in my head and I was imagining, was at the edge of the woods staring at the window. It was a goat standing on two legs. Its body had the shape of a human, and its claws dangling around its thighs. I slammed my eyes shut and covered myself with my soft blanket, waiting for the thing to evaporate from my imagination. As you can guess, I was tired by the time I woke up. That morning, when my parents were at the town's Walmart, and I was trying to forget last night's experience, I had a pleasant conversation with Grandma. We loved to talk, and we had a special type of chemistry that transcended our generational differences. Curious about her farm, I wanted to know about all her animals. Well, we have all sorts of animals, she said with a grin. I have chickens, peacocks, sheep, hogs, ducks, horses, ponies. I have just about any animal on this farm besides any kind of goat. You said any goat? I said, recalling the form outside my window. 
Why don't you like any goats? Can't you milk them and make cheese? Grandma's face darkened and she stroked her fingers through her gray hair as her eyes stared into space. Well, according to some people, after God created sheep, the devil, in an effort to desecrate God's sheep, created different kinds of goats. Angry after the devil disgraced his sheep, created a wolf to eat the goats. In a massive tantrum of rage, the devil bit the tails of the goats, marking them as an unholy animal. Then, with a quizzical and hard to decipher face, she said, I thought you would have seen it by now, haven't you? I knew what she was talking about right away, and it seemed I would burst into a fit of scared shrieking and crying at the thought of my grandmother confirming the thing outside my window was actually real. I tried to rationalize the situation, thinking the goat-like creature was just a dream and that what my grandma said was unrelated but at the sight of my distress my grandmother destroyed that idea with the opening of her mouth it won't hurt you if you stay inside at night so there's nothing to worry about it was supposed to be a comforting statement but her actually confirming this made it worse Grandma pretended to forget the conversation, never speaking of it for the rest of the trip. When the night came, I decided to sleep in my parents' bedroom, where the bed faced away from the window, but I swear I heard a glassy tapping from behind me. Lucky for us, my parents and I left the farm the next day, leaving behind the forest and fields of Maryland. But three years after this initial incident, after blocking the creature from my memory, I saw it a second time at 11 o'clock at night. I was half asleep on grandma's couch to the sound of the TV when a reporter shouting, breaking news. My eyes initially darting around the room and my brain adjusting to consciousness. I was in shock as I saw the creature hunched over in front of the living room window. The half goat sprang from the window and ran into the distance on its two legs. I slapped myself. Snap out of it. Snap out of it. But nothing could stop the memories of the creature. And what grandma had said about it. I paced around the room with adrenaline flooding my body. Wanting to flee. But not knowing where to go. With a few sleeping pills however. I willed myself to sleep. With the living room curtains drawn. The morning after, I found a note on the kitchen table. My parents were shopping, and Grandma was at a doctor's appointment. I was alone in the house, and me wanting to find out what was going on, I plugged in my grandmother's outdated Macintosh for a bit of research. Half goat, half man, I typed, which brought up a Wikipedia page on different kinds of cryptids. Not exactly what I was looking for. Goat creature in Maryland. I corrected. And as soon as I hit search, Google presented me with another Wikipedia page. This one on a creature known as the Goatman of Maryland. This was exactly what I was looking for. The Goatman of Maryland is a legendary half goat, half human creature that has the head and the hind of a goat and the body of a human. The rest of the page went on to explain how the locals suspect the goat man is either a failed gene mixing science experiment or a demonic spawn of the devil, as grandma had said. For the rest of the week, I saw it every single night. Whenever I was trying to fall asleep in my room, it would be staggering around the clearing outside my window. If I was watching TV late at night, the goat man would be gazing at the screen from the living room window. And on the last day, when I was feeding grandma's peacocks in the evening, she came to bring me inside after she saw it approaching the farm. 
by the end of the second visit, seeing the goat man was something normal. And with the occasional reminder from grandma, I respected it and its personal space. Three years later, however, my third visit to grandma's ranch showed me what happened when you didn't honor the goat man's boundaries. On the local news, there was one headline stirring up the rustic community. Ten professional boar hunters killed in animal attack. My parents thought it was horrible, but Grandma and I shot each other looks of shared knowledge. The next morning, the paper arrived at the farm, where the hunting tragedy made the front page. The night before, police found ten hunters mutilated to death by a wild animal. The Hunter's AR-15 magazines were completely full upon dying, and local authorities are stumped as to how none of them could have gotten a single shot off. My parents, who had no knowledge of the goat man, had no idea what caused the attack, and were as ignorant as the rest of the investigators. So I had to ask Grandma why my parents hadn't seen it yet. Well, she said, the creature only appears to those he finds interesting. You have to understand it can change its views on people. I have these scars from when I was a little girl. But after it got used to me, it stopped. My parents, who were your great-grandparents, were demoted to the low end of the thing's opinions. Their passing and my survival go to show how unpredictable it can be. I was shaking, even more freaked out by that. The thing had attacked grandma when she was young, and it seemed like the goat man could change its opinion of me in the blink of an eye. It almost seemed like I had developed something with the creature during my last visit by seeing it all the time and watching TV with it. And not once did I ever go outside at night when I was in charge of the farm. I respected it. Could it really forget all that? Or was I reading into grandma's statements more than I should have? In the visits following that year, I read some news articles about mutilated hikers, missing campers, and farm animals turning up dead. The goat man was getting more aggressive. One time, the creature looked right into my soul with its black empty eyes and for the first time since my initial viewing of it my body gave to the most feared dread I had ever felt. The more violent the news stories became the more I felt that the goat was getting more aggressive. Grandma even ended up buying more curtains for the house, acquire a better lock for the door and actually went to a shooting range to learn how to use a shotgun. It came to the point where I was trying to make peace with the creature by leaving pig food in the field for it to eat. But instead, it snatched one of the hogs from the pig pen and ran into the woods. On the last day of the visit, I woke up to the sound of ear splitting banging on the front door. Grandma was gripping her new shotgun and with my dad holding a baseball bat, they waited for the intruder to burst through the door. Yet the banging subsided after a few minutes, the chirping and croaking of insects and frogs replacing it within the hour. After that incident, we didn't visit the ranch for five years, and I was nearing the end of my high school by then. My parents actually encouraged Grandma to move out of the house. In light of people in her town being discovered murder in their own homes, but being the stubborn grandma she was, she decided to go against it. Besides, she thought she knew how fortified her farm was. A few weeks ago, we returned to that awful farm, finding barbed wire on the outskirts of the field. There were fewer animals now, and I swear some of the surviving pigs had faded scars on their bodies from scratches stabs and bites not even the most vicious bear could manage. I was more jittery than I ever been in my life and it was all because I knew that goat man was scheming someone in the deep woods sensing that I had arrived on its land.
I spoke with Grandma, who showed me a newspaper talking about how the FBI was getting involved in the murder investigations here, and that the criminal would be behind bar soon. However, as Grandma told me, other farmers around town were speaking about how the FBI's true motive was to cover up the real culprit. When we were having dinner, I poked at my food, ignoring the discourse my family was having. Afterwards, I went to my room and made sure the door was shut before I hopped into bed and waited. After hours of anticipating, in the field, beyond my window, the monster dragged the bloody body of a peaceful doe into view. The goat man ripped the deer's intestines out and bit into the insides with its evil loving fangs spilling blood onto the moonlit ground. It turned its head to face my direction, hurling a piece of deer at the window. I jerked as blood splatter against the pane like a sheet of rain, startling me to full awareness. Me rushing from my bed to get a closer look at the field, I saw the goat man had left behind the body of a deer. It was mocking me, and I was sure of it. I settled back into bed with the blood sliding down the window, wrapping myself in my blanket as if it was armor, and getting ready for whatever might happen next. I have no idea how, but I drifted asleep with a piece of the creature's latest meal stuck to my window. That was when I had the worst nightmare any human mind could produce. It was a once in a lifetime dream of horror, where the creature had crept into my room and was slicing chunks of muscle from my limbs and carving blocks of flesh out, out of my torso with its claws, choking me with its horns. The pain was real, and I smelled the rotten stench of the creature's dirt matted fur. It was as if my mind was nagging at me, and screaming at the top of its lungs for me to wake up. So I did. Soaked in sweat, I sent my eyes flying open gasping like I was on the edge of dying. As I scrambled to see any sign of the goat man's presence outside, I panicked upon seeing several inconsistencies with how the room was when I went to sleep. Now, the door was wide open, and something had smeared deer blood on the inside of the window, and that's when the tapping reached my ears. Not from the window, but from my bed frame. Two furry hands slumped over the frame, claws dripping blood onto the sheets. I froze, the form getting to its feet and tilting its head as it examined me. Too weak to fight and too shocked to run. I waited to die. But to my surprise, instead of slashing my belly, the goat man spoke. You be not ripe, it said before crouching on all fours and scurrying and walking out of the house. When the police arrived, they found the lifeless body of Grandma, who had died of a heart attack. After that, the FBI showed up, erasing all evidence of forced entry and the strange deer blood being inside the house. With me sobbing and my parents crying, Dad decided to get us a hotel, and I actually rejoiced at the fact that our room was on the third floor. I shed a few tears and had a good rest. The thought of what the creature had said, sipping through my mind. That was two weeks ago, and until now, I believe I would never have to see that farm for the rest of my life. But as it turns out, my grandmother had left the farm to me. Not only that, she clearly stated in her will that I should also inherit her shotgun. I don't want to go back there, but because she died, I feel a weight of guilt dragging me down. My heart desires for me to follow her last wishes, and they involve going back to Maryland with her gun. But first, I'm going to try to get a priest to bless the farm or an old American native elder 
to perform a smudging ritual. Even though I'm skeptical about those ideas working, I don't know when I'll have an update. I just know it has to be soon or else. I have talked about my road trip on here before. I took the first vacation of my life last year. A rebuilt Yamaha and a foolish sense of optimism carry me across the western United States. Being adventurous seriously made me rethink everything I thought I knew about the world. I love Seattle with the hip original hippie neighborhoods and the carnival atmosphere of Pike Place Market. Getting out of Seattle was a total nightmare. Restricted to back roads by a motor that capped at 40 miles an hour, I must have gotten lost a dozen times. Despite all the help I received from baffled gas station attendants, so I was behind schedule when it came to finding my campsite. Some miles south and a little east of the city, there's a free campground. It's most often used by horse riders. And boy, can you smell it. That's actually what guided me in the last few miles. There's a gravel road off the service road, and then a few crooked unpaved roads off of that. The trail markers were all bent, broken, or faded. In the end, I had to follow my nose. I set up my junior scout tent in the fading twilight. Mine was the only one there. I had the place all to myself. After a quick meal of apples from a previous campground, I did my travel log on my video camera before turning in for the night. I'm not sure how long I slept. I know I checked the time, but I can't recall what it was. Something had disturbed my well-earned beauty rest, but I was too groggy to remember what it was. That's when I sat up too alert to fall back asleep, but too sleepy to be totally awake. That's when something brushed the side of my tent, and suddenly, I was more awake now than I had ever been. I had done plenty of camping by that point. I was familiar with the sounds of the nighttime critters, from raccoons to coyotes. Nothing had ever bothered me in my tent before, just snuffle around camp before wandering off and leaving me be. From the sound of the footsteps, it was walking on two legs. My mind immediately jumped to the worst possible conclusion, a bear. There's a lot of conflicting information out there about how to deal with bears and a lot of it depends on the type of bear. Sitting there in the dark with my heart beating in my throat, I had no way of telling what kind I was dealing with. Should I shout out or play dead? I was about 30 yards from a sturdy cement block outhouse that might be better shelter. As quietly as I dared, I slipped my boots on and got ready to dash. The zipper of the tent seemed impossibly loud in the night as I worked it slowly and slowly. After getting it to be fully open, I slowly went outside. Once outside, I craned my neck around to see if the bear, if that's what it was, was between me and the outhouse. With the incredible illumination of the Milky Way, I could see the campground clearly all the way to the tree line. There was nothing out there. However, I had this feeling that something was watching me. It was like feeling an insect crawl along the back of my neck. There was no logical way for me to know that something had its eyes on me out there in the dark, in the middle of nowhere, all alone. I couldn't dismiss it. Still on high alert. I crept along and tried not to crunch the gravel under my feet too loud. The outhouse was still my best bet. The door was propped open by a stone, but inside there was a heavy duty boat lock. I would have to spend the night surrounded by the smell of not only horse, but also human poop. But I figured that was a fair trade for not getting killed or eaten. My hand was on the latch. When I heard the awful crunch of footsteps and gravel behind me, I kicked the stone propping the door open out of the way and slammed the heavy metal door shut, no longer caring how much noise I made. Whatever was on the other side had fingers. Something tugged on the door as I struggled to bolt it shut. I won, but it was close. There was a metal mesh along the top of the outhouse for ventilation. Through the top, I could hear the heavy breathing that matched my own. 
My phone was back in my tent because I'm an idiot. There was no way to tell time. That's when the same stupid impulse that brought me out there in the first place kicked in. I had to. No. Hello? Silence. Maybe this person didn't hear me. But then. Hello? I could have shit myself. I was in the right place for it. The voice sounded like my own. And the sound of it was a kick to the gut. I couldn't even tell you why it made me so uneasy. The sensation was like when you're walking upstairs and you're expecting another step, but your foot comes down on an empty space. Uh, I'm sorry. I thought I was alone, I said. I am alone. Every syllable was off. Hey, I'm sorry. I freaked out. I didn't think there was anyone else out here. Sorry, I'm here. You would think that if I knew it was another camper. I would have opened the door, but I never did. Some deeply buried instinct kept me from taking my hand off the boat. Hey, you scared the crap out of me. Are there more tent sites out in the trees or something? I am something. There are more. The words made me sick to my stomach. Again, I couldn't have even told you why, only that they did. And from its odd speech, I guess English wasn't his first language. Uh, do you need to go? Use the bathroom, I mean, because I'm going to be in here for a while. That wasn't a lie. I wouldn't even open the door if it was my own mother on the other side. You need to go. Its English was improving with every sentence. There was something weird about that. Hey, look, I'm sorry if I scared you. But you started it by creeping around in the dark. I'm not going to come out. Can you go somewhere else? I'll be gone in the morning. I promise. I just wanted to sleep in peace. You need to be gone. I promise you. I creep in the dark. You won't be here in the morning. Fear closed my mouth shut. The more I spoke, the more he did. And I didn't want to hear his voice anymore. I'm sure that made me sound like a bigot or something, but I had the feeling I was feeding words to him, and the feeling was not pleasant. It felt like he was hungry for them. The same instinct that told me to keep quiet the first time kept me from running my dumb mouth off again. I was dealing with someone who was not mentally well, or was something else. The way he was speaking, and the way his words were coming out, and the tone and voice, there was no doubt that he was going to carry out what he was saying. I kept my hands on the boat, while they cramped on the first rays of sun, crept through the mesh at the top of the walls of my shelter. It wasn't until the sun was strong enough to make me sweat in my self-imposed prison that I felt brave, stupid, enough to speak again. Hey, are you still out there? Hello? Anyone? There was no answer, which was the best outcome I could hope for. I opened the door. My tent was untouched, at least from a distance. The oppressive feeling of being watched had dissipated. I dressed and broke down camp in record time. My moped cranked to life, but it wasn't until I went to put my helmet on that I saw the footprint. I had kicked that rock pretty far. It was close to my bike. Naturally, I went over to it. I had a no, and a clear outline of fresh mud. There was a single print on the smooth gray of the stone, not human, but a hoof like that of a horse or goat. It was so fresh, so vivid. It hadn't been there last night when I used the bathroom before I gone to bed and the soft mud in front of the outhouse door were more of the same, some of them on top of my own boot prints. If you want to go looking for whatever the hell it was, be my guest. Just be careful with your words out there, because I figured out what was wrong with that voice when I watched the playback of my travel log video. It was my own. Jasmine, Ariel, David, and I were all lovers of scary stuff, and we were craving a new and thrilling adventure. We had gone on ghost tours. We had visited cemeteries late at night. 
but we had never really experienced anything truly paranormal or scary. So this time we decided to rent a cabin in the deep woods in the Appalachian Mountains for a week to actually try to experience something creepy, you can say. Something about putting yourself in a situation like that that really seems to get your adrenaline going. You know that feeling. That same feeling that makes you want to drive through an isolated back road at night, hoping you don't get a flat tire, but at the same time hoping something does happen so you can get that experience from a scary movie. Or is this just me? Anyways, we couldn't leave my husky dog Lucy behind, so she joined us as well. The cabin that we had rented was completely isolated from everybody. Here, there was no connection to anybody, the absence of the internet, and the reach of Wi-Fi only inside the house made us enjoy everything much more. The cabin itself was really nice and towered with the trees that seemed to stretch into the sky with its wooden exterior and with a stone chimney rising on one side. Inside, the warm glow of the cabin lights covered us, casting a small glow into the wooden floors. Old pictures and artwork were all around the walls. The cabin featured expansive floor-to-ceiling windows and glass sliding doors that opened into the balcony into the backyard. These impressive glass panels were designed to connect between the cabin's interior and the natural beauty of the surrounding forest. During the day, they flooded the living space with natural light, and at night, they transformed the cabin into a cozy place where one could still appreciate the serene beauty of the outdoors while staying safe and comfortable inside. This way, even if you were inside the cabin, it still almost felt like you were outside. Anyways, the first day after a long day of hiking and exploring the trails, we returned to the cabin and I decided to settle down with a bath before enjoying some peaceful time on the balcony. As the sun began to set, I stepped out into the big two-story balcony with my dog Lucy and iced coffee and my phone to put on some scary stories to enjoy the view and last with some weed because let's face it a vacation isn't complete with a little relaxation right the balcony extended from the cabin's rear making us feel as though we were high above the ground offering a clear view of the big landscape there was a staircase on the side of the balcony that would lead down to the bottom which Lucy quickly descended to go play in the field. The huge balcony was almost like 30 by 30 feet, perfect for gatherings and hangouts at night. Speaking of the landscape, it was incredibly spacious and you could easily distinguish the property line where the land gave way to dense tall trees. From this point, I could take in the panoramic view from the field where Lucy was chasing squirrels and enjoying the spacious freedom. It's hard to describe, but it was a breathtaking view, a serene moment. However, my smoky getaway session was cut short. Just as I settled down with my iced coffee and was getting ready to roll some papers, Lucy began barking towards the woods. Her barks echoed through the trees, sending shivers down my spine. I quickly got up to investigate, but I couldn't see Lucy anywhere nor did the depths of the woods reveal anything. I called and practically yelled for Lucy to return, since at this point I could hear the echoes of her barks. But she continued barking before I eventually saw her come out the woods and run back towards the field, up the stairs, and get behind me almost like something had scared her. But this was weird. Lucy, who almost never showed fear of anything, had me baffled. I glanced back over the balcony, trying to see what might had scared her, but there was nothing there. I decided to head back inside with Lucy. I slid the door open, having her to hurry inside. As I entered, I saw Jasmine, Ariel, and David, who were all watching a scary movie in the living room. Jasmine quickly asked, back so soon? They were aware of my little ritual, if you could call it that. Whatever you like, but this was my way of relaxing and also managing my anxiety. Besides, there was something relaxing about combining a smoke session with some scary stories. Speaking of a ritual, they had put on a movie called The Ritual, which I had already seen. 
However, I asked if I could join them for a rewatch. I mean, it's not like they were going to say no. Anyways, my dog Lucy quickly went to go lay down on the floor where everyone was at. And I sat alongside everyone else. I quickly forgot about what had possibly scared Lucy. But I guess it was because there was something about being out in the darkness that seemed to play tricks on my mind. Maybe too many horror movies had left their mark. Regardless, as the night continued, we all eventually fell asleep in the living room. On the second day of our trip, we collectively agreed to try to embrace the solitude and stay in. It was a day dedicated to showing our cooking and grilling skills. As everyone took turns in the kitchen, the smell of sizzling barbecue filled the air as the laughing and friendly competition started. We dug out our collection of board games, cards, and puzzles. The purpose was clear. We aimed to disconnect from social media as much as possible, cherishing the simple moments of each other's company and engaging in each other's conversations. To be honest, it turned out to be a challenge. I think the fucks of life and all this shit in today's world makes us forget about true connections and relationships. But this was most especially challenging for Jasmine, battling the temptation to post on her various social media accounts, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, which is now known as X. She fidgeted with her phone, her fingers itching to scroll through her social media feed. Sitting nearby, I chuckled and said, Jazz, you've been looking at that phone for hours. You're not missing much out there in the digital world. Jasmine sighed torn between her phone and the challenge to stay disconnected. I know, but it's just so difficult. I want to share our cabin adventures with all my followers, she said. I smirked. I came ready for this. And feel free to steal my idea if you ever take a trip and need to disconnect. So I offer her a solution. How about we capture these moments the old-fashioned way? With a Polaroid camera, we can create physical memories to look back on. That will be the fun part too that we actually won't know how the pictures are gonna look. The eyes of Jasmine opened up. You know what? That sounds kind of fun. Let's do it. And with that, she set her phone aside, embracing the charm of capturing memories in an old traditional way. Once we had wrapped up our day of cooking, games, and quality time, I decided to freshen up with a shower, getting ready for my nightly ritual on the balcony. However, convincing Lucy to join me outdoors with a little encouragement she finally gave in and together we ventured into the balcony the view remained as breathtaking as ever casting a soothing view almost a welcoming aroma over me despite the serene setting a lingering unease still tugged at my senses from the previous day but I brushed it off and I settled down placing my container of God's green leafy substance on one side and my iced coffee on the other. With my phone in hand, I went through my collection of downloaded YouTube videos, all of them about scary stories. As I lost myself in the stories, my imagination painted the eerie scenes in my head. Lucy, once again, was playing around in the yard. I could hear her running back and forth, her energetic running drawing my attention. But then I heard as she ran towards the side of the cabin, possibly going to the front. As I immersed myself in the stories on my phone and started to enjoy my nightly ritual, a doubt began at the back of my mind. It was a sensation that I couldn't shape. One that triggered thoughts of a book I had read once. The Gift of Fear. The book talked about countless stories of people who had experienced this creepy feeling, acting in ways they normally wouldn't. According to the author, it's a survival instinct buried deep within our brains, capable of sensing even the smallest hints of danger, often without our rational minds being aware. It's a testament to show how our brain is so smart. So in that moment, I decided to pause my phone, allowing the abrupt silence to engulf the surroundings. The world outside seemed to be quiet. There was no sound from the woods, no nightly critters, nothing just pure silence. I know you might be thinking that I'm possibly just high, but no, the sensation was different. It wasn't the blissful cloud nine feeling anymore. Something fell off. 
and it was one of those situations where a minor, small detail could be more scarier than outright horror. I swiftly grabbed my iced coffee, and almost forgetting my precious weed, rushed back inside, leaving behind the quietness of the night. As I opened the door, my friends turned their attention towards me, curiosity on their faces. I must have worn a startled expression because Jasmine was the first to ask. Hey, are you okay? You look like you've seen a ghost. I hesitated for a moment, then replied. You know that feeling when something just doesn't sit right? Like something's off? Even though you can't put your finger on it? I asked, but they just looked at me. Weird. Anyways, that was enough for me and I decided to call it a night. Later that night, I woke up having to use the restroom. As I stumbled towards the living room to get to the bathroom, strange noises on the other side of the glass windows and door caught my attention. My heart raced as I saw a dark silhouette standing upright on two legs. I felt my heart drop. I had seen too many fucking scary movies to even think of the possibilities of what was out there. I froze and the dark figure started moving desperately as if trying to come inside. For a second I thought I was dreaming, and so I closed my eyes hoping I would wake up. But when I opened them, the thing was still there. Fuck this, I said. I ran and reached for the light switch to light up the outside. And that's when I saw... Lucy. Holy shit, I couldn't believe I had forgotten out about her. I quickly opened the door to let Lucy back inside. Grateful that it was just her this whole time. On the third day, I was ready to leave to be honest. I don't know what it was, but I just felt like we weren't supposed to be here. And this was proven on this third night. My friend Jasmine decided to join me on the balcony. I didn't bring Lucy outside as she forcefully didn't even want to. So Jas decided to join me. We sat in silence, admiring the beauty of the field that was lit up by the moon before us. It was a good moment, enjoying our iced coffee. And once Jasmine finished hers, she decided to go back inside. As I started pulling out the weed, she looked back and said, Well, how long are you going to be out here for? It's getting pretty late. I thought about it. Something about smoking weed helped me calm down and forget the way I was feeling. So I shrugged my shoulders and said, It all depends. I laughed and she said, Well, don't stay. She stopped in her words and looked towards the field down. I looked at her and said, I won't be out here too long. What is that? She whispered, her voice trembling. What is what? I said. She didn't say anything, so I decided to stand up and see what she was looking at. I followed her gaze and that's when I saw it. A bizarre figure standing in the field. It was a naked woman. Her pale body stark against the dark landscape. We couldn't make out her features, but the sight sent a shiver down my spine. Her pale, naked body was moving in a slow, eerie, and disturbing manner towards us, and she was taking steps slowly. The moon was lighting up parts of her face, and I could see her jaw was hanging low, giving her a grotesque and unnatural appearance. Then. Almost as if she noticed that we had seen her, she let out a wheezing sound. Almost like a whisper escaping her throat. That's when she started to run towards us. Her head was tilted sideways, giving her an even more unsettling look. Her movements were stiff, as if her body was not fully under her control. It was a horrifying sight. As we stared in shock at this woman running towards us, frozen in fear, her appearance became more scary as her pale naked body contorted in ways that defied all logic. Suddenly, she lost her balance and fell to the ground. I'm not sure who or what we were staring at at this point. It was as if we had become paralyzed by fear as we could only continue to watch her. Then, her movements started to grow more erratic. She began crawling on all fours, her hands and knees scraping against the ground. It was a fucking disturbing sight. Then she suddenly got back up, her hair hanging in tangled locks around her face. As she entered the light of the balcony underneath us, we saw that she had no eyes. 
Instead, where her eyes should have been, there were just empty black sockets. It was a horrifying sight as she continued to approach us with her head tilted sideways and her slack jaw, but what truly horrified us and snapped us back to retreat inside the cabin was when she fucking started to ascend the stairs that led up to the balcony with distorted movements. What made the sight even more scary was that it appeared as if she was looking up at us despite her lack of eyes. Her head was still sideways and her slack jaw remained open. We rushed back inside and found the others in the living room. Jasmine and I screamed at them, telling them that someone was outside looking like something out of the exorcist. They stared at us in disbelief. Jasmine then said, we're not fucking around, we both saw it. David and Ariel decided to investigate. And David said, if you're pulling a prank, both of y'all sleeping outside tonight. We all looked towards the outside balcony, but there was no sign of anyone. David slid the door open, scanned the area, and said, There's nobody out here. Reluctantly, we all stepped outside, and I said, I'm not fucking kidding. There was someone or something out here. Jasmine chimed in. Yeah, we both saw her. David then remarked, Well, I guess she's gone now. Must be some psycho living out here in the woods, huh? Even though they didn't believe us, that's when we all heard it. That same wheezing sound. David immediately said, what the fuck is that? We realized the noise was coming from right beside us. And we looked towards the staircase which was at the end of the balcony on the side. And that's when I saw a dark silhouette crouched in the corner. There she fucking is, Jasmine said. Fuck this, I'm out of here. I said as Jasmine quickly opened the door. That's when I saw that this woman started crawling on all fours with an unnatural jerky motion. Her limbs seemed to be dislocated and her body contorted as she moved towards us. David, with panic in his voice, screamed at us to hurry the fuck up as he was the one behind all of us and we rushed to get inside the cabin. The wheezing sound from the woman grew louder and even more scary as she closed the distance between us. <laughs> David being the last one slid the door shut and locked the door looked towards the glass but she was no longer there that's when Lucy started barking towards the windows too alright what the fuck was that David said and Jasmine and Ariel started crying saying that they no longer wanted to be here I mean I agree with them we decided to call search and rescue as we figured that was the only solution here they advised us to stay put and not move and to make sure that everything is locked including all windows and doors However, they did tell us it would take about a couple of hours for someone to get there. Those hours took basically all night, because we all ended up together in the living room, huddled together, with kitchen knives in hand, in case we needed to do what we had to do to survive. But the worst part was that wheezing sound, that awful dreadful sound that she had been making, continued to echo throughout the cabin with noises that also sounded like her running around the exterior of the cabin. And at one point, it even sounded like she was running on the roof of the cabin. Eventually, the noises stopped when the sun began to rise, and we could see the light coming through the big glass windows that led to the balcony. Then, we heard knocking at the front door. I went to go inspect and it was a park ranger. We tried explaining everything but of course, he didn't believe us. He did look around the cabin in every corner and even went down to the backyard to look, but he didn't see any signs of anything. I know the report that he probably wrote up that a bunch of assholes decided to get drunk and one of them pulled a prank, but I kid you not, this actually happened. And lesson learned, I will never go to a remote cabin ever again. I figure I would share this with you all since it seems like everyone here enjoys knowing some paranormal experiences. But I'm not sure what this was. Maybe it was some psycho fuck just wanting to scare people. But who would actually in their right minds be enjoying doing this in the middle of nowhere? On top of that, the way she was moving is impossible for any normal human to move. Anyways, 
I don't know. But sometimes when I lay down at night in bed, I swear I can hear noises coming from the roof with that same wheezing sound. The following story will be told from a female perspective. My husband and I always wanted our son to be adventurous. We wanted to watch him grow up asking questions about everything, seeking out answers, and looking for adventure. It seems like whenever parents have a deep desire for how they want their children to be, somehow their children end up knowing and go the complete opposite direction. As Sam grew up, he became very introverted and would actively ask when it was time for bed. He loved to sleep and our doctor gave a lot of explanations. All the illnesses had been checked and crossed out before he said, I think he just likes to escape. He likes his dreams more than he enjoys life. This was at the age of eight. This actually depressed us as parents. What could be so wrong? So uninteresting about his life that he would come home and just sleep. The doctor recommended that we plan family activities that were geared towards him as a way to engage him in life, give him something to be excited about after school. So for our very first trip, we decided we would go on a hike. The mountains were about an hour away and we considered this a mild introduction to our new family habit. When we told Sam where we were going, he was excited. We knew then that hiking had been the right activity. On Saturday, we threw together some backpacks, lunch, water, and even a magnifying glass so Sam could inspect everything closely. He was so excited the entire way there. We were all thrilled. When we parked at the trailhead, Sam leaped out of the car and almost ran up the trail without us. I had to call him back so we could keep an eye on him. The hike was short, maybe half a mile, but Sam was trying to run it like a marathon. We kept calling for him to come back and check out this bird or this butterfly or a log that looked like grandpa's face. He would come and look to humor us but then would run ahead again. Eventually we gave up trying to point things out and let him just run through the woods. We were pleased that he had taken so well to the trip. For once Charlie and I felt like we knew what we were doing as parents and for anyone who's a parent knows exactly how that feels. We got to the end of the trail and ate our lunch. We were at a ledge along the mountain that was more like a hill. The sun was high overhead and we could see over the trees for miles. Sam quickly drowned his lunch and we let him run off into the trees. Don't go too far, I warned him. From the rock where we sat, I was looking at Sam while Charlie went to the bathroom. I saw Sam pick up some sticks, swing them at bushes and tree trunks until the stick broke, then picked up another one. He picked one up that was too short to be swung, but he smiled at it and ran around with it in front of him, using both hands. Finally, he ran over to me and said, Ma, feel this stick. It feels so cool. Does it now? I grinned, taking the stick from him. It was in the shape of a Y. And when I grabbed one of the sides of the Y, it was perfectly smooth. It looked like someone had taken a knife and from a bigger branch, shaped it into a slingshot stick. The two sides of the Y were curved, almost like handlebars from a bicycle. Wow, that's really cool, I said to encourage him. He looked at me funny, then ran back into the woods to keep playing. We packed up lunch stuffed everything back in the backpacks and announced that we were ready to hike back. Sam came back without complaining and we began walking down the trail. Instead of running ahead, Sam started to lag behind, still clutching the white stick. He held it in front of him with both hands as before and was swinging it around slowly, almost like if it was a magnifying glass and he were searching for something. Come on Sam, Charlie started saying when he stood in one place for too long. We both had to stop because he had fallen so far behind. He was pointing his stick into the trees, with his arms stretching out. He kept looking from the stick to the trees, as if he was trying to line something up. We both waited patiently for a few seconds, 
but the heat was getting to us and we were ready for an air-conditioned car. Sam, let's go, I called. Okay, okay, he called back, but he didn't move. Charlie walked back to him. He put his hands on both of Sam's shoulders and guided him down the trail. The whole time, Sam kept both hands firmly on the stick and tried his best to point it back towards the trees where he had been looking. He didn't point it towards where he had been standing. I noticed later, but at a spot past the trail and into the trees, always at one position. Charlie finally got him to where I was at and we kept walking. Sam eventually stopped pointing his stick and instead kept it down in front of him, both hands still being used to hold either side of the Y. We ended up driving home, pretty excited that Sam was taking home a souvenir. Our day trip had worked. He was getting involved with life, so I knew we were one step closer to our adventurous son. Over the next couple of days, lots of things started happening. They all seemed strange, not connected in the moment, but later memory would connect them for me. Sam went back to his sleeping routine. He would come home from school, go into his room, and play for a bit by himself while dinner was being made. I got him to work on homework, then serve dinner when Charlie got home. After that, he went straight to bed by his own choice. This wasn't abnormal for him, so I wasn't any more concerned than usual. A few nights after we got home, I noticed that Sam's bedroom light was on. Even though he had gone to bed hours ago, his door was closed. So I went to go and turn off his light for him. I figured he might have left it on when he fell asleep or something. But the second I opened the door, Sam leaped off the floor and jumped into bed. Like he knew he was in trouble. It was only 7 in the evening. I wasn't about to yell at him for not going to bed when he said he was. But his rapid jump into the bed had me worried. Sam, what's up? Nothing, he said in that kiddish tone that says that I didn't do anything. I looked around the room and saw what I always saw. His toys were out and lined up in some game he must have been playing. Nothing was out of place. You jumped up as soon as I came in. Is there anything wrong? No, he said. Well, okay, I said slowly, unsure of what else to say. However, he looked at me with untold terror in his eyes. Um, are you sure there's nothing wrong? I pressed. I can hang out with you for a bit if you want. He stared right through me, his eyes wide, and it took him a few seconds to reply. Um, no mother, I'm going to bed now. Can you, um, turn out the light? I blinked. He's never called me mother in his life. I should have pushed myself and sat on his bed and talked until he admitted what was wrong. But I didn't. Charlie called my name and it distracted me. I told him goodnight and turned off the light and shut the door. Talking later on with Charlie about it, Charlie thought that maybe he had somehow discovered masturbation. Even at his young age, when you rub around on the floor the right way, it just happens. Apparently, that was how he had discovered it. So I chalked the situation up to that. Sam also continued carrying that white stick around everywhere. He always kept it within reach. During dinner, he kept it on the table. When I told him that sticks don't belong on the dining room table, he kept it on his chair next to him. He took it to bed and kept it next to his head. He even took it to school. I tried finding him on it once, but he claimed that he was taking it to show and tell. I was about to insist that he leave it home, but he looked like he might cry if I came down firm. So I let him on the condition that if his teacher mentioned it to me, that I would make him leave it home, and he agreed. One day, Charlie was taking out the garbage and the bag got caught on the door jam. The contents of the bag spilled all over the floor, and he quietly cursed and went to get another bag. That was when he found about 20 of Sam's toys in the trash. They varied from stuffed animals to action figures. Confused, Charlie asked me if I had thrown them away, or if I was punishing Sam for something. I told him no, and was equally puzzled. Sam, for some unknown reason, had been throwing his own toys away. Together, after dinner, 
We sat down with Sam at the table to ask about the toys. We saw it as a cry for help. They were selected, he said in response. They weren't doing a good enough job, so they were fired. Their time was up. Charlie then told Sam that we don't throw toys away because they cost money and we don't waste things. Sam nodded, but I saw his hands clutch the sides of the white stick tightly under the table. I knew he was in stress. Something was going on. We ended the conversation on a light note, and Sam understood why we were upset. He promised not to throw away any more toys, then ran off to bed. I just remember thinking how strange the sentence was. Their time was up. That was an adult line, not something you hear from kids. Sam's school sent an email to all parents about two weeks after our hiking trip. The principal pleaded with parents to not let their children come to school if their child was sick. As there was a very serious flu going around the school, he even admitted that five teachers and 30 students had been sick over the last week alone. I showed it to Charlie, but he didn't find it as weird as I did. Just tell Sam to wash his hands more often, he said. The final straw for me came a few nights later. It was a Wednesday night when I woke up for no reason. Charlie was snoring next to me, but in between snores, I heard a whisper. Fear seized my throat, and I lifted my head off the pillow slowly to peer at the bedroom door. Someone was moving in the dark, stumbling along, someone small and short. Irritated, I got up and walked to the door. I saw Sam skip away as if he were crossing a field of spiders and was desperate not to get any on his shoes. Sam, I whispered, walking out after him. I turned the corner into the family room, but he wasn't there. That's when I heard bare feet race across the kitchen floor, and that made me angry. The little shit was hiding from me. I walked through the family room and noticed that the clock on the wall was way louder than normal, or maybe I was hypersensitive because I was exhausted. When I entered the kitchen, Sam was facing me. He stood next to the fridge, and the small light from it was showing his expression. He was terrified, and his little white stick was pointed right at me. Sam, I said annoyed. I need water, he said, still looking at me with his eyes wide open. It was an obvious lie, but not one abnormal for kids caught up past their bedtime. All right then, get some water, I said. Can, um, you get it? He asked me, still clutching the stick and pointing it my way. He must have seen my quote-unquote mom look because he re-emphasized, please. I walked ahead and that's when I noticed that he pointed the stick around me. He was pointing at something behind me. I looked around really fast and stared into the empty darkness of the family room. The clock was still loud. It sounded like a person saying the actual words. I looked around the room for a full 30 seconds, and nothing moved. What are you doing up, Sam? I asked, turning back to face him. He looked at me with real, true fear in his eyes. The stick was shaking in his hand. Sam, I said, snapping a bit. It's not time yet, he said, barely glancing at me. His gaze was transfixed beyond me. Um, I'm not ready yet. For half a second, I wonder if he was pretending to sleepwalk. Then I wonder if he was actually sleepwalking. Then my tiredness washed over me, and I got annoyed. It's time for bed, I insisted, walking towards him. But still, he kept his eyes behind me, and the stick was pointing into the family room. Okay, he said, defeated as I approached. He took slow, unwilling steps towards the family room. I stood behind him watching to make sure he went to bed. I saw his head look back and forth, scanning the room as he entered. He was looking for something. Then, he looked back at me, and suddenly, he screamed. With sudden movement, I turned around, hands up, and ready to attack whatever was there. But, nothing but darkness, and the far kitchen wall. I glared down at him. He was still shaking pointing his stick into the empty kitchen. 
but I was beyond annoyed now. The stick had been out of control for weeks. I think you need a break from this, I said, snatching the stick from his hand. No, he said. Sam practically leaped at me, but I jumped out the way. This was the only way I assured myself. This stick wasn't healthy after all. Don't, he cried and yelled, followed me through the family room and into the hall. All the attention that he had pointed into the kitchen was now directed at me. He tried to jump and grab at the stick, but I held it above my head. I felt like an older sibling teasing my younger brother, but this was needed. I regretted waking Charlie up, but I pushed my way into my room, tossed the stick onto the floor, and turned back to get Sam out. Give it to me, give it to me, give it to me, he demanded. I pushed him out and shut the bedroom door. I flipped the lock on the handle. What? What's going on? Charlie mumbled. I took the stick away. He was playing with it all night. I said coming back to bed. Sam was pounding on the door. I convinced Charlie that we should ignore him, let him tire himself out, and tomorrow we will lecture him. He verbally agreed, even though I could sense that he didn't agree inside. It took an hour, but Sam eventually gave up, and we ended up falling asleep. The next morning, my throat felt like I had swallowed sandpaper. The flu, of course. My stomach rumbled and made me get out of bed. I found myself starting to run to the master bathroom after my stomach turned nauseous. I threw up the dinner from the night before. Stumbling out of the bathroom, I had to move aside for Charlie, who couldn't make it to the toilet and threw up into the sink. Not you as well, I sighed. I haven't been this sick since I was a kid, he moaned, rinsing his mouth out. I rubbed my eyes, still tired from Sam's ordeal last night and got into the shower with the lights off, hoping it would help my light sensitivity. Charlie decided to call in sick and rest for the day. I got ready for the day so I wouldn't be around in my pajamas all day, feeling even more sick. When I was completely ready, I unlocked the bedroom door and stepped out. Sam was nowhere in sight, which actually meant that he had gone back to bed. Good. I hope you're getting ready for school. I said loudly, but I didn't get a response. I went to his room and found the door shut as usual. I twisted the handle and pushed, but the door was stuck. What the hell? I said quietly. Using my shoulder, I shoved hard against the door. I heard a clatter, then the door opened. As I entered, I saw three things right away. One, a chair had been placed under the door handle in order to prevent the door from opening so easily. Two, the window was wide open with the screen missing. And three, Sam wasn't in his bedroom. We called the police immediately after searching the house from top to bottom. If we hadn't called them, I have no idea where we would have started. Maybe we should have driven around looking for him. Maybe called his friends' homes to see if they knew where he was. The police helped and I spent half a day sitting by the phone, puking my guts out and worrying about Sam. The police were out driving around, searching for Sam with his picture taped to their dashboards. Charlie was dead asleep when I went into the bedroom. I was debating about lying down, but I couldn't sleep while Sam was missing. I saw the stick, which had landed partially under the bed when I threw it last night. All this because of a stick. Maybe the doctor was wrong. Maybe he did have something wrong with him, but it was mental, psychological. Maybe instead of a doctor, we should take him to a psychologist. Attempting to stay awake, I decided to search the house for the 15th time, but this time, I carried the stick with me. Sam, loud enough to be heard while I walked through the family room, the kitchen, and to the stairs. Maybe he was hiding in the storage room downstairs maybe behind a few boxes. Sam, I said again. I have your stick. I'm sorry I took it. Please come out. You're not in trouble. I descended the stairs and halfway down, I thought. I heard him reply. It was faint, far away. The words were impossible to make out. Sam, I cried desperately. 
spinning around on the stairs to try to figure out if he was upstairs or downstairs. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a leg move around the corner at the bottom of the stairs towards the storage room. I was correct. I knew it. I sped down the stairs and turned the corner. The door was closed. I tried to twist the handle but he had locked it. I pleaded while reaching for the key at the top of the door frame. When he didn't unlock the door, I stuck the key in and twisted the handle. The door popped open to reveal our pitch black storage room. The room was in the middle of the house and had no windows. It contained our water heater and the control system for the heat and AC. The room was so large, Charlie had built shelves for us to keep our seasonal decorations, our camping supplies, and extra food and water. Sam, I said more quietly, feeling uneasy. Something about the room was getting to me. How does the clock tick, mother? Sam said from somewhere in the room. I froze. The word mother made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Something's not right. Sam, come on out now, I said. There was light spilling in from the doorway, but it didn't illuminate enough of the room for me to search. I slowly stepped towards the center of the room, where a string was hanging down from a single light in the ceiling. With one hand, I kept a hold of the stick. With the other, I reached out to search for the string. I couldn't see it but I knew it was there somewhere. Suddenly, the door slammed shut, and at that exact instant, my hand brushed against hair, long, greasy hair at my shoulder height. Sam wasn't that tall. The hair was tangled and long. I yelped and jumped back, startled by the door and the hair at the same time. Then I heard Sam giggle. Do you know how the clock ticks? It came from my left, along the wall. The hair had been to my right. What else was in here with us? I was paralyzed. I couldn't see a damn thing. My phone was upstairs so I couldn't use that as a flashlight. The ceiling light was somewhere in front of me and the door was somewhere behind me. But every time I would reach out, I remember touching the greasy hair and recoiled. Charlie! I called upward, hoping he could hear me, hoping he was awake. Tick, talk, tick talk sam said again my brain instantly remembered the sound the clock had made the night before it was the same voice faintly a voice and faintly background noise at the same time sam i whispered but i had to throw up again i swallowed the bio and felt one more time for the string it brushed my hand and i jumped back before realizing that i was feeling the string not greasy hair Relieved, I launched my hand out and grabbed at the string. It swung into my hand and I yanked on it hard. The single light buzzed to life and something moved to my right. I screamed at the top of my lungs when I saw white and black. It's taken me a long time to place the shape, but now I'm sure. The skull of a deer, partially covered by stringy hair, darted away from the light, circling behind me in absolute terror. I squeezed my eyes shut and didn't dare open them. In the battle for fight or flight, I buried my head hoping it didn't see me. I started sobbing and wanted to run for the door, but I was too scared to open my eyes. Mommy, Sam called from my left. I didn't respond. I was sobbing too hard. Mommy, help. I'm stuck. Very, very slowly. I moved one finger and looked to the side. Sam was huddled up on the top shelf. I couldn't see his face, but I saw jeans and his favorite shirt. Sam, come on down and let's go, I whispered. I... I can't. It's gonna get me. Sam was whimpering. I tried hard not to sob again. Please, come get me. I fought through the fear and stepped towards the shelf still covering my face and using a small gap in my fingers to navigate. When I reached the shelf, I closed my eyes and held my arms up. Climb into my arms, Sam. I'll get you down, and then we'll go get your dad. My voice started breaking at the end. Um, I'm stuck. My shirt is caught, he cried. All right, um, I said, trying to be brave for him. Guide my hand to where it's at 
and I'll get you loose. He paused. It's at the back of the shelf. You can't reach. I bit my lip to stop its trembling. With both eyes still closed, I placed my hands on the top shelf and my foot on the bottom shelf. The stick was placed on the shelf so I could use both my hands. I pulled myself up so I could reach and balance myself. Where, where is it? I asked, refusing to open my eyes. Reach here, he said, and I could feel him rotate so I could reach over him. I did, and that's when my hand ran straight into a mess of tangle, greasy, hair. My eyes opened in shock. It stared back at me for only half a second. But in that split second, it spoke. Do you know how the clock ticks? It's fed by death. The shelf under my feet collapsed, and as I fell, my hands pulled the shelf until it came over, coming down on top of me. I woke up in the hospital, much to Charlie and Sam's relief. It was a lot of information and questions. They asked why I was down there, and instead of sounding insane, I said that I had been searching for Sam again, just in case. Sam had been found walking on the road in the general direction of the hiking spot. He wasn't very far, thankfully, and was unharmed. When Charlie practically yelled, asking why the hell he had left in the middle of the night alone, Sam said he needed to find another stick to stop the monsters. The police were, of course, recommending that he talk to a psychologist. Then he overheard the conversation. Charlie didn't wake up until the police were at our door with Sam in hand. That was about an hour after the shelf had collapsed on me. Sam and Charlie had gone looking for me in the house and found me under the collapsed shelf. The police had been right there, thankfully, and I was rushed off to the hospital. Some of my ribs were broken and so was my left leg. The shelf that had collapsed on me held our camping tent, the fake Christmas tree, and a few other half-empty boxes. I was lucky it wasn't the shelf that was holding the food. The door was locked when they got to it, and the key wasn't in the lock, so they had to break it down. The second that Sam saw the scene, he apparently stood over me in a protective stance. Looking all around, Charlie left to get the police before they left upstairs. A couple of days after I got released from the hospital, and after Charlie had recovered from a flu that knocked him off his feet, I finally got a chance to talk to Sam. I asked him right away what was going on. It took a few minutes of him denying that anything was wrong. I saw the monster, I admit it, which a parent really shouldn't do to their child. You did? He asked. I nodded. You and Dad never saw them before. When did you see them? Them? I asked nervously. That's when Sam told me what had been happening for the last few weeks. He had stumbled upon the stick by tripping over it. He said that the stick had spoken to him, and he took it to play with it. He said that whenever he had the stick, he could see the monsters. They were scary, but they stayed away when I would point the stick at them. A few of them had followed us home, walking alongside us on the trail. They came into the house at night and snuck around. They came into Sam's room, our room, everywhere. They, they told, told me that, that someone, someone had, had to die. die. They told me that you had, had to, to die. die. So he offered the monsters toy sacrifices to satisfy their hunger. But he said that wasn't enough. Whenever I didn't have the stick, I could feel them try to grab me. But they stayed away whenever I had the stick. They kept telling me that your time was up. The time of who? I said. Yours, mom, Sam said. They sat with him at night. They tried to convince him to put the stick down. They would offer him candy. At school, they follow him and say they would hurt people until he put away the stick. Five teachers and 30 students ended up getting the flu. He held onto the stick as often as he could and patrolled the house at night to keep them out of my room. That was until I took the stick. Apparently, he had grabbed a stick from a skeleton in the woods. It looked like an animal skeleton. He had seen another one just like it when he got the first one. So he was going to go back and get the second one so that the monsters would 
stop smiling. One had actually followed him on the streets, he said. But now, they were all gone. And after looking through the mess of the collapsed shelves, so was the stick. Sam told his psychologist about our conversation. His psychologist told me very angry that I shouldn't have admitted to him anything like that because it would actually feed into his delusions. So now he was being looked at for any other possible conditions. I'm starting to think I should be tested too. How else do I explain everything that happened? One detail stands out that I can't explain though. I had unlocked the door to the storage room and left the key in the handle. So why was the key found dangling from the light bulb string? As legend goes, to become a skinwalker, you must attain priesthood and then kill a member of your own family. Then, and only then, can you gain the powers to shapeshift. Then, and only then, are you a true skinwalker. According to local folklore, a man had just done that. An Indian priest not only killed one, but five immediate members of his family. They never caught this man. He disappeared into the woods, never to be seen again. When Jason and Alex set out for their camping trip, they knew all the old legends, and they laughed at the idea that a skinwalker would come get them if they ventured out onto the old native land, the same land that the supposed murders took place. And why should they believe the legends? A legend of a man becoming a beast? Jason and Alex were brothers. They spent their entire lives together until Jason had gotten married. Then, Jason moved away and started a family. But not Alex. Alex stayed in their hometown, tending to their parents, making an honest living off the land, and try to be a good person. And Alex had succeeded at this. He hadn't broken a commandment in years and was well on his way, well, in his own mind, to heaven. Three years had passed between their last get-together, and three more might have passed if Alex didn't insist on a camping trip, but insist he did, and there they were. It was getting dark, and the two of them were laying out under the stars. They were deep in the woods and they had no GPS or maps. But they knew the path back from where they were. They had gone there as kids. Never know, huh? Alex replied. He only caught bits and pieces sometimes. We can never let that know, Jason said. Know what? That we stayed on the old native land past dark. We promised him as kids, and I wouldn't want to upset him now. He's getting pretty close to dead. And if we started an argument now, we may not resolve it in time. For, you know, just don't tell him or Ma, okay? Okay, sure. They both were silent for a while. Until up creeped the small raccoon. Well, look at that, Alex called, as he pointed towards the critter. It stared at them for several minutes, not moving. Not attempting to flee when they motioned towards it. It stayed almost perfectly still and then finally it left minutes later came a deer and again the creature stayed and watched them unwavering determination glared in its eyes for almost two hours the brothers were kept awake as every animal they knew to live in the forest and some they were almost sure that didn't inhabit the area came to gaze upon them. The final animal was a gray wolf. It slowly moved towards them, and when it was five feet away, it stopped. Don't move. Don't panic. It'll go, Jason assured Alex. 
the wolf slowly stood up on its hind legs and then its limbs began to contort and pop. Horror slid over Jason and Alex's faces as they saw the fur tear open, revealing light brown flesh underneath. Finally, they gazed upon what looked like a man with a wolf head. The skull of the wolf split open like a melon, the fur sliding off of it, the bone chipping and falling like a fragile eggshell. And then in its pace, slowly grew out the head of a man. The man now stood before the paralyzed brothers. They couldn't seem to move. This is my land, said the man with an almost supernatural smile. Get the fuck away from us, Jason said as fiercely as he could. The man began to laugh, and as he continued to laugh, the pitch changed. It grew deeper. From that of a man to that of a demon and soon it sounded as if the devil himself was out to get them the man's skin grew black as coal and his eyes yellow like a cat's his demonic laughter echoed through the forest as he drew closer and closer the brothers being unarmed they had no choice other than to flee and that's what they did they ran as fast as they could, except instead of out to their cars, they were cornered into running deeper into the woods. For hours they seemed to play cat and mouse. Several times animals they passed would burst open, revealing the deranged man. But they continued to run. Finally, reaching a cabin, they ducked inside. They were filled with fear and the brothers felt that leaving the cabin would result in them dying. What they found in the cabin made them regret their ignorance on legends. For in the main bedroom of the cabin were corpses, at least a hundred of them. Every animal they had seen that night was there. And then they saw larger bodies, human bodies. It was then that the man burst into the room Except he was once more a wolf. In his deep voice, he said, Welcome home. The following week, the police found the cabin during their search for Jason and Alex. They found the brothers, but their faces looked as if they were eaten by an animal of some sort. Six days later, a security camera several states over caught Alex filling up a car with gas. Several witnesses also reported seeing the dead man and on nearly all accounts he was seen smiling. A wide unnatural grin. If you're reading this, congratulations. I'm most likely dead, or maybe worse. My name is Daniel, and I own quite a bit of land up in the Appalachian Mountains, left to me by my great auntie. So far, in the years I lived here, paranormal and downright disturbing things have happened to me here. People told me to just leave or report it, like I never done that before. To them, I'm just the young guy that went crazy a little too early. It bothers me that normal people have no idea what goes on up here, all alone. You see, my first encounter with them, I didn't know how to deal with them. I didn't even know what they were called until recently. It's important, or at least it's important to me that some of the tricks I have learned throughout the three years I lived up here could be of use to somebody one day. My second or maybe third time I was being stalked by a skinwalker. It felt like I was walking in circles. I had a camera with an SD card pretty deep in the woods. But when I tried to walk back to my cabin, I kept passing the camera. I was walking in circles. This went on for hours. The sun was setting soon and I was quite thirsty at the time I remember. 
I sat up against the tree my camera was mounted on and actually started crying. It was watching me, I guess waiting for me to fall dead. I hit myself in desperation a few times, trying to think. I sat up and took a very deep breath, wiped the water from my eyes, and it dawned on me. It's gotta be messing with my equilibrium. I have to be off balance, there's no other way. But I could still walk, but my depth perception was slightly off. All I had to do was tilt my head as far as it would go into my shoulder and walk back to my cabin. My ear was pressed into my shoulder, but even with one ear, I could still hear how anxious the creature sounded, pacing in the woods, hoping I didn't get away. Once I made it inside my cabin, I didn't come out for a couple of days for safe measures. Another trick they know is mimicking animals. I found that they like coyotes. I actually used to hunt coyotes back home but never up here in the mountains. I seen a couple of my deer cameras that it looked like right after I left my camera. A coyote would follow me a while, if not all the way home. I had to stop that real quick and set out some snares. All the snare would and could do is jam the coyote's legs into the mechanism until a button is pressed and then it could be unlocked. I set out a couple of them but also rubbed some white ash on all the traps and sure enough the next time I started walking back from my camera I hear the sound of one go off. I quickly ran back to where I had laid the traps with a gun drawn and all that was left was the trap in three separate pieces and the scent of burning hair in the air. Every time I checked the camera after that, a coyote with a nasty burn scar on its leg would stop where the camera was mounted and turn around and walk back into the brush. And lastly, do not engage in any type of combat with them. Warding them off is one thing, but actually hunting them is a mistake. I wish I would have known that sooner. I had two buddies back in town I used to tell my stories to. Alcohol loosens the lips. Their names were James and Cole. I'm pretty sure they were cousins, but I never asked. Thinking about it now, I wish I would have gotten to know them better. But long story short, they're dead. And now, I'm dying. This morning, they came and pounded in my door insisting we hunt these skinwalkers. I told them it was a very bad idea, but they even took the liberty of buying silver bullets. They told me how much they cost, but I can't remember right now. I finally caved and we got ready all day. We first started making a large amount of white ash, cleaning our guns, heck, they even packed MREs and special high dollar spotlights. We set off right as the sun went down. We weren't three hours in when disaster struck. We were all sitting around a tree. I could tell that the skinwalkers were watching us. They're all around us, multiple. I'm scanning everything with my spotlight, not even realizing that Cole wasn't with us anymore. I asked James where he was, but he didn't seem nervous at all and told me he may have had to go pee. I turn back to face my front, and there I see Cole. He's a good distance out, but something wasn't right. He was contorting in ways a human could never. I started to turn around to ask James what we should do, but halfway around, I heard James guttural, sounding, breathing like his lungs were filling with blood i couldn't stand to be there anymore and booked it back to the cabin the forest seemed like it was laughing at me in my desperation to run home i knocked my flashlight running and it was slowly getting dimmer and dimmer i eventually had to ditch it and use some of the flares that cole and james brought i pulled the top off and struck it against the tree and the red flame lit up the surrounding forest. There were so many of them, 10, 
20, maybe more. But as luck would have it, they never attacked me. I could see the cabin and flung the door open and shut it behind me. I ran for the upstairs bedroom and quickly got into the old wooden closet where I'm currently typing this. I don't hear them, but they're outside my house. Unfortunately, in the midst of running away, I did end up getting clawed or maybe bit. It's not a terrible wound, but it's bleeding black. If you're reading this, if you can, please send help. I really do need it this time. Jacob cursed as he pushed through the thick underbrush, trying to make his way to the tree stand he had built earlier in the summer. He was for sure that this location would give him a good sight to the neighboring field, in which he frequently saw large herds of deer. This was going to be his year, and he was sure of it. This is the year that I bring home my trophy buck, he told himself, as he recalled the events of the day so far. He had awakened at 4.30 a.m. He began to get ready for the long day in the woods on the backside of his farm. His first order of business had been to locate and rescue his gloves and camouflage hunting gear from whatever undisclosed area of his home that his wife had hidden them. He was gonna need them this morning to protect him from the bitter cold November morning. How could it be this cold this early in the year? He wondered as he started to work on his second task of the day which was to make a breakfast that would stick to his ribs long into the day. But he finally settled on toast, country ham, and scrambled eggs. He topped it all off with a large cup of coffee that had left a bitter aftertaste in his mouth. In fact, he could still taste it. After this, he packed himself a cheese sandwich for lunch. He grabbed his Remington hunting rifle, some coffee, and headed out the door. He loaded his gear into his truck and pulled out of the driveway and turned right into the one lane blacktop road that led to the backside of his property. After about two and a quarter miles, he turned right again. He had to travel about half a mile down that pitiful rut filled excuse for a road when he came to his desired location. He then got out of his truck and loaded his gun and walked off into the woods. 10 minutes out of the truck and he was already cold and it was made worse by the cloudy overcast day and the wind that was blowing through the trees making all the leaves rattle like dry bones. Oh well, he thought, it's gonna be a good day anyway, especially if I bring home a big one. Jacob took about 10 more steps when an uneasy feeling began to creep over him. He felt as though someone had stepped over his grave. He got the distinct feeling that he was being watched. But by whom? This was, after all, his property. And it was posted. No one had permission to be on his land. He had to be alone. But if he was alone, why couldn't he shake this eerie feeling that was scratching at the base of his skull? Something was off today. There was a silence in the forest. No birds, no insects, only the sound of the wind in the trees. Convincing himself that it was nothing more than a case of nerves, he continued to press on until he came to a clearing, not too far from his tree stand. Stepping into the clearing, Jacob saw the remains of what appeared to be a large deer, but he wasn't quite able to make out what he was seeing from this distance because the sun wasn't completely up yet and the forest was still covered in shadows. Jacob then walked closer to get a better look and found that he had been correct. It was a deer. A large eight point buck in fact. Looking at the remains, he felt a sense of dread come over him. 
and icy fingers dance along his spine. Something about this kill just didn't seem right. The throat was completely torn out, and the stomach was ripped open. Plus, also several of the internal organs were missing. This definitely wasn't a coyote kill, and no hunter would have done this. They would have taken the head to have it mounted. What could have done this, he wondered. A fear like nothing he had ever experienced before began to wash over him in waves. What is going on, he thought. At nearly 225 pounds, and well over 6 foot, he wasn't one to give in to fear, but now he couldn't seem to calm down, and his heart was beating like a trip hammer. That feeling that he was being watched was getting stronger by the minute, and he couldn't shake the feeling that he was moments away from a bad situation. He slowly started to back away from the mango body and head back to his truck and back to safety. No more than six steps into his journey, his blood turned to ice in his veins as a deep, guttural scream shattered the eerie silence and what was left of his courage. He had grown up on the farm all of his life and had been an experienced hunter since he was a child. He was familiar with every animal in the part of the state. Fear now gave way to stark terror as he chambered around into his Remington rifle and turned around only to find there was nothing behind him. His mind raced with confusion and he was confronted with a million thoughts at once. What should I do? What could it be? Should I run? Am I gonna die? His survival sense kicking into overdrive. Jacob decided to continue on his previously contrived plan, which was to get to the truck and get out of there. Slowly and cautiously, he made his way toward the perceived salvation of his vehicle, silently praying every step of the way. With 300 yards separating him from his only avenue of escape, Jacob began to hear heavy footfalls off to his left. He could hear the crunching of withered leaves, sticks, and the breeze that littered the forest floor. Summoning every ounce of courage that remained within him, he forced himself to look in the direction of the noise. And that is when he saw the dark silhouette that followed him through the forest. Quickening his pace, he redoubled his efforts to reach the truck and get to a phone and call the sheriff, the game warden, or anyone that would listen. He couldn't tell what it was that was stalking him, but he could clearly see that it towered more than seven feet and was incredibly massive. Jacob couldn't help but think that he was about to become a national statistic, a person who left home under normal circumstances and just disappear without a trace. How many people, he wondered, go into the woods and just vanish, and the authorities just assume that they have become lost, injured, or been the victims of animal attacks, with their bodies never recovered. Please God, don't let that happen to me, he told himself, as he drew closer and closer to his truck. 75 yards became 50, and 50 became 30 and 30 became 10, and like a miracle, he was back and opening his door. Throwing his rifle inside, he pulled himself up into the cab and started the engine and hit the gas. But the truck went nowhere. He had parked in a puddle of mud, and now the tires simply spun in place. Not now, he thought. I can't be stuck, allowing himself a moment to think. Jacob would remember. This truck is a four-wheel drive. There is no way I can be stuck and was ready to punch the gas and leave this nightmare behind. Unfortunately for Jacob, some nightmares are not so easily left behind and there is nothing worse than a nightmare you can't wake up from. And Jacob was about to learn that the hard way. Hearing something to his right, he turned and immediately wished that he had not. It took him maybe half a second to turn his head, 
but he would have given anything in the world to have that half second back because it was the last moment that his world would ever see normal again. In that split second, his world changed. It was no longer a place where the world was light and safe, where he was just a husband and a dad and a guy that liked to go hunting and watch football on the weekends. That reality had evaporated away and all that was left was a world where monsters existed and things really do go bump in the night. And now an ambassador from that nightmare realm was standing just outside his passenger door. A visible reminder that his world had been turned upside down. Jacob screamed as he stared transfixed on this escapee from a horror movie. In his most terrifying, fevered dream, he couldn't have imagined that such a thing could exist. It was hideously ugly, easily standing eight feet tall with a thick, muscular body. There was just something about that face that was just wrong. Almost like a mixture of a man and an animal experiment that had gone horribly wrong. It was the most terrifying thing he had ever seen. It was completely covered with thick shaggy black hair that was matted in areas with God only knows what. And it walked on two legs, not on four legs like you would expect from some kind of animal. What was this thing that had shattered his perception of reality? Was it a demon? Was it a werewolf? It can't be, he thought. Those things don't exist. But whatever it was, it was staring at him, and it didn't look happy. The menacing juggernaut threw its enormous head back and let out a blood-crawling scream that resonated throughout the surrounding area and seemed to vibrate him to his very core. Shocked back into action, Jacob threw his truck into gear and took off as though he was being chased by the very hounds of hell. Jacob, with his mind racing, wondered what he was going to do. How will I ever feel safe on this farm again, he thought. Are my wife and children in danger? What and where did this thing come from? And will anyone believe me? The whirlwind of thoughts that swirled through Jacob's mind came to an immediate stop as he slammed on his brakes and nearly slid off the road. In a state of disbelief, Jacob sat staring at the large hackberry tree that laid across the dirt road and blocked his path, preventing him from reaching the black top and guarantee safety. How is this even possible, he thought. I just came down this road not even 30 minutes ago, and this path was clear. It was painfully obvious to Jacob that he had to get that tree moved if he was going to make it back home. Since he didn't have a chain to pull the tree out of the road, nor did he have a saw with which he could cut up the unexpected barricade, he was left with a few options, one of which was walking, which he discounted immediately. The most logical course of action that he could come up with was to call for help. His best friend Kenny Patterson owned the farm just over from his. If he were home, he could bring a saw and cut the tree up for him. Jacob, with his nerves still frazzled and frayed, reached into his glove box and pulled out his cell phone and dialed Kenny's number. The phone rang six times and Jacob was about to give up when Kenny answered the phone and said, Hey ugly, what do you want this early in the morning? As quickly as he could, he told the recent events to Kenny and said, Please, hurry, I'm not kidding, there is something out here. Kenny, hearing the shakiness in his friend's voice, assured him that he would be there in a matter of minutes. Jacob thanked him and hanged up the phone, and braced himself for what he was sure would be the longest few minutes of his life. Sitting motionless inside of his truck, every sound made his imagination run wild with fear. Even though little more than three minutes had passed since he had spoken to Kenny, it felt as if hours had passed. The clock seemed to be an eternity. Jacob frequently checked in all directions for any sign to see if this nightmarish monstrosity had pursued him. 
in every shadow that the forest and on this cloudy day produced. He thought he saw the shape of the black beast that had followed him out of the woods, and he was afraid that he would lose himself long before Kenny arrived to clear the tree out of his path. After what seemed like a lifetime, Jacob heard the sound of Kenny's old truck sputtering up the road, and in just moments, he was able to see the old red Chevy as it made its way closer to him. Jacob's spirits lifted when he saw his old friend, and a sense of relief washed over him as he realized that he was no longer alone. Stepping out of his truck, Jacob said, Man, what took you so long? I told you to hurry. Kenny, with a surprised look on his face, what are you talking about? You only called me 11 minutes ago. I think I made pretty good time. Jacob could hardly believe that only 11 minutes had passed. It had seemed so much longer. After apologizing to his friend and telling him exactly how happy he was to see him, both men walked over to the fallen tree and made a discovery that startled them both. The tree had not broken. It had not been cut. It had been pushed over and completely uprooted. All around the tree were large bipedal footprints that had a somewhat human appearance to them. But if they were human, the owner would require a size 28 shoe. Jacob and Kenny looked at each other and then without a word went to work on the tree. Kenny took a chainsaw from the bed of his truck and began to cut up the fallen blockade. Meanwhile, Jacob pulled the logs and debris from the road. Mission accomplished. Kenny put away his saw and he and Jacob were about to get in their vehicles and leave. But before they could even open their doors, an ear-splitting scream erupted from the woods behind them. Jacob walked over to Kenny and whispered, That's what I was telling you about. I don't know what that thing is, man, but it looks like some kind of monster. And I think we need to get out of here, now. Kenny looked as though the blood had drained completely out of his face, became very pale as he said to Jacob, Jacob, man. I never mentioned this to anyone before now, but over the last few months, that thing has been killing off a few of my cows. Their throats are usually torn out, and the bodies are mangled and broken. I didn't want anyone to accuse me of being crazy and making stuff up, so I never said anything about it. But that's the reason I rushed over here when you called. I actually heard that sound a few times off in the distance at night but never this close. So I think you are right, old buddy. It's time to go. Cautiously and with a sense of urgency, Jacob and Kenny climbed into their vehicles and made their way back into the blacktop. Both vehicles then began the two and a half mile trek that led back to Jacob's house so they could decide what course of action should be taken. Jacob could feel the temperature drop as snow began to gently fall. He then reached over and turned his wipers on as snow began to pelt the windshield harder. As he passed his neighbor, William Springer's farm, he noticed a herd of deer grazing in the field that bordered his own property. Having put a distance between himself and the nightmare he had just encountered, Jacob felt a renewed sense of security as his fatigued nerves began to calm down. Not willing to let this opportunity pass him by, Jacob turned on his hazard lights and pulled to the shoulder of the road and signaled Kenny to do the same. Kenny knew what Jacob was thinking as he pulled in behind him and turned his ignition off. Getting out of his truck, Kenny said, What are you doing, man? We need to get out of here now. Jacob said, I know, and we will, in just a minute, man. I just can't turn this down. I have to take the shot. That's a six-point buck standing there. It's not the trophy that I wanted, but at least I won't end up going home empty-handed. And after what happened this morning, I think I deserve a little something good. Alright, just take the shot so we can go. I still don't feel right about this, Kenny said. Jacob steadied his rifle across the hood of his truck. He zeroed in on the buck and was getting ready to fire. That's when he heard Kenny make a gasping noise and whisper, Oh my god. What is it, man? What's wrong with you? Raise your scope three inches. 
he said, raising the scope. Jacob immediately saw what had been the cause of Kenny's alarm. Standing just outside a tree line in the edge of the field was the creature that they had left behind. Not even five minutes. Was this thing following them? Was it after the deer? What was it doing? Jacob watched the creature through his scope for a full 30 seconds before it even moved. And when it did, it ignored him and the deer and started to walk towards William's barn that was just about 500 yards from where the woodland demon had been standing. Jacob called out to Kenny and said, Kenny, call William and tell him that there is something trying to get into his barn. I know he has livestock in there, and if that thing gets in it, it will kill all of them. Attempting to get rid of this monster, werewolf, wendigo, or whatever it was, Jacob fired a shot, but missed. The creature turned towards them and glared at them through red, hate-filled eyes, and then began to run towards them at full steam. Kenny, who was still on the phone with William, screamed at Jacob to get in his truck and go. Jacob did as he was told, and Kenny followed right behind them. Starting their trucks, Jacob and Kenny both raced to Jacob's house, as though they were driving on the NASCAR circuit. Arriving at home, Jacob, gun in hand, ran inside to get a phone book so that they could call the game warden and the police and get some kind of animal control out there to get rid of this thing. Jacob had just stepped out of his front porch when they heard gunfire coming from over at William's place. Dropping the phone book and running back inside, Jacob grabbed his 12 gauge shotgun and some shells and handed them to Kenny who took little time in loading it. Jacob and Kenny now locked and loaded, walked together to their truck and got ready to mount up a rescue for their neighbor William. Simultaneously, both of them stopped in their tracks as a familiar but uneasy feeling crept over them and Jacob's two German shepherds began to whimper and ran under the front porch to hide. Kenny, whose throat had gone dry as a bone, whispered to Jacob and said, I have a really bad feeling about this. No sooner had the words escaped his lips they heard a scream erupt from the forest, off to the right, and the creature exploded from the trees in front of them. Until now, neither man had been able to fully appreciate the colossal size and scope of the beast, but standing less than 30 feet away from them, they were almost overcome by the sheer magnitude of it. Jacob had seen it up close earlier from his truck while sitting down, and had guessed the height at maybe 8 feet, but now, standing there, Looking up, he could tell that this fellow was eight and a half or nine feet tall and would tip the scale at 800 to 1,000 pounds. It had inhuman long arms that were easily seen beneath its long shabby black hair which covered it from head to toe. The chest was larger than a 55 gallon drum and there was little doubt that it could have pulled the arms off an ape and now it stood there staring at them. Jacob and Kenny both opened fire without hesitation. The creature screamed with rage as the bullets tore into its massive body, knocking it to the ground, but not killing or seriously injuring it. Jacob and Kenny watched speechless as it crawled into the tree line, struggled to its feet, and limped away. Jacob ran back to the porch and grabbed the phone book and called the local game warden. Nearly two hours later, Gene, the local warden, showed up to take their statements and told them that he had been called out to answer numerous such reports in the area but he wasn't sure what to make of all these reports guys he said i don't know what to tell you there is no animal in this area or any area for that matter that fits your description i'm not saying i don't believe you i just don't know what it is jacob whose face was reddened with anger said come here here is the blood from where we shot it, and here are the footprints. A look of complete confusion washed over Gene's face, and he asked if they would care to go with him as he tried to track it. Jacob and Kenny agreed, but they said they weren't going without a gun. Gene stated that he planned to take his gun as well. All three men loaded their guns and set out following the tracks and droplets of blood that had fallen on the leaves. They followed the trail for about a mile 
until arriving at a creek that was located deep in Jacob's woods where the tracks that they were following were joined by others just like them. Some were smaller, but at least one set was larger. Deciding that the safest course of action would be to return home, they all went back to Jacob's. None of them gave up the idea of staying out in the woods, longer since there was now, apparently, more than one creature. And the cloudy overcast day made the forest seem even darker than it would normally be this time of day. Back at Jacob's, Gene informed them that there was nothing left that he could do but file it under an unknown animal sighting, which made both Kenny and Jacob anything but happy. Jacob and Kenny spent the next couple of days trying to warn their neighbors to use caution when they were out in the forest. Most of their friends just laughed at them and said they had most likely just seen a bear or something. No one believed them except William, who had also seen it himself the same day they had. He had even taken a shot at it but missed. Jacob, William, and Kenny knew what they had seen and they knew it was still out there, and they didn't care who believed them and who didn't. Over the next few weeks, more and more neighbors began to take the story a little more seriously, as family pets began to disappear, and other pets were found mangled. Other farms in the area began to find their cows and other livestock torn open with their throats ripped out. Just a week after shooting the creature in his yard, Jacob's own German Shepherd was found dead with its throat torn out and it was hanging across a limb in a tree in his front yard. It almost seemed like a revenge killing. A few days later, one of William's new animals died the same way. Some people in the area still don't believe. They think the whole story was made up. But Jacob and Kenny know that there is still something out there in the forest. They still occasionally find tracks or a slaughtered cow or a goat. They still hear the blood curling screams off into the woods at night. They know that there is still something out there, watching and waiting, biding its time. Something cold and cunning and cruel. Something not human with a taste for blood and revenge. I was in prison for 15 years. There was a skinwalker in there with us. A little background first. I was serving a 15 year sentence in a penitentiary in South Arizona. What I was in there for isn't important. But when I was staying there, there were countless things that happened that no one could explain. And even more that no one wanted to know more about. It all started with a prison legend. They said that years ago, something awful and unexplainable happened in the prison. Every morning we would wake up and be expected to stand near the front of our cells while guards visually confirmed we were present and accounted for. Apparently about a year before I got sent there, the most brutal and unexplainable thing happened during one of those routines. A man who had a cell to himself looked very off. When the guard saw this, he pulled over another guard to help him check it out. They found it wasn't actually the prisoner they were expecting at all. It was a totally different man. And this man was wearing the skin of the other man over him, but apparently it looked like a real monster. The scariest thing was that the guy wearing the skin was not an inmate. They had no idea how he even got into the prison. What's worse is that they couldn't even figure out who the hell he was. He wasn't documented anywhere. And what's worse than that, they never even found the body of the man of the skin he was wearing. Pretty scary stuff, I know, and I realize that's not the go-to definition of a skinwalker, but 
That's what the prison called him, the skinwalker. It didn't help out that the guy never talked apparently. Anyways, that's what started the whole skinwalker superstition around the yard. Apparently, the guy got shipped to a different spot about a month after it happened, and just about everyone here felt all the better for it. I heard about the story on the second day of my stay. Hell of a story to hear, to place in your home for the foreseeable future. Now, on to the real shit though. Sure, that guy was the skinwalker, but all he did in the long run was get an old Navajo inmate to tell everyone about actual skinwalkers. It seemed like a lot of the prison culture actually revolved around them. Now apparently, skinwalkers are tricky to point out on the spot, but if you manage to survive around one for more than a minute or two, almost everyone can tell the mannerisms. They can mimic human speech, but not replicate it. They twitch manically. They have an unnatural gait while walking. But apparently, they got better with experience. The old Navajo guy, his name was Carl, said that he was sure there was an actual one among the prisoners, slowly picking us off over the years. He called it the Grandmaster Skinwalker at one point. Apparently, he thought it had human mannerisms down so well that you might not even been able to tell if it was your cellmate for a day or two. He would expect the skinwalker to jump at any opportunity for a kill. But this one realized it had a revolving door of people to kill coming to it. A lot of guys found humor in it. A lot more were really on the edge about it. And every once in a while, in prison, people snap. Sometimes, you will find your cellmate swinging in front of the bunk, strung up around the neck by his pants. Sometimes, you just can't take it anymore. But in our yard, people tended to snap in a very special way. It wouldn't be an outburst at dinner or a silent suicide in the night. Guys would just stop talking, hunch over, and shuffle around. Any friendships they had would be mostly out the window. They would turn into a loner during wreck time. They would let their hair hang in front of it, in front of their face. No one liked to talk about it. Like if they did, it would happen to them next. I felt the same way too. I didn't know if it was a skinwalker or people just going crazy. But I didn't want to find out. It wasn't clockwork or anything. But every time someone snapped in this way, it wasn't more than a couple weeks before they were, quote, shipped off or, quote, transferred to God knows where without anyone else knowing beforehand. Then there were nighttime occurrences. Short and a loud burst of sound echoed through my cell block during all hours of the night on a regular basis. It sounded like a mix between a pig dying squeals and nails on a chalkboard. Just another thing no one liked to talk about, even scarier, were the shadows and footsteps. The block was dimly illuminated in the night by a few lights hanging from the ceiling outside the cells. I myself saw shadows fill across my wall on a regular occasion. One time, near the end of my sentence, I woke up, looked at my back wall, and found the perfect silhouette of a person standing there. But when I looked, my bunkmate was asleep and no one was really outside my call. And the footsteps, everyone hated the fucking footsteps. They were the scariest part. In the night, sometimes, more rarely than the shadows, you would hear ungodly, fast footsteps. They sounded like wet feet slapping on the tile floor. Whatever caused them would fly from one end of the block to the other in a dead sprint. Whatever it was, it was not human like and it was very fast. If you happen to be awake before it started, by the time you heard the footsteps on one side of your cell and whipped your head around to see the thing run by, 
It sounded like it was three cells past you. Everyone hated those fucking footsteps. And I agree. I thought they were the worst. I was released from that place about a month ago. I have more stories than I can count. I swear it was nearly my turn. About a week before I was discharged, my cellmate and a good friend of mine snapped. In the same kind of way, I didn't sleep for an entire week. Well, I did sleep of course, but never for more than a few minutes at a time. Never turned my back on the guy. The scariest thing though, was when I woke up one night to him, somehow, snaking his body through the bars of our cell. For reference, I couldn't get anything past my shoulder through them. And the worst part of all of this was that he was coming back in to our cell. On the day of my release, I didn't say a word to him. Just left. And he seemed fine with it. And so was I. I had made it through. 15 years of prison fights, gang disputes, and for all I know, skinwalker abductions. I left through the front gate, a free man. As I walked along the fence for the wreck yard, I spotted my cellmate, standing off on his own. Similar to how he was for the last week or so, I shook my head, not even really sure if it was him anymore. I took one last look over the yard, this time from the other side of the fence, and I wish I hadn't. There, standing off on his own, on the other side of the yard, was Carl, slouched over, looking at the other inmates, and twitching manically. I grew up in Winslow, Arizona, but also lived for a period of time on the reservation near the Puerto River. My grandparents have a home which is more to the east and not all that far from the New Mexico state line. When my mother and aunts were children, they lived further west. Their house was in a wooded area and though there were neighbors, there wasn't that many. When I was young, I often heard stories of skinwalkers, but never really believed until I got older and after my grandmother, a Christian woman, not prone to superstition or telling lies, shared with me and my cousins an encounter that occurred when my mother and her sisters, my aunts, were still small children. They were living at the time in a three-bedroom house, full wood construction, surrounded by a small fence and with chicken wire around the front porch. One night, when all the children are in bed and my grandfather is off working, she is awakened by a noise that she hears outside. She gets up out of bed and in the dark, makes her way out to the living room. It is then that she hears something up on the roof of the house. She said that she knows immediately what it is. Her first instinct is to go out to the front porch and cursed the creature that has picked her and her family as a target. As she makes her way to the front door, she hears it walking around over her head. Then, as soon as she starts to open the door to go out, she hears it jump down by the side of the porch, open the porch door, come up to the steps, and right up to the kitchen window, only about 10 feet away from where my grandmother is standing. She says that she is really scared now, but as the porch light is on, she thinks that she can take a peek through the window and see what is out there. Just as she starts to pull aside the curtain, her whole body freezes, as if she has no control over it whatsoever. However, she can hear just fine, and whatever is out there on the porch starts to scratch at the kitchen window, as if it's trying to get into the house. My grandmother says she starts praying and asking God to make whatever it is go away. And this is before she becomes a Christian. Finally, the creature gives up and leaves. Once it is gone, my grandmother is able to move again. She says she knows it was a skinwalker. Her own mother had often shouted into the night. And her father would shoot with a shotgun into the darkness whenever a skinwalker came around their whole gun. 
the next morning, when my grandfather comes home from work, she tells him what happened. He takes the ladder and goes up into the roof and discovers a bundle of dry grass and twigs placed there alongside of the chimney. He tells her that the skinwalker might have wanted to start a fire in order to get her and the girls out of the house. Later that day, one of the older men from the reservation comes by the house and puts ash over the doorway. Even to this day, my grandmother swears that she knows who that skinwalker was. But what's more weird or strange is that she's never told us. And even now, she won't say who it was. In Arizona, there is an older woman who lives not far from my grandmother's house. She works about halfway to Gallup, New Mexico, maybe about 20 minutes away from my grandmother's house. On cold mornings, she gets up before the sun to start her car and let it warm up before she makes the drive. Her house is surrounded by a dark wood fence, which is about five feet tall. This one morning, as she is making her way out to the car, she hears voices that seem to be chanting and giggling. She thinks they are coming from over by this low hill to the east of her house and back from the road. She walks over to the fence and takes a look, but it's still dark and the hill is covered with trees and bushes. She doesn't see anything or anyone and the voices have stopped. She doesn't give it another thought, goes about her usual morning routine and eventually leaves for work. A few nights later, she is bringing in her laundry from the outside line when she hears really loud music coming from the neighbor's yard across the street. She decides to be nosy and walks over to the fence to see which one of the boys it is, thinking that maybe she can ask him to lower the volume some. Just as she gets to the fence, she sees a dark figure step from the trees on that low hill and make its way down towards the street. It's moving kind of funny, as if it's not accustomed to its own body. She screams, and it starts to run really fast towards the young man playing the boombox. He must have heard her, because she says he lowered the volume. However, when she turns back around to see where the figure has gone to, it's now gone. She says that she was certain that it was a skinwalker. There's an old crow story dating back to the turn of the 20th century about a man and his daughter driving their wagon along one of the back dirt roads of the reservation. They're on their way to the market. The daughter, about 10 years of age, notices an old woman up ahead. She is limping along the middle of the road and mumbling to herself. Just then, her father moves the horse pulling the wagon and it breaks into a faster pace, trawling up alongside the old woman. As soon as the father is in reach, he raises his buggy whip and trashes the woman across the back. Then and there, right before the eyes of the little girl, the old woman withers down in size, turns into a coyote, and runs off into the trees by the roadside. Her father, not in the least bit surprised, turns to her and says, let that be a lesson to you. The canyons throughout the four corners, for those who don't know, Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico, Nevada fits in there too, are populated with signs and indications of the presence of the ancestors of the tribes native to the area. Most common are petrographs and petroglyphs, drawings on stones, the remains of cliff dwellings, and ancient roads which seem to run to nowhere. There are also man-made structures of stone houses and temples. Most of these areas are accessible to visitors However, they are also monitored by local and tribal authorities which protect them and ensure their preservation.
That being said, it is not uncommon to find graffiti and other evidence of disregard for these historical sites. Several years ago, a friend of mine, a local Hopi guide for the tourists, and I are poking around these ruins. It's already dark, but if you are going to go to these places for the reason we go, see if there's anything of value that hasn't yet been recovered. You have to go at a time you're likely not to be seen. I have gone to other similar places with this guy, and we had some luck with small relics that tourists will buy. By the way, I am Hopi as well. We are only there for a short period when we hear something moving towards the ridge and only a few yards from where we are. My friend takes a pistol from his waist and points it over to the trees. He's calling out in our native language some words we both know and which are generally used to ward off dark spirits. By the sound of things, whatever is out there is getting more bold and coming closer but we still can't see anything. At the same time, there is this feeling of dread building up inside of me, and I'm thinking too how nice it would be to have a pistol instead of the flashlight that I am carrying. At this time, we're both thinking Skinwalker, but that's just part of who we are as Hopi. My friend then starts backing the two of us towards the edge running up and over our heads. Just then, this sharp, yipping sound breaks out, followed by this sustained high-pitched scream which slices right through me like an icy wind. I find myself praying before I realize I am doing it already. My friend is starting to chant and Hopi, his voice filled with fear. We both have no doubt it is a skinwalker and it is coming right at us. I lift my flashlight and point its bright beam in the direction of that blood chilling screech. The skinwalker still in the dark responds by making this throat mucus filled sound, a sort of coughing noise. I am waving the light all around trying to get a glimpse of it. Just then, I guess my friend can't take it anymore and starts firing his pistol. The rounds tearing through the bushes. I drop for cover and duck my head saying the hell Mary the whole time. When he stops firing, I look up in time to see this dark shape run up the sheer slope of the ridge just to the other side of the trees and brush. We didn't hang around to see where it went, leaving the ruins behind and getting back to our truck. So if you ever go anywhere near the four corners, don't stay past nighttime. And whatever you do, don't venture out into any native man-made structures, temples, or anything related to ancient native tribes. You might just come across a skinwalker. I myself am not Navajo, but my friend is. He grew up around Gallup, New Mexico. He loves to tell me stories about skinwalkers. He knows it gives me the chills. According to him, they are not like werewolves, but are dark spirits that use the skins or even the flesh of anything living that may serve its purpose. They will also use animal parts as totems. For example, they will take the claws from a bear or the antlers from a deer. They are known to come after humans too. But he says that's a native thing and that white people have nothing to worry about. He says the only way to make it stop bothering you is to take away its disguise. The scariest story he tells is about this Navajo trucker that his father knows. Every night he makes the long run to the reservation from Gallup. One night, when halfway there, he hears a loud noise against the front passenger side of his truck. Thinking he might have hit something, he pulls off to the shoulder of the road to take a look, but he finds nothing, not even a mark or dent on the fender. So he gets back on the road and resumes driving. But only a few seconds later, he sees something in his rearview mirror towards the middle of the road and moving up on him. And it's not another vehicle. Then, 
just as suddenly as it appears, it's gone. Shrugging it off, he goes back to paying attention to the road. With his semi going about 60 miles per hour, he chances to look in his mirror, and again, he sees this thing chasing him, and it is moving fast. Just like that, it's at his driver's door, and holding onto the handle and striding along. Then without warning, it turns to him with his dog-like face, and dull, dark eyes, and smashes in the window. The driver slams on the brakes, the cab of the truck goes into a slide, the trailer jackknifing past him. The whole time, this creature is holding on to the door and reaching in through the broken window trying to grab him. Somehow, the truck comes to a stop blocking both lanes of the road straight across. The driver is so scared, he doesn't even notice the creature is gone, and instead throws the door open and runs off into the desert. Now. He must have passed out or something, because he awakes with the sun coming up and finds himself huddled by this rock formation. He's dusty, a little dirty, and missing his shirt, but is otherwise unharmed. Sitting there getting his bearings, the events of the previous night come back to him. He gets up to his feet, dusts himself off, and walks out back to the highway, not knowing what to expect with his truck. However, as he reaches the road, he sees it park as neat as it can be there on the shoulder. When he gets up to it, he sees there's nothing wrong with the driver's door window. It's as if he imagined the whole thing. He does notice, however, a series of small scratches on the driver's door all around the handle, as if something was clawing at it. These marks were not there previously. My friend and I were at a party on the Hopi reservation in Polaka. It was getting late and we had a pretty good buzz on. Most of the people we knew had already trickled out so we decided it was a good time as any to leave. We looked around for the friend who was supposed to give us a ride because we had all come together. We found him in a back bedroom, drunk and passed out. So we had no choice. We're gonna have to walk. The two of us lived on the other side of the gulch, a good two miles. Between were nothing but trees, scrubs, brushes, and some hills. We had barely cleared the houses onto the road passing between the wooded area when we got this funny feeling we were being watched. We decided to leave the road and cut through the trees. It wasn't the easiest walk, but it would cut the distance down some. And even though it was pitch black outside, we knew the way pretty well. We had been a good 20 minutes off the road and heading up towards the hills when that same feeling of being watched came upon us again. We both turned around at the same time, but it was so dark we couldn't see anything. But then, my friend Paul swore he heard some kind of cackling or mumbling. I didn't hear anything, except for maybe the wind and the top of the trees at our back. By that time, none of us was gonna admit it. We were feeling a little scared. Without saying a single word, we picked up the pace, moving along pretty good but not running. And that's when I heard it too. But now, it was more like heavy breathing. Paul then grabbed my arm and gave me a tug forward. We took off running straight up the hill, which wasn't that big, but it was still enough of a slope so I wasn't feeling it in my legs. And on top of that, I was drunk. Think about this for a second, running up a hill, at night, drunk, complete darkness, and as you're running, you hear footsteps behind you, and heavy breathing. Whatever it was though, stayed with us every step of the way. Right at the top, Paul and I stopped and turned around, expecting the thing to be right on us, 
But we were standing there, huffing and puffing, and looking at nothing but darkness. A few seconds passed, and then we heard a thin laughter, as if it was coming from down the hill and back from where we started running. We decided to keep moving and put some distance between us. We turned to go down the other side of the hill, and there, standing right in front of us, was this creature. It was standing up on two legs, like a circus dog, only much taller, with both paws extended out in front of it. It had this coyote face, and it was grinning at us, all of its teeth exposed and its tongue sliding from one side to the other. I couldn't believe how skinny it was, as if it hadn't ate in weeks. Its rounded stomach sticking out like one of those African kids in the charity ads, and the skin sinking between its ribs. The smell was unbelievably bad, like the smell of an old, wet dog. We both jumped back with a scream, like two little schoolgirls. As we did, the creature dropped down on all fours and ran past us and down the hill back where we had come from. It was yipping and laughing all the way. Paul and I started praying like never before, swearing to Jesus that if he got us home safe, we would never drink again. The laughing, or whatever you want to call it, died down and disappeared, wasting no time. The two of us made our way down that hill and into the trees that separated us from where we live. As we walked along, we were trying to convince each other everything was okay. It was only a coyote out searching for a meal. We scared it, it jumped up at us, and then it ran away. We started feeling better about things overall. We got across the open field and into the trees. We made it all the way through there without anything else happening. However, just as we stepped out towards that first backyard that we needed to cut through to get to the street, we heard this unmistakable chatter, like some little monkey laughing coming out of the trees just behind us. It was followed by the sound of something moving through the branches and twigs. My friend Paul then yelled out some words that he said that his grandmother had taught him and just like that, the noise ceased and it got real quiet. He then grabbed my arm again and we ran. We ran as fast as we could through that yard and out to the road. We ran straight for the house where Paul lives with his grandmother. When we got there, we found her awake and sitting in the kitchen with only a small candle for the light. She was burning some cedar. When she saw us, she put her finger up to her lips and then pointed to the outside of the house. Her lips were moving, but silently. We stood there still for a minute or two, and then she spoke out loud, saying it was okay. She then said a prayer, and that the skinwalker was now gone. I have no idea how she knew, and I didn't care. Needless to say, I spent the rest of the night there, sleeping where I knew I would be safe. My family has lived in Iowa since July of 2017. And we live in a small neighborhood with a minimum of 25 houses. And it is surrounded by a forest. I've seen many horror movies and most of the movies are always in a forest. So I've been paranoid and been alarmed. Our dog was getting old. So we got another dog. And so now, our old dog has a friend. We named our new dog, Tucker. And he is a very energetic dog with everyone and everything. Our old dog died a few months later and Tucker was the only interactive pet we now had. A couple of years later, my mom and dad got divorced and she moved on to a guy that lives a couple of miles away from our house. 
My mom and dad settle on a schedule on what day they can spend the day with us, while the other goes somewhere else for a couple of days. For context, my mom's side is native, and we do believe in the lore of skinwalkers and wendigos. On one of my mom's days, she drives up this road where it's surrounded by a bunch of trees and a couple of houses and two farms. There is a hill on this road that she has to drive up and as my mom drove up the hill, she saw something in a field near the neighborhood. What she saw was tall, gray skin, had deer hoofs as feet and it was walking into the woods. My mom was confused and when she reached the stop sign, she looked back in her mirror and nothing. Now my mom was scared because she remembered all the stories of the Wendigo and skinwalkers and drove off to our house. When she told me this, I was already scared because of all the stories I had heard on YouTube. As she told the story, I remember the skinwalker, mostly all the stories of the encounters I had found on YouTube. After this, I was extremely cautious when I was outside on my bike rides. Without thinking, I rode my bike near the hill where my mom saw the possible Wendigo. I brought my camera to take pictures of the landscape because it was nice out, but I became paranoid when I came near to the field. And I always trust my paranoia. As I rode off, I felt like I was being watched when I rode past the field. A couple of days later, it was nighttime, and my dog had to go outside to go to the bathroom. I put my dog on a leash that is connected to the porch, and I let Tucker out. I turned on the light that was outside. So I could see what Tucker was doing, but I was cooking food in the kitchen for me, so I had to focus on that. When my food was finished, I heard my dog start barking at something, so I walked towards the door so I could see what he was doing. As I approached the door, I can see Tucker is barking at something in the dark. I opened the door more and told Tucker to stop barking and to get inside because his barking could wake up the neighbors. After telling him to get inside, he kept barking at something in the darkness. My paranoia kicked in, and I shouted to him to get inside. He kept barking. That's when I started to get scared, and I finally looked into the darkness to see nothing but eyes shining from the porch light. As I saw those eyes, my instincts kicked in to pull on the leash and scream out. Get inside. Finally, Tucker responds by reacting to the pull and running towards the door. And I slammed the door as soon as Tucker ran inside. I shut the porch light off and took the leash off his collar. I locked every single door and window in the house and covered every window and anything that you can look through. After Tucker was off the leash, he ran downstairs into our basement. So I grabbed my food and went downstairs to keep an eye on my dog. It's been two months since then and my routine when it got dark was what I did when I saw those eyes outside. Close the blinds, lock the doors, and turn off the lights from outside. Now, whenever I'm outside, I'm always with a group of people or I always keep a weapon on me. My father told me a story once. I'll never forget it for a few reasons that is. I think it's the first story he ever told me as a child. It's also the story of how my grandfather died but to be honest, that isn't the reason. You hear stories on TV, or sometimes you overhear something in a public place. People talk about a ghost, aliens, and you think to yourself, 
this isn't real. They're making it up. Or they're mistaken. Or they're crazy. Or something along those lines. You just can't believe it until something happens. Something that brings it all together. Connects the dots in a way you didn't think of before. Maybe it happens to you. Maybe you hear the same story again and again happening to different people. It doesn't take long for the world to become a lot bigger than you thought it was. As I said, this is a story my father told me, but I never believed it. Even though he swore up and down it was real, it wasn't until I started clicking around the internet that I started to believe. I started to hear other stories just like the one my father told me. It didn't take me long to believe in the rake. That's not what my father called it, of course. He's never used the internet in his life. He wouldn't know what the consensus has taken to naming it. When he chose to call it something other than it or that thing, he called it Skinwalker. After an old Navajo hotel, his grandfather told him, but I'm going to tell you the story exactly the same way he told it to me. We were out hunting one night, he would tell me, coyotes, we would kill them for 50 bucks a skin. They lived on a dairy farm in Ohio. We would do it every night because we needed the money. Sometimes, while we were out, we would come on a deer and kill it. The landlord didn't mind it, and it could feed our family for a few nights and save us some money. Anyway, we were done making our rounds and heading home walking because we didn't have a car or some four-wheeler back then we would cut through the woods that's when we came up on it blood everywhere splatter on the trees in the grass in the creek everywhere at first we figured it was a pack of coyotes we had seen it sometimes they can scavenge and start hunting deer or cattle the worst was when they bred with feral dogs but this was nothing like that. See, when a pack of dogs or wolves or coyotes attack something, they'll do it the right way. They'll pick one that's weak or sick or old or just small. They'll hunt it, draw it into a corner, some place it can't get out of, and they'll run it right to the biggest one, the alpha. And that deer will never see that alpha. It might hear it but it won't see it. It'll just notice that its own throat is gone and then it'll drop dead. It's quick and it's clean. But that wasn't what happened here. Something had run up on a den of deer. Coyotes won't attack a den, nor would a pack of wolves because they'll get too much of a fight. There were three, I think three bodies, just torn apart. A leg here, a torso there. A predator doesn't do that. They don't leave behind scraps. Whatever had done this hadn't done it for food. It had done it for fun. But we didn't know that. We saw a bunch of corpses, torn bodies, and we think it's something we gotta take care of. I remember my dad telling me to go home. He thought it was a pack of feral dogs, but I wasn't gonna leave him. And I damn sure wasn't walking through two miles of woods alone with nothing but a 22 and a pocket knife. He was only 13 at the time, so a 22 rifle was about the only gun he could use. Dad had the shotgun, and I wasn't going anywhere without it. It took me a while to convince him, but finally we began tracking whatever did that. It wasn't difficult, either. We just followed the blood. It seemed like that thing bled a deer before it got away, or it dragged one for a mile. I don't know. I know that I never seen my dad scared before that night. We started hearing noises, and I've been in a lot of woods my whole life. I've been all over the world, and I ain't never heard noises like I heard that night. I heard things screaming. Deer, fox, rabbits, raccoons, birds just scared. 
keep in mind. This is maybe 12 or 1 o'clock. Except the fox and some birds. Nothing was supposed to even be awake. But they weren't just awake. They were moving. I saw a flock of birds that night fly straight into trees just trying to get out of there. We came up on a pack of coyotes. Nearly shot a couple thinking it was what we were looking for. But then we saw they were running towards us. And they ran right past us. They didn't even notice. Then some of the deer did the same. Then some rabbits, squirrels, foxes, even a couple of wild hogs. These things were supposed to be eating each other. And the only thing they cared about was getting out of there. We should have put it together. That maybe whatever we were tracking, it wasn't something we were supposed to see. And maybe... It wasn't something we could kill. I don't even know why we didn't just go home. I guess we were curious. I think that was my dad's nature. To go towards trouble. To fight. And knowing what I knew about what my father did during the war. My nature was to stay close to him. We finally get into an open valley. It was normally a soy field. But it wasn't in season. So it was just flat dirt. We saw the tracks then. A lot of the animals fleeing the forest had paved over the land. But where that deer blood was, nothing had taken a single step. It's almost like they were leaving it for us to find. The tracks were shallow. Whatever it was couldn't have weighed more than 100 pounds. But that didn't mean much. A bobcat weighing 40 pounds wet nearly tore out my damn throat once. All that means is that it's quick and hard to hit. So we follow the tracks and it doesn't take us long to find out where it is. There's this old schoolhouse that sits on top of a hill. Half of it had been ripped out by a tornado, but nobody lived there, not for a long time. We caught homeless people in there, sometimes, or druggies looking for a safe place to shoot up. We figured maybe that was it. Maybe it was some sick kid riding a high. But we didn't think that for long. We get within 50 yards and we hear this noise. A screeching kind of sound. It was sort of made up of two different sounds. One was a high pitched screech. Another was a low pitched growl. It was making both at the same time. We get within 20 yards and we hear the sound. I can remember thinking that it sounded like paper being torn apart while someone was swinging water in a bucket back and forth. Dad looks at me, kneels down, and whispers. I gotta stay behind him, cause we're about to corner him. Any animal will fight when it's cornered, especially when it's a predator. But we can tell by the tracks that it's just one. He tells me it's most likely a single, feral dog, most likely rabbit. The plan is to sneak up on it while it's eating. Shoot it, and then keep shooting it, till it don't move anymore. Then, we slit its throat. If it gets too bad, it's my job to shoot it or stab it, to get it off of him. So he walks up, and I'm right behind him. Just a tad to his side so I can see what it is. I wish to this day, I hadn't. It was leaning over a carcass, tears off its flesh and throws what it doesn't nibble aside. There's blood all over the brick, glistening in the moonlight. It's pale white, human looking, but not quite human. It had arms and legs like a human, but it sat like a monkey. It was hunched over. Its hands weren't normal. It had long fingers with claws at the end. So we see that and my dad hesitates. He wasn't about to fire on a person, so he clears his throat to try to get it to turn around. I swear to God, all the noise just ceased. I ain't never heard true silence before that. Nothing, and I mean nothing, made any noise, which made it all the louder when it turned around, made this shrill cry, and jumped on Dad. He got a shot off. I think he missed. If he hit the thing, it didn't mind. But it was on him. I start shooting it with the 22 point blank. 
but it barely bled the thing. I got off five rounds and then I started hitting it with the gum butt, but it wasn't budging. It didn't even acknowledge that I was there. It clawed at my dad, taking off bits of his flesh. It started on his torso, ripping off the skin. Then it moved up. It tore off his throat. It tore off his nose, his eyes. It scalped him. Then it started digging in and ripped off the bottom half of his jaw. The little bones in that tube in your neck. Then his ribs. I don't exactly remember what happened, but somehow my dad's knife ends up in this thing's shoulder and my dad ends up on my back. I'm running and by God I'm running faster than I ever run before or after and it's following me. I end up back in the woods opposite the ones we've been in. I'm heading towards the landlord's house because it's half a mile away. I can hear this thing screeching and moaning. I hear the tree branches crack and get thrown around. It sounds like someone's taking an axe to every single tree I pass. It's cracking so loud and often, but I just ain't looking back. Finally, I trip into gravel. I look up, and there's my landlord and a bunch of his buddies drinking around a campfire. I scream and I cry, and they come over. I'm telling them to call an ambulance, and he looks at me. And I'll never forget what he said. What is that on your back? He asked me. Just as he said it, he saw. One of those god-awful flannel shirts my dad wore everywhere. It was what was left of my dad. Most of his head, his torso, but nothing after the waist. Suddenly, we hear it, screeching. He grabs me. My dad gets thrown on the ground. I'm fighting him, crying. Cause I think we can still save him somehow but my dad had been gone before I ever picked him up he has to pick me up and throw me inside before I come with him he and his buddies were all inside and they're locking doors and getting guns the landlord's asking me what happened what happened but I just don't know what to tell him he pieced enough of it all together to understand that there was something dangerous out there all the lights in the house are on and someone calls the cops. They'll be there, but in 15 minutes. We look outside and see it walk in front of the fire they made. Don't know what it is. One of them says it looks like an ape. Suddenly, something goes through the window. We shoot at it, but it ain't the thing. It's a dog. My landlord's dog. Just the body though, not his head or legs. We start pushing things in front of doors and windows when we hear something in the garage. I remember one of his friends saying that the doors were open. We hear metal and glass just get ripped apart. We put a couch and a TV in front of the door to the garage. It banged around some more, but then it got quiet. Not silent, like it was before. We could hear it move around some, and the guys were talking, making sure the guns were ready. Someone hands me a pistol. No sooner did I cock the hammer back did we hear something shatter upstairs. Then we heard it screech again. Except now it was louder. And it didn't echo and fade out. Because now it was inside the house. We all rushed to the one door leading upstairs. And we got to it just as that thing did. It opened it just a bit. And four or five men just slammed into it. It got its hand through. Someone with a shotgun took care of that. Put the barrel right up to its wrist and pulled the trigger. Cut its hand off. Clean. That only pissed it off though. It started pushing on the door. Clawing. We were on one side pushing as best as we could. And it was on the other side doing the same. That wood wasn't just going to hold it. So someone tells us to keep our heads down. Suddenly... The top half of the door is just gone. My ears are ringing and there are splinters everywhere. Two or three of them just unloaded on the top of that door. I don't really know where it went after that. The police got there. I was still glued to that door what was left of it. The sun was up before they got me off of it. They put me in a hospital for a while. A lot of people talked to me, but I didn't talk back. Not for a long long time
When I got back home, I got a job from the landlord working on the farm. We didn't talk much, not about that thing, but I signed up for the army when I was 19 and he sat me down to drink some scotch as a send off. I then asked right away what the police told him. The story that they told was that it was a wild animal, most likely a wolf or maybe a bear that had migrated north. I then asked them how they could say that when they had the hand. He looks at me, stunned. He tells me that the hand never made it back to the station. The cop who had it in his car wrecked, drove into a tree, and died on impact. The hand was never found, most likely taken away by an animal. The cops, when they would acknowledge the hand that existed at all, said it was simply the paw of a bear that looked like a human hand. I never talked to the landlord again. He went missing when I was in basic. The cops never found him. They said he owed some people some money and just ran away. But I don't think it's that simple. I never went back to those woods. I wouldn't even if I had the whole goddamn US Army at my back. But that was a lie. When my mother died, I don't think my father felt he had anything left and that he might as well settle old scores. He went to those woods and he never came back. The FBI was called. They did a show for everyone involved, but I knew they weren't actually looking. I had to get one of the agents drunk and slip him a few fifties before he finally told me that they get a few calls about those woods every year about someone up and vanishing, but that was all he wanted to tell me. Before he got up and left with the rest of his team, he got a napkin and he wrote, The Rake. I didn't know what he was talking about until I looked it up on the internet. But to be honest, I wish I would have rather not known. When something like this happens, it happens out of absolutely nowhere, with no warning. It's not some horror movie or story where you know something is about to happen. I'm going to describe what I felt and what I saw. I've been looking for somewhere to share this and hopefully someone can tell me what happened. I have never heard of skinwalkers or that there's a community out there that actually know about these things. I wish I could say something cliche like, I was on Skinwalker Ranch, or my grandma is a Navajo, or some shit like that, but I can't. I actually never even heard of the Navajo natives, or Skinwalkers, or anything, and I sure as hell didn't believe anything like that existed, nor did I even give a fuck about it. I'm 18 years old, and this happened this summer, June 9, 2018. I grew up in the suburbs near ATL, so I had a completely normal life until this happened. I was out of school, so me and my dad went up to Denver to visit my uncle and aunt and my cousin. I have no other cousins my age except for this one, so we were pretty close, and we kept in touch often. His name is Charlie, but we share the same last name, cause his dad is my dad's brother so I won't use our last name. Charlie was pretty big on mountain biking, so he wanted to take me to some mountain biking trails in Apex Park. The trails are not far away from civilization at all, and we weren't even going to spend the night there. We went down a few trails, everything was fine, and we passed some people so we knew we weren't alone. There was nothing sketchy going down. It was hard to keep up with him, but he slowed down for me and we had fun. It was around 6 p.m. and we were heading back to where we parked. Charlie was 21, so we drove ourselves. This is the part where everything goes to hell. We are riding back. Charlie is maybe 20 feet ahead of me. That's when the smell hit me. Oh God, the smell. It was disgusting. At first, I thought maybe we passed a dead animal or something. 
It was more metallic though, and it was very heavy in the air. Charlie stops but doesn't get off his bike. I slow down and stop next to him, and he looks at me with a disgusted face. Do you smell that? What the fuck is that? The smell started to get stronger. It was so strong that I felt like gagging. Looking back, I wish that I had felt something watching us, or at least any indication that something was not right, so that we could have left or found somebody. I guess Charlie had heard stories about these things, cause I saw his face change from disgust to absolute fucking terror as the realization hit him. Oh fuck. In less than one second from him saying that, something went by so fast and tore him off that bike. I did not see it because I could barely process what the absolute fuck was going on. I was still on my bike staring at the place he was just on. Chills flooded my body so fast that my vision went black, even though my eyes were open. Then the adrenaline hit me, my brain pounding but I had no thoughts. I didn't scream. Then I fucking looked up. It was right there. So fucking close to me. It looked down at me because it was a huge maybe a couple of feet taller than me. I wish I could tell you I didn't get a good look. But it's always crystal clear in my memory. It was like a wolf but standing upright like a person. Its fur was matted and greasy and fucking disgusting. But that wasn't what I was looking at. It had... Charlie's face smiling at me. The closest thing I can describe my reaction to is when the people in Bird Box see the monsters. God, I'm crying writing this right now. The smile that he gave was pure evil but indescribable. Its mouth was way too big and it was smiling from ear to ear. Oh fuck, the eyes. They were pure black, but not glossy. At first, I couldn't even tell if he had eyes, but they were blacker than empty, if that even makes sense. It's very hard to describe this. It wasn't even taking a breath. It was just standing absolutely still. I could feel the strength radiating off of it, like a power not of this earth. There was no sign of Charlie anywhere. No screaming. Nothing. That's when I knew I was next. I knew it. I just fucking knew it. That I was gonna die. My eyes flooded, but it wasn't like I was crying. The pure fear and chills just made my tears run. Suddenly, it dashed away so quick. I felt and heard the air rush around me. I felt someone grab my shoulder. Hey kid. Are you okay? It was a fit guy in his mid 40s and his wife. I hadn't even heard them approach. Keep in mind that from Charlie saying, do you smell that? To this guy grabbing me on the shoulder was about a 10 second span. All the things I just described were the emotions that were flooding me in that time, not actual thoughts. Then it hit me. I couldn't speak. I was gasping for air. My head pounding, vision blurry. Are you okay, kid? I just cried, and I was trembling so hard the guy thought I was having a seizure. I don't remember leaving the trail. I just remember getting to the exit, then going to the hospital. Charlie is gone. After that, he went missing. But I know he's dead. They only found his bike completely destroyed. They did send a search party after him, but no one believed me. They think he just got lost or attacked by an animal. I went home. I've been diagnosed with PTSD now, and I'm having nightmares almost every night. My life has been completely destroyed by this, and I know nothing will ever be the same. I couldn't leave my house for a long time. The days after that I spent researching what that thing was. And the closest thing I guess would be a skinwalker. It's nice to know that I'm not the only one. And that people listening to this on YouTube can actually believe each other. Everyone thinks I'm fucking crazy. 
But I'm glad you who are listening to this believes what I'm saying. Have a good night and try not to think too much about skinwalkers. I think I encounter a skinwalker. I have no evidence, but I promise you all, this story is very real. I always been a bit of a skeptic ever since I was a kid. Scary stories don't faze me. Horror games don't frighten me. And whenever I hear something weird at night, I always assume it's something normal, an animal, or just the floorboards making noise. Despite this, something very strange happened to me the other day, and I'm really not sure what to make of it. I think it's the first time in years I actually got scared. I live in a forest area in the US. Me and my girlfriend live in a large cabin, and even though there are roads nearby, our nearest neighbors are at least a kilometer away. We also have two cats, one of which sleeps in the bedroom with us, while the other often goes out at night and does whatever cats do when they're out of sight. I like to stay up late at night and sleep late into the morning, where my girlfriend on the other hand is an early bird. It was about one in the morning and I was watching crappy TV in the living room while my girlfriend slept in the bedroom. I was beginning to grow tired when I heard something outside, near the cat flap. Just to clarify, our cat flap uses a chip so only our cats can use it. I assumed it was just one of the cats coming into or leaving the house, and I ignored it. Then I heard the noise again. It sounded like something was hitting against the flat. It happened several times at random intervals until I lost my patience and decided to just go and open the door. Clearly, the cat was having trouble getting in, right? I never thought about it at the time, but this was weird because we feed our cats well and they're very lean rather than chubby. I passed the bedroom and peered in as I walked past it to see if my girlfriend heard the noises, but she was fast asleep but the cat that sleeps with us was staring at the window. I called her name, nothing. She kept staring. I shrugged it off and kept heading towards the kitchen. The back doors are through there, by the way. So I reached the back door and saw a dark shape through the flap. I was then expecting the cat to be out there. It took me a moment to open the door and I saw the cat tense up as I opened the door. The door opened fully. I froze. It wasn't my cat. Whatever it was had started moving before I opened up, and I only caught a glimpse of a distorted figure, kind of like a tailless dog, bolting, and I mean absolutely pelting it. I freaked out and slammed the door shut. What the hell was it? I wasn't sure. My natural instincts kicked in, and I assumed it was just my other cat, and I had merely startled it. Perhaps the darkness had made it appear larger. Nevertheless, I was creeped out and decided to go to sleep. As I slipped into bed, I realized something horrifying. The second cat was asleep on the rug. It took a while to get to sleep that night. Everything seemed normal until a few hours later. I awoke to a strange feeling of dread. Something wasn't right. My girlfriend was fast asleep. I held my breath and heard something creaking by the door. It sounded too loud to be one of the cats. It sounded like if a person was walking about. I reached towards my bedside cabinet and flicked on the lamp. The room was illuminated and I saw something standing just outside the open door staring at me. The same twisted figure I had spotted outside earlier. It wasn't very tall, maybe a little over 5 feet, but it was its face that scared me the most. I only caught a glimpse of it, but what I saw will stay with me forever. It looked like a dog, 
but its face was elongated and almost human-like eyes. You know that weird distorted snarl noises that dogs pull when they're pissed off? It had that expression. I instantly started yelling profanities as I scrabbled backwards trying to straighten up. The creature turned and sprinted down the hall. I heard it dash outside and go past the window behind us, just above the headboard. I managed to look out as my girlfriend started to panic as she woke up fully. We both caught a glimpse of whatever the hell this thing was as it dashed off into the woods near our home. Grabbing my trusty shotgun from beneath the bed, as well as a couple of rounds from the ammunition box that sits next to it, I ran out of the room in my underwear and rounded into the kitchen. The door was open. I had forgot to lock it when I saw the thing originally. I haven't seen it since, and we still live in the same cabin. But I have bought sturdy locks for all of the main doors and windows in the house, and I always check the exit points at night. I also go to bed a bit earlier than I used to, so I'm asleep when the freaks of the night start to wake up. I have been reading, and I have came across a bunch of forums and articles, and the only thing I can compare it to, based on what I saw, is that it was a skinwalker. If you know anything about these things, please let me know. Also, one more thing. Please stop leaving your cats or dogs outside at night. Or bring them back inside before it gets dark. If you don't, who knows? Maybe next time the dog or cat you bring back inside might actually be a skinwalker. Before I begin, I'm 16 years old and I'm a male. About three years ago, I was in Virginia visiting family over summer. We were right outside the DC area and staying in a two-story house near the freeway. On the other side of the freeway was a forest. So my mom, her boyfriend Eric, and I were all staying with Eric's parents. We had brought some night vision binoculars and decided that tonight was the perfect time to use them. So after dinner, we gear up and head out. We pass under the freeway and head into the woods. When we get about five minutes into the forest, we set down our bag and take out our binoculars. My mom looks around with them for a while seeing a few squirrels here and there. She gets tired of them and passes them to me. I look around for a while, being careful not to look at the freeway for fear of being blinded. I spot something behind a tree about 50 feet to our left. I concentrate on it, trying to figure out what it is. It looks like a pale, bald, anorexic man looking straight at us from behind the tree. I get a bit uneasy but I'm hesitant to believe it's actually there. I ask Eric to take a look just in case. To my despair he sees it too. He describes it much the same way I did. Now Eric, a former amateur boxer and I train MMA almost every day, but neither of us wants to stick around with that thing. We start heading back to the house, crossing under the freeway. We take another look behind us as a car comes by. All three of us see glowing eyes lit up by headlights on the other side of the freeway. We say fuck that and head back to the house. When we get back, Eric's parents are asleep, and my mom and Eric go upstairs to the guest room. There's only one guest room, so I have the couch downstairs. I'm a little too excited after seeing the thing in the woods, so I end up staying up all night. Around 3 a.m., I'm watching TV 
and start hearing footsteps above me. I quickly remember our earlier encounter and panic a little. I try to calm down and tell myself it's just one of the dogs or maybe someone who couldn't sleep. I keep hearing the footsteps for a while until I hear a doorknob jiggle. I find it weird that they're trying to open a locked door but try to ignore it. They stop, walk around for a few more minutes and then it's quiet again. I stay up until the sun starts coming up and then pass out. My mom wakes me up and I remember the footsteps from the night before. I describe what happened and ask if one of them got up at any time. She says no and I think it must have been one of the dogs. That is until she tells me the room above me is the office. No one was in the office and the door stays locked at night. My heart sinks as I piece it all together. I don't know if it was that thing for sure, but I think it was. I done a lot of research, trying to figure out what that thing was that night. I found two creatures that seemed to match it. I think it was either a skinwalker or a wendigo. Whichever one it was, I'm just thankful that door was locked. I know I wouldn't be able to fight that thing, no matter how tough. I am. To start the story off and to give a little insight about me, I'm an 18 year old female who grew up in Michigan and have lived in the country for as long as I can remember. And just a heads up, this is a long story so bear with me. Now. Back to the story. On one hot summer weekend, me and a couple of friends, including my boyfriend, let's call him Tony, and my older brother, let's call him Brad, decided we were going to go camping for the weekend since it was such a nice warm week. Tony's parents had owned the cabin surrounded by a huge wooded area with a personal lake and no neighbors for at least four miles. But being stupid teenagers, we didn't really think about that. All we were ready for was to party like any normal teen would. Well, after being there for two hours, our fun had started. Tony's friends had brought tons of alcohol and weed to last us the whole weekend. So we wouldn't be bored since we had no service and only movies to watch. After it got around 12 a.m. and was pitch black, we had a huge bonfire going. It was a total of six people, including me and Tony. As we talked and laughed about upcoming events in our lives, we were so distracted that we didn't notice that my brother had literally frozen his eyes onto one section of the woods. Mind you, we were all intoxicated and high at that time. Eventually, our talking ceased when Tony realized his friend and my brother had an emotionless expression. Hey dude, you alright? He asked Brad. Silence. Brad didn't reply or even make any movements that would indicate he heard him. After that, I started to get scared as well as the other two girls there. It took a lot for my brother to act that way. Eventually, I was the first to catch on that he was excessively staring into a certain spot in the woods. I turned my head and followed his gaze the best I could. And when I finally caught on to what he was staring at, my heart dropped. There was, right fucking there, was, at first look, a dog. At least, that's what I thought. It was some person's dog that wandered off. But then, my brain kicked in, and I realized there wasn't neighbors for miles. So, how could there be a dog? My mind started to race while Tony still tried to get Brad to speak or even move. Then, in one motion, this thing stood up tall. And when I say tall, I mean fucking gigantic. It had to be at least six feet tall. Everyone now saw it. 
How could you not? The other two girls and the other boy with us were shocked as they finally grasped why my brother was as still as a stick. No one moved for what seemed like hours. Tony was the first to talk. No tell. He mumbled. No one heard what he said but Brad. And I swear to you, when I say his eyes widen as big as pan saucers, that freaked me out immediately. What did you say? One of the girls asked. It has no fucking tell. He hissed at her. My heartbeat stopped. He was right. There was no tell on this thing. My clouded alcohol mind cleared up in a fraction of a second when I finally realized what this thing was. Now I understood why my brother was basically shitting his pants. This thing was a skinwalker. My instincts kicked in right then and there, but before I could nope the fuck out of there, the thing let out a terrible stench like rotting meat before screaming inhuman like. The sound was enough to scare the fuck out of everyone. My brother was the first up out of his chair and started shouting native words to the creature while I told everyone to get the fuck inside. No one questioned me when they saw just how dead serious I was, especially Tony. He's never seen me so scared, so he knew it was a bad situation. We all hightailed into the cabin with my brother behind us, still shouting native words at the creature, which seemed to keep it at bay. Wow, it gave us enough time to get inside. He slammed and locked the door before turning all the lights off and grabbing a special ash from the kitchen counters and started throwing it at every window and door while chanting. Of course, he had everyone freaked out and basically in tears at that moment. After he was done, no one said a word for a long time, all of us still in shock. He grabbed our dad's pistol and had it posted by him for hours. Everyone was entirely shaken up to even question what happened. We must have fallen asleep eventually because I woke up to my brother packing all our stuff into the two cars early in the morning. I understood why. We had native family. We knew what we were dealing with and we knew it would come back and maybe not alone. Before we left, I did a blessing on the cabin and spoke a few calming words to the still very freaked out girls. We left as soon as everything was packed up. To this day, we still haven't explained exactly to our friends what happened that night. But they have also never bothered to ask us. When we first moved into my grandpa's old cabin, I had a few obvious reasons to be afraid. First of all, I was 12 years old. Second, we moved in because our old house had burned down while we were away on vacation. And finally, my grandpa was a sick, old man. Not in the sense that he had some sort of illness. Well, I suppose he did. But that illness is what ended up killing him, giving us that forsaken cabin, but in the sense that he was batshit insane. When I was younger, my grandfather would tell me horrible stories about the cabin he lived in and the woods around it. He would tell me stories of the natives who lived in the forest, something about them being cursed by God for worshipping false gods being turned into the trees themselves. If you look closely, while not looking at all, my sadistic grandpa would say that you can still see the trees move, and if you listen carefully, you could even hear them singing their worship for their false gods. I, of course, assumed he was just crazy and was trying to scare me from wandering off in the woods and possibly also to motivate me to go to church. But still, since I was eight freaking years old and all, I would sometimes see a branch twitch in the wind, 
or hear the faint noise of a distant animal and I would worry it was one of the natives that my grandpa would go crazy over. But of course, the stories didn't finish there. Not only was this cabin the original home to a clan of witches, but also home to a cannibal and at least two serial killers and a family that used to worship the devil. To make the whole illusion complete, my grandpa made up a story how he won the cabin in a game of Russian roulette against one of the previous owners. All of these stories never truly scared me. They terrified me when I thought about one of them too much. But I was actually never fearful of the stories being true. Well, except for one story that my grandfather told me. He said before the cabin was built that the natives used the area for human sacrifices, offering up human flesh and blood not only for their gods, but for creatures they believed that dwelled in the woods. These creatures, my grandfather would say, were known by many names in all kinds of folklore. Wendigos, the Jersey Devil, Demons, White Walkers, Skinwalkers, the Goat Man. But my grandpa would always call them Marchard de Poule. It's French for Skinwalker. These beings of divine or mystical power were known to feed off anything from human flesh and blood to a human soul or even fear itself. The skinwalker would stalk their prey throughout the woods they inhabited if the sacrifice given was not enough to feed their hunger. They always attacked groups of people, never a single person. That's the reason why my grandfather said that he lived alone. The skinwalkers would play with their food often turning their form to look human to trick and torment anyone they sought to feed off before finally killing them. My grandfather said once they finished feeding off of anyone unlucky enough, they would peel the skin from bone and wear it like a suit, often visiting the families of the dead to further torment mankind. The reason the story scared me so much was because I truly believed I saw one. When I was eight, I was playing in the backyard of the cabin. My grandfather sitting on the back porch, smoking his pipe and humming some old tune. He told me he was going to go inside and fetch some more tobacco, and he warned me not to go too close to the woods. I nodded and kept doing whatever I was doing at the time. After a few minutes, I felt the air around me turn cold and everything seemed to get heavier and I began to smell something like pennies and the cold grew stronger. I realized it smelled exactly like blood. I felt a chill run up my spine and I nearly gagged on the metallic taste that lingered in my mouth. I was about to stand and move back inside the cabin when I heard a soft laugh faintly beyond the tree line. I realized it sounded just like my own laugh but now I was already scared. So scared I could hardly move at all. The smell of copper grew so strong that I thought I might pass out. But then, just out of the corner of my eye, I saw something move. I swaddled my spit and slowly turned to see a little boy standing just in front of the forest. I was almost relieved until I saw his eyes. They were pure white with no pupil just pure white. I felt my knees buckle under me and my lip began to quiver when it smiled at me. But when it smiled, the teeth were missing and it was just a set of black, rotting gums that I could smell from several yards away. It lurked ahead, doubling over, seeming to hack and gag and laugh all at the same time. Then, it bent backward placing its hands on the ground and looked at me from between its legs. I swear I could hear bones break and crack as it began to crawl backwards into the forest, all the while making this gagging, laughing sound. That's when I passed out and wet my pants. I woke up a few minutes later from my grandfather gently shaking me up 
The smell had magically disappeared and there was no evidence of the creature I had saw just a few minutes ago. I told my grandfather what I had saw and he grew so pale he almost looked like the little boy's eyes. He drove me back to my house, not saying a word the whole way. I told my parents what happened and I was assured I must have just fell asleep and dreamed the whole thing. So eventually, that's what I convinced myself had happened. It still haunted my dreams, but I was convinced it was my imagination and my grandfather's old stories were just getting to me. But then, we moved into my grandfather's cabin. Since we had lost all of our belongings in the fire, we had nothing to unpack. Even though I had convinced myself that I dreamed what I saw all those years ago, I was still worried about living there for an extended period of time. My parents let me watch some movies we rented while they were cleaning the cabin that had been vacant since my grandfather died when I was 10. Eventually, I dozed off. I woke up on the couch a bit surprised I had fallen asleep for so long. As I rubbed the sleep from my eyes, I became aware of the tapping that was coming from the front door, almost as if someone was knocking with their fingertips. Even though I had no real idea what it was, I got up to check on it. Then, I smelled it again, that heavy, thick, bloody smell that had lingered in the back of my mind for four years. It got so cold so fast I could see my own breath. I felt my heart thumping in my chest and that same shiver run up my spine. I was so scared in that moment I thought I was going to break down and start crying. Then the tapping stopped. Then the smell grew worse. Beyond the front door I heard something gag and cough and laugh at the same time. My knees buckled and my lip quivered just like they did the first time. I became vaguely aware that I was slowly backing away from the door when I tripped and fell back onto the couch. Then I passed out again. Again, like the first time, I woke up from a hand gently shaking me away. I woke up and realized it was my dad looking down at me. It looked like he was out of breath, but I was so relieved he was there and that the tapping on the door was all a dream. I then smiled at him and he tried to do the same, but he only managed to get one side of his lips curled up. I was about to ask what was wrong when he scooped me up in his arms and told me in a hoarse voice that he was carrying me to my bed. His arms were so cold they felt like metal, but I didn't care and I was already falling asleep again. He brought me to my room and laid me down in bed. His eyes were already closed and my mind was about to drift off. He leaned down and I felt his cold breath on my ear as my mind shut down and he pulled away. And just before I fell back into sweet sleep, I heard my dad begin to cough. A few hours passed and I woke up again. I grew scared when I remembered the tapping on the door. But soon felt better when I remembered that it must have been a dream. And was thankful my dad woke me up to carry me to my room. I sat up in bed, still just a bit scared. I looked around my room. Realizing that this was the first time I actually seen it since I had fallen asleep on the couch Before I even had a chance to check out my new room. It was almost pitch black So I could hardly see anything. I gazed over to the wall and saw a mirror It was hard to see but I could make out my face and my upper body I smiled at myself and saw my reflection smile back at me satisfied I went back to sleep. In the morning, my dad again gently shook me awake. He said good morning and asked what I wanted for breakfast. I told him what I wanted and then thanked him for carrying me to the bed the night before. He looked at me, confused, and told me that he didn't. But I wasn't listening anymore because when I looked at the wall, just as I had looked at it last night, I realized there wasn't a mirror in my room, only a window.
Do you love Native American legends? Have you heard of the goat man? No? Then please, allow me to enlighten you. I heard the legend when a power outage on our reservation made us decide to have a fire. As we all know, nothing goes better with a good fire than a good story. That's where I learned about the goat man. The legend goes that they shapeshift. They love human forms most of all, which is what makes them so dangerous. It's also said that if you find a bone of one, take a picture and keep it in your house, it will wait. For what though, you may ask? The answer is they wait for you to leave. Once you leave, they ransack the place until they find what you took from them. There was even an incident about that night that I heard of where some people met the goat man face to face. It was a night like the one I was experiencing. Some men had decided to have a fire in the desert and they told some stories about it. Then a stranger walked out of the desert and took a seat, never speaking a word. No one really got a good look at the stranger. One man brought up the legend of the goat man, causing the stranger to listen a little more closely. At the end, the other men nervously laughed, and the stranger stayed silent. The men decided to go back to their homes and put out the fire. They didn't have enough room for the stranger, and they figured he could hitchhike back to town. They had just left when they saw something chasing after their truck. Afraid, they sped up and the creature sped up its pursuit as well. When it reached the truck, it flipped over and dragged three men off into the night. What happened to them? Well, they were never found. So here I am to warn you and to be careful of the goat man. They can shapeshift, didn't I tell you? That homeless man begging for change that you encounter on your way home tonight could be one or your boss teacher or even your friend this happened about a week and a half ago I live in Washington state I'm a 14 year old male I'm homeschooled so I don't leave the house much and I'll live with my mom and my dad. It was March 7, 2022 at about 12 a.m. I was just listening to the old Jenna Marbles and Julian podcast from like three years ago and playing some video games. I was kind of tired and I had just finished eating a snack. So I went to go brush my teeth and wash my face. I did all my business in the bathroom and came back to my room. When I opened the door, my cat was up in his cat tower, which is right next to my window. And his back was arched up. His hair on his back was all up and he was hissing, which I had never heard him do. I look out the window and standing there is my dad. This gave me a relief for a second until I realized it wasn't my dad. It was taller than my dad, and its smile was weirdly big. My dad never just smiles at me, and he's never came up to my window before. What the fuck is that? I said as I ran out my room, crying and shaking. Obviously, because i never seen anything like that before. I went to my mom who was sleeping on the couch, and I shook her awake. I told her to go check if my dad was in the bedroom and she asked why and I told her I would tell her after she checked and indeed he was sleeping in the bedroom. I told her what happened and she sort of believed me but sort of didn't. So she went into my room and checked out my window. Whatever it was was gone. She checked all the other windows and doors and nothing was there. She even grabbed my cat and we slept on the couch that night, all together. Today was the first day I was able to go back into my room, March 17th. 
and I still haven't told my dad about it. I have no idea what it was that I saw, but the only thing I can think of is that it was a skinwalker. Anyway, I don't think I'll ever be able to forget this, and I'm still terrified that I'm going to end up seeing it again. It's crazy. I looked behind my shoulder like 10 times while writing this. What the fuck? Two years ago, I went to go visit family up in North Minnesota around Labor Day weekend. I won't give the exact location, but we'll provide at least a general location where this happened. To keep it short, I'm hoping someone may have had similar experience or may have had a general idea what this theme or entity was walking around our tent. On that Labor Day weekend, my girlfriend and I were planning on spending time camping with her family. Both of us were very excited to get away from the everyday city life and we anticipated a much needed low key weekend. We arrived at their location around noon on Saturday and were all greeted by everyone there. During the day and evening, we were enjoying ourselves with random fun activities and catching up on how everyone was doing. As the night started to settle in, we were all near the campfire for a few hours until 11 p.m. Eventually, the family and ourselves called it a night and we all headed to bed. My girlfriend and I were offered to sleep in a bigger size six person tent. It belonged to a relative who I will call Mary. It was a kind gesture at that time as we only brought a two person sized tent. Having that additional space for our belongings and our air mattress was a nice added feature. Mary's tent was positioned not too far from the campfire and the rest of the family. The family did a wonderful job clearing and maintaining the area for their smaller RVs and additional tents. To the back of the tent about 20 to 30 yards is where the wood started with semi-thick brush and trees. Us three were laying down chatting and eventually they both fell asleep. For some reason though, I couldn't sleep, so I was on my phone passing time hoping to eventually drift off to sleep. This is when I heard a faint noise in the woods about 40 yards back. I dismissed it right away, as deer are known in this area, and I continued to space off on my phone looking at random things. About 10 to 20 minutes later, I heard something get closer to our tent. I could hear twigs snapping and moving between bushes getting closer to our area. This started to get my attention as I could start physically feeling a faint shake in the ground as this thing was wandering around. Moments later, this thing was about 10 yards away from our area, walking, running back and forth. Whatever this thing was, with each step it took, I could physically feel the vibration from the ground. This thing was big, and the best way to describe this feeling is if you went to a live rock concert and you felt the kick drum hit your body. At this point, I was a bit terrified as I was trying to follow the footsteps, walking or running at the back and the side of the tent. This thing got at least five yards near our area, and then suddenly, it stopped where Mary was sleeping at, near her tent. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up, scared of what this thing was going to do next. I shit you not, a few seconds later, Mary shot up from being dead asleep. She gasped for air and was calling our names to wake us up. You could hear her voice, she was terrified. This thing hightailed off back into the woods. Both of us were very startled at this point. The woods had become dead silent and eventually we got enough courage to look outside. We saw and heard nothing 
And about 30 minutes later, we ran to the shop to grab a shotgun. Another anomaly during this whole thing, while we were alert and awake, Mary mentioned during this time I was awake that she was having a dream. She mentioned these things were tormenting her, saying they wanted her soul and to give it to them. My girlfriend dismissed the whole thing and said it was most likely just a deer, etc., running around. After hearing my girlfriend say that, I never told anyone about this story until recently, as I started to think about it again, trying to figure out what the hell this thing or entity was. I am Navajo. We had an incident with an unwelcome visitor in our home. Here's what happened. My cousin is sleeping over. He's the same age as me. We're both 13 at this time. We're in my room talking and hanging out. It is around maybe 11 p.m. It is a pleasant summer evening, so my window is wide open. It's also pretty dark outside, and my dad is in the living room watching TV. But as always, he's dozed off on the couch. My mom has already gone to bed. My cousin and I are keeping it down, but we're not ready yet to call it a night. All of a sudden, we hear the screen door to the front of the house open and slam shut. We think it's my dad. My mom, she tells us the next day she hears footsteps on the carpet. Whoever it is, she says, goes through her room and towards the bathroom. So she naturally assumes it's my dad. Then she realizes that she's unable to move as if she's paralyzed. Still in my room, my cousin and I again hear the screen door open and slam, only this time more loud. It wakes up my dad and he comes to my bedroom to check on us. Finding us both there, he wants to know which one of my friends just slipped out of the house. It takes a few minutes, but we convince him we were by ourselves and that we thought it was him going in and out. I can see by the look on his face, he's not really buying it. But he has to admit, we don't seem to be lying. He then leaves, and as he's closing the door to my room, he tells us to stay out of trouble and go to sleep. All we could do is shrug. The next morning, my mom tells us about what she heard and how she could not move. She also tells us that the second time the door slams, she then hears what sounds like a horse galloping by her bedroom window. She then has all of us pray, and now, every year, we hike up the mountain to a high point and we pray for protection from evil. This event happened just south of Polaca, Arizona within the Navajo reservation. A pair of skinwalkers, they say an old couple that lived deep back in the reservation were seen lurking around this small cattle ranch. Two heifers had disappeared recently, one of which was discovered down by the creek and mutilated. The man who owned the ranch, his two sons and his brother armed themselves and went out to try to run them off. One of the sons, not yet 18 years of age, was searching out beyond the barn when a dark shape materializing from the darkness itself loomed up in front of him, almost nose to nose. As the boy attempted to raise his rifle, the figure raised its hands up to its face as if it was going to yell something. The boy, trying not to look at it in the eyes, then felt something rush into his face, like dust or sand. Even though he tried not to, he ended up taking a breath, and some of it 
was inhaled in. Immediately, things went dark and he started experiencing hallucinations. The others found him only minutes later, on his knees, holding the sides of his head, and his eyes rolled back. He fell to the ground and went into some sort of trance. His body limped and he became unresponsive. They carried him back to the house and they summoned the local medicine man who came and said some prayers over him. But he told the others there was nothing to be done but to wait for the dust, traces of which were still on his face and his shirt to wear off. He promised he would come back the next day when the sun was up and blessed the Hogan. Later, after he had regained consciousness, the boy swore to the others that he was the victim of a dog-faced creature. He described it as not quite as tall as he is, thin and scraggly, with patches of mangy and dark hair, a canine snout only shorter than a dog's, and with the smell of rotten eggs or worse. He said he doesn't recall anything more before passing out other than not being able to breathe and having no control over his own body. I was only 17 at the time. On this specific night, I woke up feeling thirsty. I'm just lying there, staring into the dark and deciding if it's worth the effort to get up and get something to drink. I'm sure we all been in that situation plenty of times before. So tonight, when you're in bed and you're questioning if you should get up and get some water, remember this story. So all I can hear is the clock ticking down the hallway and the muted silence. It's just way too quiet. I check the time on my cell phone. It's a few minutes short of 2.30 a.m. I then decide to sit up and get out the bed. I then make my way towards the door of my bedroom. It's really dark. I go down the hallway towards the kitchen. As I get out to the living room, I chance to look to my right and in the direction of the front door to the house. The only light is coming from a street light that is down at the end of the property and not all that far away. There, at the inside of the door, inside the house, I see this figure standing there. Its face at first appears human, then serpent-like, and then back to human, as if it can't decide how it wants to present itself to me. For some reason, I'm just standing there taking this all in. I'm not afraid, but I don't feel like I have any control over my senses either. And I'm not sure if I could move or have said anything, even if I wanted to, which at the time, I can't say I did. As the two of us are standing face to face, he assumes his human features. His face is fully painted, a thick stripe of black across his eyes and the rest white. He has a feather woven into the hair at the top of his head. He looks young, not much older than me. He is bare chested, not real muscular, but definitely cut. His torso is painted red. His lower half is covered in what looks to be khaki colored pants, well worn and faded, cut off and frayed just below the knees. He is barefooted, but his wrists and ankles are wrapped with animal skin of some sort. It is hairy and light, colored like that of a coyote. He doesn't say anything to me, not aloud anyway, but I do hear his words in my head. Although for the life of me, I can't remember any of it. It's as if he at the same time with this cold stare of his, is pinching away layers of my memory. I do remember wondering why he is in my house, 
and having the idea that he was expecting to find someone else. Just then, without even thinking about it, my cell phone in my hand, I began dialing 911. With the phone ringing, I look back to the painted stranger. He gives me a thin smile and vanishes through the door, which by the way, is closed and locked. To the other side, I hear what sounds like a horse galloping away. I move over to the door and pull it open. I see this figure taking long strides across my yard, away from the light and out into the street. There's a car parked on the other side. He goes around to the passenger side, ducks down and into the car, and it drives off. It all happens in a matter of seconds. I then realize there's a police operator talking back to me from the phone. I tell her there was someone in my house, but I leave out the part about his changing appearance and leaving through a closed door. The operator, or whoever she was, tells me not to worry about it. She says that I'm not the first caller of this kind on this night. She tells me to say a prayer, telling me that she too is Navajo and to go back to bed and that I won't be bothered by it anymore. This story comes from a friend of mine. It's a true experience. He told me this, and I simply have to tell it. My friend is a Native American. He's part of a tribe who settled the Pacific Northwest coast. He's quite the character. For one, he is 6'10 and has the blackest eyes you could imagine. He always has this frowning face going on, which makes him even more intimidating but he's everything but a bad guy. In fact, he is the most gentle of all giants. He was working at a gas station up north back in 1992, and he pretty much always worked the graveyard shift from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. when he was relieved. Business wasn't exactly booming at night, so he was always watching TV or reading magazines between customers, and they were only a few. The area he lived and worked in was deeply associated with all things Native American. There was a sense of pride in the surrounding communities, but also a very distinct presence of superstition and old traditions. My friend was no exception. He was a firm believer of the ways of the old. This made his encounter that I'm about to tell you about more terrifying. One night, he was sitting as usual, watching TV when a customer entered the gas station. The customer paid for his gas, a pack of smokes, and some soda, and then returned to his car. Nothing strange, nothing out of the ordinary. But as my friend looked out the window towards the customer's car, he spotted what looked like a huge dog sitting by the edge of the woods. Now. The window is located on the side of the building, some distance from the sliding door, overlooking the pumps and the roof covering it. On the sides of the roof are pretty strong lights, which shine into the gas station. This gives the gas station not only some eerie lights, with the blinds casting long, striped shadows, but also blinds the teller to an extent. As he peered through the window trying to focus on the dog, it was now gone. He didn't think much of it, even if it was a wolf. He was inside, and these animals don't tend to rob gas stations at night. However, wolves are common here, but this one wolf was fucking huge. He brushed it off and returned to his mindless watching of the TV. A couple of hours go by and not a single customer has entered since the last one. He was just about to refill some condiments when he heard a loud noise coming from the back. It was in inside, he could hear that, but it came from the back and from behind the building that they keep the garbage. The gas station had been visited before by scavenging homeless, but my friend didn't really care. It was in his garbage, and it was just garbage. 
let them take it, but it kept getting noisier. He decided to grab a flashlight and a gun from the office and circle around the back to tell whoever ventured there to leave, as he's had enough. His presence alone would have scared off anyone, but he wanted to feel safe just in case. He exited through the sliding doors, walking past the window he was just sitting by. As he turned the corner, he shines the light towards the dumpsters. As the cone of light hits the dumpsters, my friend instantly drops the flashlight and the gun. It's the huge dog he saw before going through the garbage. It wasn't a dog. It clearly stood on its hind legs, reaching the same height as himself. It couldn't be a bear. The creature's eyes had been glowing in the light of the flashlight, making it even more terrifying. He quickly ran inside the gas station, and he wasn't followed. He locked the door, stayed inside the whole night, and quit the next day. My friend is still convinced that he saw a skinwalker, a shape-shifting demon of sorts that are a common occurrence in Native American lore and culture. I do apologize for the absence of blood, but believe me, this is a really creepy, true story. This story happened when I was 12. I currently live on the Navajo Res. However, I used to live in a remote area in a trailer, and for some background, about where I live, the only town near me was a 45 minute drive. We would always run into town for some food when we would have family visit. We always started to drive back when the sun was starting to go down, which meant that our headlight was the only source of light. One day we did the usual, but on the way back, this time something seemed off. It felt like we were being watched. Me being the bored 12 year old, I put my earbuds in and looked out the window. As I was looking out the window, I saw a black shadow by the car. Then suddenly, a harsh smell came through my open window. I'm not sure how to describe the smell, but now that I think about it, I know this is going to sound crazy, but it smelled like death. As I focused more on this shadow, I recognized that it looked like a dog. I then hurried and closed my windows with a sense of fear and panic, tears forming in my eyes knowing that we were being followed by a skinwalker. I told my mom, who soon pressed the gas, since she also smelled the bad stench as well. The sting was following us, and after a few seconds, the figure and the smell disappeared. Thinking that we were finally safe, we arrived home. When we got off the vehicle, the smell suddenly came back. Then, we heard rustling in the woods beside our home. We then rushed inside, and in the midst of all this, our dog started to bark and growl. We finally made it inside, shut the doors, shut the blinds, the curtains, and my mom said a prayer. At this point, I was so scared that I started to cry as we put the groceries away, ignoring what was outside. Out of the whole chaos and everything going on, I didn't even realize the smell was gone. A few hours passed and everything seemed to go back to normal. The dog stopped barking and we were all getting ready to go to sleep. As I was laying down, thinking about what we had just experienced, I heard a big noise on our roof. It sounded like something big and heavy had jumped on the roof and then footsteps like if someone or something was walking back and forth. Then the footsteps stopped and I kid you not, the most loudest banging noise in the roof like I never heard before. At this point, everyone had already woken up. We all got up and ran to my parents' room. By that time, my father already had his 2020 gun. My father loaded it and went outside looking for the creature or whatever it was. Me being the stubborn person that I am, even now, never listening when they said to stay in, as I wanted to be where my father was at. So of course I followed him outside and was on the front porch steps. That's when I felt an urge to look up, and as I did, I saw red eyes. 
looking back at me. I screamed as my dad started to shoot at the creature. My father then screamed at me to run inside, and I did, with him running right behind me. As we were inside, we heard footsteps and loud noises in the roof all night. We also all ended up staying in the same room. I'm not sure what else happened that night, as I remember waking up the next day, and we found one of my dogs dead, and footprints in the dirt that seemed to turn from a cow to a human as you follow the footsteps. And from that point forward, I never went against what my parents tell me again. I was on an assignment for the army, making my way up from San Antonio, Texas to Tacoma, Washington. It was a long drive and they gave me six days to report to my new unit, but I didn't mind. I love road trips. There is nothing like the freedom of exploring the world by yourself. The first day of my journey, I planned to get as much driving in as possible so I could spend a few days in Utah. A sort of mini vacation, you could say. This was January and the days were short, so maximizing the amount of daylight I had was crucial. I got up extra early that morning, carried the last of my bags out to my Corolla, signed out of my old unit and hit the road at roughly 5 a.m. It was an amazing day. I saw the landscape transform around me as I went further west than I had ever been in my life. From the San Antonio metropolitan area to the savannas of the Edwards Plateau to the Pancake Flat farmland of the Great Plains region, America's head basket. Finally, the farms opened up into prairie and I saw the Welcome to New Mexico, the land of enchantment sign. Now I really was in the middle of nowhere. Continuing on US Route 380, I eventually found myself in Roswell. I could have gone in a few more hours of driving in and made it to Albuquerque, but I figured since I was in no rush, I might as well see what Roswell had to offer. Who knows if I would get a chance to visit again. As a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious, as Mr. Baldwin would say, I took a self-guided tour of the shops and attractions. The next day, I continued to Albuquerque, then westward on Interstate 40. By the time I reached Gallup and started northbound on US Route 491, I still had two hours of driving left before crossing the border into Colorado and another 45 minutes before I would get to Cortez, my planned stop for the night. However, my daylight was already running out as sunset was at 6 p.m. I got Starbucks and refreshed myself for the final stretch. It was supposed to be easy, just a straight shot, but looking back on it now, I figured that had I decided to stop in Albuquerque, instead of Roswell the night previous, I would have already been in Colorado by now and possibly be making my way into Utah. I would have saved myself from what was waiting for me on that desolated highway. Route 491 stretched far into the Navajo Nation. On either side of me were endless expanses of prairie bookended by dark indigo mountains on the horizon. To my left, the sky glowed a faint orange purple, the light slowly dying down like embers in a fire until finally plunging the land into darkness. Every now and then, I would see the forlorn headlights of another car passing by, which gave me a bit of relief that I wasn't alone. I also had my road trip playlist on to keep me company 
and call me ironic, but Hotel California was plain. After passing the small, lonely town of Newcomb, the next piece of civilization would be Shiprock. However, between the two was a 36 mile stretch of absolute nothingness, an abyss I had to cross, and I was not ready for what I was about to witness. After several miles and having not seen another car on the road, I saw something strange emerge from the horizon, barely lit by the moonlight. I thought it was a road sign at first. Then, as I came closer, I realized it was a person walking on the shoulder of the road, heading in my direction. I squinted, trying my hardest to focus on the figure. In the darkness, I could tell they were wearing a poncho of some sort, with long, black hair flowing down past their chest. Who could be walking out here, all alone, at night, I thought. Whoever it was, they had no lights, no reflectors, no strobes of any kind to signal to passing vehicles that they were there. And they walked on the pavement, dangerously close to oncoming traffic. I pulled to the left a bit, giving them a wide berth. Suddenly, my stereo cut out, as if I had turned it off. The screen went completely dark and my phone disconnected from Bluetooth. While this was unusual, it did happen from time to time, so I thought nothing of it. As I approached, I saw the person raise their right arm, as if to flag me down and hitch a ride. No, 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 I thought. There's no way that's happening, buddy. As my headlights swept by, I realized it was a man dressed in a button-up shirt, a poncho, jeans, and cowboy boots. His large belt buckle glinted as the lights passed him, but in that split second, I realized with shock that not only were his eyes painfully wide open, but they seemed to be tracking me. Somehow, he was able to see me through the glare of my headlights and look me dead in the eyes, not breaking contact until I passed. I was shaken for a bit, but my nerves gradually subsided. My stereo turned back on, and my music continued playing. I brushed everything off as simply my imagination. The darkness and the shadows playing tricks on my mind. Besides, the man was behind me. I figured he must have been drunk. Indian reservations, sadly, had high rates of alcoholism. I looked in my rear view mirror and he was gone. I couldn't see him. Maybe he's too far behind me? No, that couldn't be. It must be too dark. Maybe. I drove on trying to figure out what just happened but at the same time forcing myself not to think about it. Just when I thought I had moved on I saw another shape in the distance, getting closer, I realized it was another figure. Another person walking alone at night? There's no way. They walked along the shoulder of the road, swaying back and forth. Slowly, I could make out that this person, then I saw what looked like long black hair reaching down past the chest. No, there's no way. It was the man, the same man, but how? The man raised his arm again, trying to flag me down. What does this guy want? I kept up my pace, with no intention of stopping for any reason. Just like last time, my stereo turned off again. Suddenly, the man leaped out into the road, arms waving frantically. I swerved into the left lane narrowly avoiding him. In my headlights, I noticed he had the same wide-eyed look, his gaze locked into mine. I also saw that his clothes did not look as they did on the first encounter. 
Once they were clean, if not well worn, but now they were soiled and tattered, rags barely hanging onto his withered frame. His hair was wild and unkempt, with clods of dry dirt stuck in the locks, but his eyes remained the same. My heart nearly burst through my chest at the sudden shock. Hyperventilating, I slowed down and glanced into the rear view mirror to make sure he was alright. Nothing could have prepared me for what I was about to see. The man was running and he was sprinting towards me. I centered the wheel and accelerated, hoping to get as much distance from him as possible. But as I continued to speed up, so did he. Faster and faster I drove, but every time I looked in the mirror, I would still see him right behind me, perfectly keeping pace, his body tinted red by my tail lights. I could feel my head throbbing and my hands getting slick with sweat on the steering wheel. I was sick to my stomach. There's no way I looked forward, hoping to see a faint glimmer of light from the town ahead but I was still too far away. I looked back at the rear view mirror and the man was gone. I should have been relieved, but I knew better. Where did he go? I looked around, hoping to regain a visual on him. I couldn't see anything. Taking a deep breath, I refocused on the road, but kept my guard up. Just keep driving, I told myself, only it a few more miles to go. Out of the corner of my right eye, I saw something, another shape. It wasn't a man, at least I didn't think so. I glanced over, bracing myself for whatever was going to meet my sight. It looked like an animal, some kind of animal, though I couldn't make out exactly what it was. Under the moonlight, I could see it running alongside my car, its limbs reaching out in long strides, its back undulating like a dog. Closer and closer it came. The closer it was, the more of it I could see, little by little. Then I noticed its limbs were far too long for its body. Its body was too short. It had no tail. The head was round, and from it came a trail of long black hair. I slammed my foot on the gas, pushing my car's engine harder than it had ever been pushed before. By now, I was clocking well over 110. But this creature, it was keeping up. It wasn't faced, it simply ran faster and faster to match my speed. Just what was this thing? How could anyone or anything run this fast? This entity seemed to have endless stamina. Just how long could it keep this up? Just how much faster could it go? Soon, I knew my car would hit its top speed. And then what? How long could it maintain that before breaking down? It wouldn't be long until my engine overheats. But regardless, I would eventually run out of gas. And when I do, what would happen if that thing got me? At 120 miles per hour, my car had reached its limit. This was the fastest I could go, but the creature continued its pursuit. My temperature gauge was approaching the red, and so was my tachometer. I couldn't keep this up any longer. Suddenly, like the beacon of a lighthouse on a tumultuous sea, the first light of ship rock came into view. It was close, so close. If I could just go a little longer, I could make it into town, to safety. I pressed on. I fixed my eyes on the lights, growing brighter on the horizon. They bloomed outwards, glimmering in the night air. 
though it was a small town, it was a sight for sore eyes in my situation. Looking in my periphery, I saw the undulation of the creature's spine as it kept pace with my car, but now it was slipping away, steering far and further from the road. It suddenly hit me just how hard my heart was beating. Beads of sweat dripped down my face. I looked over. The creature was gone. But this time, the feeling of dread had also gone with it. My stereo once again turned back on, and as my music resumed, I took a breath of deep sigh of relief. I let off the accelerator. This man, the creature, whatever it was, it was finally gone for good. Having white knuckled the steering wheel the whole time without realizing it, my hands were extremely sore, but I was glad to have made it through. A week later, I told another soldier in my unit about what I experienced. Being originally from Albuquerque, she was familiar with the Native American legends of the Southwest. The conversation steered towards a certain creature that she would not dare speak the name of. She also told me that the highway I took was well known for all sorts of paranormal phenomena. Google what Route 491 used to be called and everything will make sense. Be careful out there. This is not a story, but a real life event that actually happened to me. I live in a small town in Kentucky where there is nothing, no hope, no jobs, and nothing but churches all around. I was at church one night and this preacher put his hand on my head and prayed that God would reveal himself to me. He then went on to the next person to pray. I got up and started walking towards the exit of the church. All the jumping and shouting was scaring me and honestly it feels nothing of God. It seems like it's more the perks kicking in than anything else. As I left out the door, I went outside to smoke. I walk around the building, and there's a little creek behind the church, so I ended up walking back behind there. As I was standing out there, smoking a cigarette, the hair stood up on my neck, and I got the feeling that I was being watched. I noticed across the creek, in between a bunch of trees, was a pair of red eyes. But they didn't seem scary, nor evil. They just seemed curious, interested. I stared back at it, and it felt like we were staring for hours, but it was just a few minutes. There was nothing, no movement, no blinking, nothing. I then heard somebody walking behind me. I turned back, and I saw it was another person who was also coming outside to smoke a cigarette. As I turned back around, the creature, or this thing, was gone. After talking and smoking, we both went back into the church, and I never saw the eyes again. I still wonder what that thing was, whatever it was. It couldn't have been an angel or God. I'm starting to think it was the devil waiting outside the church. To give you a little more insight about me, this story happened when I was 14 years old. I was at my friend Emily's house, since back then I lived there for personal reasons. Anyways, it was about 1 in the morning and her parents were gone for the night. We were watching scary movies and eating out on snacks like we usually would every weekend night. After our movie, I got up to go to the restroom. 
and I let my friend know that I would be back. She nodded before opening up her laptop to message her boyfriend at the time. As I walked down the dark hallway and I was coming across the bathroom, I heard my friend's voice call out to me, but it was coming from the back porch that was on the right side of the hallway, which immediately struck me as odd because I never seen her leave the room or even walk past me. And why would she be outside anyways at this time? Her voice called out to me again, so I couldn't help it but walk out to the back porch. It does take a lot to scare me after all, so I wasn't bothered by this. As it turns out, it was the biggest mistake ever. A red flag should have went off right then and there when her voice became silent as I stepped outside. I called her name softly, but she didn't reply. I called her name once more, but this time, louder. And again, nothing but silence. I stepped off the porch into the grass looking into her wooded backyard, a little pissed off now because at that time, I figured she was trying to prank scare me, like she always was. It was a normal thing for her, but when I yelled her name again, a voice spoke. But it wasn't hers, it was another woman's voice. Help me, please, for the love of God, help me. Okay. Now I was officially freaked out because there was no one around for miles besides her one neighbor that lives a little ways into the woods. I found myself not being able to move, curiosity maybe, but the bushes started rustling and what looked like a dog stepped out. At first I thought it was her neighbor's dog that must have gotten out again because it has happened before, but when this thing stood up on its hind legs. It was about seven feet tall. That's when I really froze up. What the hell was this thing? I asked myself. I never met any human that's this tall in my entire life. Then it started to move towards me. It was walking kind of like a human, but wobbling like a baby taking its first steps. I found myself not being able to move to get out of there like I should have. That is, until I heard the slider door being opened and the real Emily's voice speak. Lana, what are you doing outside? I looked around my whole house for you. As soon as she finished her sentence, I ran inside as fast as I could and pulled my friend inside before shutting the door and locking it while closing the blinds. I did this to every room, even the basement, locking all the windows included. All the while, Emily yelling at me, asking me what the fuck was going on. I took her arm and raced into her room before slamming her door behind us. When she finally realized how terrified I was and how badly I was shaking, only then did she ask me, Jesus, Lana, what's the matter? You look like you just seen a ghost. I finally calmed down enough to begin to tell her what I encountered. But before I got the chance to fully explain what happened, I heard extreme banging on my friend's window which shocked us both and we both shot up at least 10 feet in the air. I whisper, fuck, I realized I forgot to shut the blinds. I didn't have the heart to turn around, but when Emily's face went pale, I didn't have a choice but to look behind me. I really wish I hadn't. There, that thing was, looking into our bedroom window. I couldn't even begin to explain what it looked like. All I can come up with is that its body was twisted like someone that had just been in a freakish car accident and it had fur, lots of it, and the eyes glowed much like a cat. A high pitched noise escaped that thing's throat making us not only cover our ears but we both screamed as hard as our lungs would let us. I threw my friend on the floor before zooming into her parents room to get her dad's 42 rifle. But when I came back, the noise stopped, and that creature was gone. Emily was rocking back and forth, holding her knees close to her, shaking and crying. She saw its face as clear as I did. The rest of the night, we had all the lights on in the house, and we stayed huddled together in the living room with the rifle right under my legs. Finally, after what seemed like years, the sun rose, and her parents walked through the door. Instantly, her dad noticed our fear-stricken expressions and his gun under my legs. 
They sat down and softly asked both of us what happened. When I explained it, they shared worried glances before announcing that we were moving. We never asked why. We were just happy to get the hell out of there. We moved that exact day to my family's vacation home in a very populated city with little to no trees. When my own parents got home and we told them they had the same reactions and they told me I could never go out after dark alone and to stay away from wooded areas. Of course I never questioned it and to this day I don't know if it was a skinwalker that some people believe in or if it was an imposter. What I do know though that it was not human. My mom recently shared a strange and creepy experience that she and her sibling and parents witnessed when she was younger at around six years of age. My mom is not the type of person to lie about this just to scare someone. And also, my aunts and uncles have verified the story individually. My grandparents, mother, aunts, and uncles lived in a small pueblo, a small town in Mexico with a population of about 1,000 people. They were all scattered throughout the landscape. They lived at the bottom of one of the larger cerros or hills that would take a couple of hours to get to the very top. My abuelitos were very poor. My grandfather was making just enough to provide for their necessities by working at a sugar cane field. But yet they were living in one of the nicer homes because of its proximity to the hill and what everyone would say a witch's house at the top of that hill. Everybody around there stayed away from that house and the rent was the cheapest there was out of everything else out of all the other houses that were available. My abuelitos, grandparents, tias y tios, aunts and uncles and my mom had some paranormal experiences in that house. Most of these were attributed to the witch in typical Mexican folklore fashion. This thing that they witnessed, however, was what made them leave. Mi madre, my mom says that one day she was inside at the entrance of the home with the door wide open, playing with some toys. My tios and tias, aunts and uncles, were in the same room behind her also while my abuelito was relaxing on a rocking chair in that room. She said she was playing and the door to the house was open. As she looked up as a medium sized black dog was walking along the road in front of the home. What spooked her was that this dog had two human breasts hanging from its chest that were connected to its skin as if it was part of its body. She says that the breasts were hairless, which allowed her to see that they were indeed the breast of a human and not some sort of tumor on the dog. My mom says that the dog instantly gave her a very bad feeling and she started to cry. My mom's crying then caused the dog to stop in its tracks and look into the doorway towards my mom. That's when my grandfather got up and headed towards the door. And so did my uncles to see what was happening. He instantly recognized what the creature was and pulled out a small gun he always carried with him because of the long tracks he made on foot to his job. He aimed the gun and tried pulling the trigger, but the gun kept jamming and would not fire. He tried it a few times, each time checking and making sure the gun was in proper working order, but it simply would not fire. All the while, the dog was just standing there, watching. The dog eventually turned and started running down the road and into some overgrowth along the side of the road. After it disappeared from view, my grandfather tried shooting his gun and it fired without a hitch. Even though they were very limited financial-wise, they moved out within a week after this encounter. Unfortunately, both of my grandparents passed 
when I was very young, so I cannot ask them about this event. I also never heard of skinwalkers partially changing, turning, and I found the story quite interesting. Sometimes, when we gather together as a family, joking and playing and having a good time, I tell my mom to bring up the story just to give everybody a spook. In a quick summary, that she saw a black dog with human breast hanging from its chest, grandfather's firearm jammed when he was trying to fire at the dog, and then the gun started working perfectly fine once this dog ran away. Most of my family, when they hear the story, believe it was the bruja, the witch, who lived on top of the saddle, the hill, who apparently, they always say, was a nagual. My mom told me about an experience that she had when she encountered a Nagual in the place where my mom grew up. She said that a group of town people were saying that they were seeing a large black bird out at night and it was creeping people out. So one day, some guys got in a truck and encountered a large black bird in the middle of the road following them. One guy took a shot at it and they said that the bullet went through its wing and it flew away. But they recall that when they shot it, they heard the scream, the wail of a woman. Later on, they noticed that an old lady who lived in an isolated home by herself, all of a sudden, had her arm in a sling and she had a wound from a gunshot. She had already been suspected of being a bruja or a nagual and they believe that this incident confirmed it. I'm not Navajo or native or even Indian, but I have a skinwalker story. So here it goes. I go along with a friend to check out his grandfather's Hogan. For those who don't know, a Hogan is basically a old traditional Navajo dwelling place, mostly made out of logs and mud, with a door traditionally facing east. Anyways, his grandfather is in the hospital for a spell. My friend says that his grandfather had an accident there on the property. We get to the place and we're hanging out for a while, drinking some beers and sharing a blunt. When out of nowhere, my friend goes real still and puts his finger up to his lips like he wants me to be quiet. I hear the shuffling noise coming from just outside. And just an FYI, my friend has dark skin. So as I look at him, his face turns several shades, more pale. The shuffling noise becomes more loud as if someone is coming towards the door. My friend grabs a piece of burning firewood out of the stove. He goes over to the door and hurls it out in front of the Hogan. We then hear it hit the ground and immediately there is this high pitched laughter. Something like the wicked witch of the west. Every hair on my body stands up. My friend starts yelling out in some native language. All I can do is pull out my pocket knife and hold it up to be ready. The person outside just keeps laughing and I finally get the cojones to move over towards the door and peek out. My heart nearly jumps out of my chest. Only several feet from me is this skinwalker. It's leaning up against the wall just to the right, thin and scraggly, covered with these animal skins and staring back at me with these eyes like black marbles. I'm convinced it's a woman as I see what looks to be breasts beneath the skins but thin and sagging, like she's really old. Her face is covered with splotches of hair, and I can't tell if it's real or some kind of get up. I let out a bit of scream, though I hate to admit it, and it just turns and jogs off towards the hills to the other side of the Hogan. That's the only time I've seen a skinwalker since, and I hope I never see one again.
To start this off, there are zero bears, moose, or elk where I lived at the time. At the time I was around 12 or 14, and I was with my friend, who I will call Kayla. We planned on going on a picnic around her fields. As we walked up a smaller hill, Kayla pushed me to the ground and whispered, Do you see that? At least 20 or so feet away, there was a dark figure. It was standing on four thin limbs, and its head was narrow, similar to a horse or a deer. But it was completely black. I couldn't make out the features, but it had a mane like a lion. The mane-like fur ran along its back, stopping near the rear, and it also had no tail. Here's a side note. All of the cattle were moved to a completely different area, nowhere near this one, so no other livestock animals were in those fields. But this thing was just staring off. Suddenly, my friend stood up and made a rush for the exit that was at least two miles away. I didn't hesitate to follow her. We finally stopped near the latch fence that leads to where she stays at, and we looked back. It was slowly walking back into the trees. This sight, to this day, still gives me chills. I guess I'll start with a background. I'm a 33 year old female, but the story takes place when I was a teenager, living in the suburb of Chicago. The village I lived in was quiet and middle class. We lived like a mile from the police station, and the worst crimes we had was a murder or two, and robbery, once in a blue moon. 99% of the time, boring, and more boring. Unless you had a car, you were stuck just walking around the park at night with your friends, which was kind of boring. But anyways, one night, my girlfriend and I decided to go hang out at a park with some guys at like 12 a.m. The night was a bit windy and had a full moon. I even got a kiss that night from the boy that I liked, but the night wasn't just fun and hanging out late. There's a deep forest in the park with a stream with a playground right next to it. The same playground we went to with swings and jungle gym columns. There's a bridge, the one that everyone uses, and another bridge made of rocks that's barely used because it's deeper in the forest. They're both over the stream connecting the forest and park area. I'll get to the rock bridge in a minute. We hung around on the swings and chatted and just spent the evening together. I'm sitting down and just looking around talking and enjoying the peace and quiet and the moonlight. I have a full view of the forest. I then see something moving deep in the woods, some dark shape. It looked like it was crawling out of the forest, an arm, then another arm. Then it pulls itself out of the stream. This figure happens to be darker than the surrounding forest. As I'm just sitting there, frozen, I think I'm seeing things. And it just kind of lays there on the ground, but it doesn't move. A flash of fear comes across me. What if it comes this way? I then look over to my friends and no one notices anything. I look back and it's gone. Did it go back or go somewhere? At this point, I really want to get out of there. Then. One of my friends is asking all of us, did you guys hear about the urban legend of the rock bridge over the stream? Apparently, some kids or something played on the bridge and fell over and died. What a thing to say after what I saw, but I didn't ask anyone anything and just pretended that I never saw anything. But this experience stuck with me. I never talked about it because it must have been my imagination. Things like that only happen in scary movies, right? After all of this, I rarely went to the park after that. 
Who knows what would have happened if this black thing saw me the same time that I saw it. I live right next to the Navajo reservation and have made friends with many of the people there my age. We like to hang out, play video games, and just be normal teens. I walk over a lot since my best friend lives a little less than a mile away from me. This isn't a long trek and it only takes about 25 to 30 minutes. I have made this trip dozens of times and have grown very comfortable with it. I know the people along the way, so I'm not scared or on edge. There is a patch of forest, however, about midway there. It's a little unnerving sometimes. There is always that feeling of being watched. This was a regular occurrence for me, so I try to just ignore it and shake it off as my mind playing tricks on me. This day, I spent more time at my friend's house than I meant to, and when I left, it was already getting dark. I reached the stretch of forest right as the sun disappeared from the sky. I shivered a little as I readied myself to begin the journey through. I was ten steps in when I heard a branch snap. You know the sound, the one that screams there is definitely someone or something there with you. I froze, not sure what I should do next. Should I run? Should I turn around and book it back to my friend's house? I didn't know the best option in this situation, so I whispered, Hello? Hearing my voice crack as the words fell from my lips, I don't know why I even opened my mouth, but it was out there, so I listened for any reply. My heart sank when the answer came back in the sound of my voice. Hello? My heart pounded against my chest. I felt like I was gonna faint. Hello? My voice came again, but not from my mouth. I wanted to run, but my feet felt cemented to the ground. I couldn't scream. I couldn't reply. Hello? 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 As my voice echoed over and over from a short distance away. I couldn't pinpoint exactly where it was coming from. It sounded like it was everywhere around me. Hello? 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 It repeated. Stop it! I finally managed to tear from my lips. Everything went silent. For a long minute, nothing happened. The air grew stale. And I realized for the first time that there was no typical forest sound. There were no bugs, no frogs, or crickets, nothing. I stood there, terrified, waiting to see what would happen next. Stop it! It mimicked back. I had enough and was wheeling my heavy legs to move. Before I could take a step, I heard some rustling in the bushes 20 feet to my left. I watched as a deer head with huge antlers protruded through the brush as it came further out and stood up on twos. I took off. I flew out of the woods and all the way home in record time. I said nothing to my mom when I got there. I just went up to my room, laid down, and thought about what happened. My mom came in at some point and asked me if everything was alright. I replied yes, I was just tired. I don't know why I didn't tell her. I guess I was afraid of how she would react. I called my friend and told him everything. He freaked out and told me that no matter what happened that night, to not reply or look out my window. But this terrified me even more. He said to call him the next morning and he would explain more and that he had to speak to his grandfather as soon as possible. That night, I didn't sleep at all. I stayed awake, listening to every little sound the night brought. Around 3 a.m., 
just as I was about to drift off, the air changed. The night sounds got quiet. I felt my heart begin to pound. I lay there and waited, pulling the covers over my head like a child, far too scared to move. It came after a long moment. Hello? I cried. It was all I could do. Hello? Stop it! It mocked what I had said in the woods again. It was terrifying enough when it copied what I said. But then, it did something new. It called my name. Amy. My mother's voice. Amy. Amy. Come here. Hello? Stop it. My voice again. For the rest of the night, the creature outside my window called my name in my mother's voice and repeated what I said in the woods over and over. In the morning, when the sun broke through the dark, it finally stopped. I fell into a deep sleep. I woke up around 12 to my friend calling to tell me he had spoken to his grandfather and could explain what happened to me. He said there was a creature that they called Yi Naudroshi or he who goes on all fours or a skinwalker. He explained that it was an evil witch that used dark magic to transform into an animal with the attributes it required and that this witch had caught my scent and knew me now. I was also given a warning that since it knew me it would always follow me and that I would always have to be careful. Last night I heard scratching on my window then a low hum the creature began saying my name again but also adding in things I hadn't said in my mother's voice. At one point it started calling my name but drawing it out really far like Amy. It tried to get me to come outside or to open the door and let it into my house. This went on all night. At this point, I feel like I'm going crazy. I don't know what to do. Is this thing seriously going to stalk the shadows around me for the rest of my life? I don't think. I can take that. Many of you who love paranormal stuff may have already heard of the word Nagual here in Mexico and I would guess that also on some other countries in Latino America we call that way people who can shapeshift into animals. Well, here's my story. It was a cold night. I remember because it was really weird for it to get cold on that side of the country. This was in my parents house in a small pueblo or small town and back in the day it was one of the last houses outside of town. Not so many neighbors but a lot of trees and nature around. The house has a long backyard where we used to have sheep. At one side, a small water stream and trees to the other side. The sheep then started to bleat very loud, something we could call screams. My father then went to give a check on a window in the back side of the house. I still recall his face when he came back quickly, and in a low, urgent voice, he told my mom, Ve agarra a tu padre y a tus hermanos y diles que vengan ya ahorita. Go ask your father and brothers to come here immediately. They were four brothers, my grandfather and my father. When everyone was there, a few minutes later, my father started to tell us what he saw. In the barn, we had ten sheep. At the moment, my father gave a look. All of them were together in just one corner. At the center, there was some kind of big animal. My father described it as a bear, which makes totally no sense 
but he said it was big, hairy, and it seemed to be eating one sheep there. This one sheep was screaming really bad. Then, my grandfather told my mom to keep us inside of the house and to keep me in there also with her. If you go outside now, you may catch a bad air. So he made some kind of prayer holding his machete. So his prayer, I remember he said the names of my uncles and also my father's. He then went outside. That's when my grandfather started to yell at the darkness, telling things like, Vete de aquí. No tienes nada que ver aquí. Deja esta casa. Go away. You have nothing to do here. Leave this house. My father told me that he saw how this thing was in a pose, eating the sheep, which was laying on the ground, still screaming by the way. And when my grandfather yelled at it, this thing seemed to stop and raise its head up towards my family. This thing was only staring at them. Not a single noise. And also, no red or shining eyes. Only the shadow looked like it was looking at them. So my father decided to do something at last. He took a big rock. He picked it up from the ground and threw it at this thing. Maybe not the best thing to do in this situation. But I guess this thing was not that strong. Or maybe because it was six of us. And we all had machetes. But when the rock hit it, this being turned its back and ran away to the forest, running on all four legs like an animal would. They then approached the sheep, and my grandpa said how the sheep was on the ground, but it was still alive, but it was completely unskinned. It was horrifying at least. My grandfather then sacrificed it to stop the suffering. After that night, a family friend told us a story about someone new in town that apparently was a Nagwat. He told us he spoke to that man and he told him to leave the town. Indeed, we never happened to live something similar after that. I saw some videos about skinwalkers on TikTok. So I started watching videos about them on YouTube. And there was a whole podcast where this guy just read stories about them from Reddit and other stories that people submitted. Our ward at church purchased a piece of land way back in the day. It's seriously just wooded area with a little bit of swamp. We would always go there for campouts and scouts and at night when it was pitch black we would all play manhunt. Well one time we all got down to one person whose name was David. Growing up he was super fast and he would hide really good so nobody could ever find him. He would always end up being the last person. Well one time it was down to David. And we had split up and gone way deep in the forest towards the swamp because it seems like it was impossible to find him. We thought he might have gone a little bit further than we normally go. We started getting into some more muddy and wet terrain as we get closer to a swamp-like area where the water is most likely shin deep. And we saw David way out in the swamp and he wasn't wearing a shirt. And with the spotlight on him, he looked super pale. But he just stood there and didn't say a word. You could seriously tell something was off. Then, all of a sudden, we heard David from behind us, yelling, trying to get our attention. So we would keep trying to chase him down. Meaning, what we saw in front of us was definitely not him. So being a bunch of 12 to 17 year old boys, we started yelling and running back to the campsite as fast as we could. Nobody believed us. In fact, for years everybody made fun of it, calling the ghost of David. But then 
I started listening to these stories and every single one of them sounds just like what happened in some way or another. For a few months, I've been having a feral cat that comes to my back porch looking for food. I first saw him in October around 6 p.m. when the sun was going down and I had walked to the back door to take a smoke outside. I could see him through the double window that looks out onto the swamp beyond. He was sitting patiently as if he had been waiting for me. His black, greasy fur reflecting the colors of the sun. When he saw me approaching, he stepped closer to the window and stood on his two back legs and started to paw wildly at the window. I chuckled and walked back to my fridge, pulling out some leftover chicken breast from the night before. I grabbed an old plastic dish from the cabinet and I tore the chicken apart into bite-sized pieces. I returned to the back door. I opened it only enough for me to squeeze out so that he wouldn't bolt into the house. If he did, I knew I would regret it, letting him slip inside, only to possibly infest my home with blood-sucking fleas and to tear up my furniture. I placed the dish down, and he pranced towards it, scarfing it down like it was his first meal in weeks. I looked at him closer, through his long fur, and could see how thin he was. His legs looked like skin and bone, and his cheeks looked sunk in, causing his eyes to protrude out grossly. It was then that I noticed his tar-colored eyes that had no glint to them, no shine from the setting sun. It reminded me of those computer screens that don't reflect pesky sunlight glare coming from your window. I felt uneasy, worried now that he may attack me. However, he looked at me once and blinked slowly before racing down the porch stairs and disappearing into the wooded swamp. I started to wake up every morning only to see the dead corpse of some poor animal when I would take my routinely first smoke of the day. It started with little animals, birds, mice, and other small rodents. I always figured it was just the way that cat was thanking me for feeding him when he came, which was only a couple of times a week. Even though I only saw him a few times, there was always a dead animal on the porch step every morning. I thought it was silly that some old cat would bring me presents every morning. After about a month, the corpses began to get bigger. I was finding more bigger rats and the occasional possum. I started to think it was strange that this cat seemed to catch his dinner just fine but still came to me for scraps. I always brushed it off though, seeing as it wasn't doing me any harm and I had no roommates who may have been disturbed by it. However, on one particular cold and foggy morning, I walked to the back deck to have my cigarette and I looked down to look for my present. There was nothing there. I could feel my heart flutter. I was worried that something may have happened to my little buddy. That feeling quickly left and I felt my stomach drop as I looked over the railing to see my lawn filled with bodies. 
I placed a hand over my mouth to catch my gasp. The sight was disgusting and a less than pleasant encounter when all I wanted was to enjoy a smoke. After that occurrence, the dead animal started to appear once again on the back deck. Part of me felt relieved that my cat was okay, while the other part of me felt like something was terribly off. Sometime in January, I woke up in the middle of the night, groggy as hell, but with a strong craving to have a smoke. I walked down the hall and paused at the window overlooking the backyard, and I saw a pale figure that reflected the moonlight. I paused, and my eyes widened. Suddenly, I was no longer groggy, and the urge to smoke disappeared. The figure looked up at me, and I froze. My breathing stopped. I could see its sunken in eyes staring at me, and its spine protruding from its pale skin that had patches of fur peppered. It looked very strange, almost human-like, hunched over while standing on two legs. I panicked and I could feel my body growing hot as my heartbeat quickened. After staring at me a little longer, it turned around to crawl over the fence and then it walked away on its two legs. I went back to bed completely terrified. I woke up the next morning and rubbed my eyes, releasing a big yawn. I thought to myself, what a crazy dream I had. I got up from bed and walked downstairs to make myself a pot of French press coffee. I grabbed my pack of smokes and my mug and walked out the back door. I walked to the rail with my mug and crossed my arms and leaned over. I instantly dropped my mug and could hear it shatter on the concrete below. Time felt like it had slowed as I looked around to see corpses lacerated and splayed across my yard. The black feral cat was strategically in the middle of all the dead bodies. No mercy was spared to any of those animals. I felt my stomach heave and I threw up what was left of my dinner from last night. I felt a chill run down my spine as I remembered what I had seen the night before and I no longer believed it was a dream. I quickly walked back to the door and locked it shut behind me. It felt surreal and I couldn't imagine that this was happening to me, but to my dismay, it was. I couldn't be bothered to clean all the bodies. I was too fearful to walk out that door. I stayed inside the house for the rest of the day on my computer looking for solutions to my problem. Of course, I found nothing but nonsense about some beings called rakes, wendigos, and skinwalkers. I strongly felt that this was some person playing a massive prank on me, and I desperately wanted to believe that was the case. I fell asleep at the table in front of the back door Being the light sleeper that I am, I woke up to a gentle but loud knock at the door, followed by a few more. I immediately sprang up and swiveled around. I pulled the blinds away from the door just enough to peer out the window. Nothing. I walked to the window beside the door and shrieked at what I saw before me. The creature I had just seen the night before had pressed its hands and face 
against the window and was breathing heavily with a wicked smile plastered against its face. I ran to the counter and snatched my keys, running out the front door to dash to my car. As I got in, I began backing out. That's when I saw the creature come around the side of the house, only to stop when it saw me backing away. It then stood up on its two legs and gave me a slow wave, showing off its nasty pointed teeth and its disgusting smile. I retreated to my sister's home, which was about 30 minutes away, and I busted through the front door with no explanation. She came running down the stairs with her boyfriend following close behind her. She flicked the lights on and could see how disturbed I looked. Taking me to the guest room downstairs, she told me I was welcome to stay as long as I needed. After refusing to tell her what went wrong, I felt crazy after what I saw. Part of me still believing it wasn't real and another part afraid she would think I was crazy. A few days passed and I was beginning to feel more at ease. My sister was making breakfast by the time I woke up and I nodded to her and her boyfriend as I sat down at the table when there was a ring at the doorbell. I went to go see who was there as I saw my sister was busy and her boyfriend was enjoying a little small talk with her. I opened the door and was surprised to see no one was there. A putrid smell struck my nostrils. I looked down to see the half rotten body of my feral cat. I don't know why I'm here. I shouldn't have come. I knew I shouldn't have accepted the dare. Well, I couldn't back down from a double dare, could I? My name is Jacob, but my friends call me Jake. My friends had dared me to come here at midnight to prove I wasn't a pussy. There was no way I could back down from a double dare, as everyone would know I was a coward. My friends and I were in the woods near our town, just messing around, you know, teenage stuff. Our parents had always warned us to stay away from the woods, as anything could happen in there. Of course, we didn't listen to them. We were 15 and we thought we knew better than them, as every teenager does. Our town's woods are like any town's. Parents warn us not to go in as a child, leading us to create fantastical tales about creatures living in the woods who only come out at night with the body of a deer and torso of a man, with unicorns and dragons living in the deepest of the green utopia when the sky turns into an inky black. Of course, we outgrew all of these childish creations and fantasies, and we grew up to enjoy the woods, often going in there to enjoy a sneaky smoke or to take their new girlfriend away from the prying eyes of their parents. We had entered the woods at just about 4 p.m. It was autumn, and the clouds were hanging low over the treetops, looking pregnant and black, threatening to burst and shower us in heavy rain that had been expected for weeks now. My friends, Sam and Archie, were with me. Archie is my best friend. Ever since we met in second grade, we had gone in on like a house on fire, and now we were practically inseparable. 
Sam was a big dude, towering over us at five foot eleven, at just fifteen years old. He was the guy you always wanted on your side when you got into a fight. Me and Sam didn't get on this very well. We had only met through a friend of a friend type thing and had never really bonded well. Sam was doing his usual bragging about the stuff he's got up to last night with his girlfriend that we all knew were just over-exaggerated fantasies. We had just arrived at the clearing. That was its name. Everyone just called it the clearing. It was exactly that. A clearing in the center of the woods with a large boulder in the center that as kids when we walked through the woods with our parents we would climb to the top and yell funny phrases from our favorite cartoon at the time we walked where the boulder was at and our conversation tuned towards movies we had all recently seen a horror movie together and were just making comments at how we each saw the other flinch at certain scenes. Both Sam and Archie were claiming that I was the only one who jumped the most. And of course, like any testosterone driven teen, I was on the physical defensive immediately. Jokingly pushing Archie off the rock and kicking him lightly. They both talked about how I was always a pussy when watching horror movies, always jumping at every shadow after the movie too. One thing led to the other, and before I knew it, I had been dared to prove that I wasn't the coward they were claiming I was. I had to stay in the woods with them until midnight, and then they would leave me alone for an hour to see how long I would last in the dark woods on my own. I was hesitating to accept it there, thinking of my parents and stuff, and it being a school night. But then Archie went and double dared me. You can't decline a double dare. I had to accept the challenge. We hung around, waiting for midnight to come. They continued their conversations, but I couldn't get involved. I was far too nervous dreading the moment I would be left alone in these dark woods. They had promised me they wouldn't be too far off and that they wouldn't be able to hear my girly screams, quote Sam, if I got too scared and wanted out of it. It wasn't the dark I was going to be scared of. It was what was unseen in the dark that worried me the most. My hands were shaking and I couldn't stop my breathing rate to increase as the minutes ticked down to midnight. Just 10 minutes to go, 10 minutes, and then an hour standing in the pitch black woods in the clearing. Proving to my friends I wasn't a coward, was it worth it? I asked myself. I didn't know to live for the rest of my friendship with them being called a pussy, or to stand through 60 minutes of sheer terror and dread. Damn it, I shouldn't have watched so many scary movies. My mind was a blur. My vision couldn't focus. I kept seeing things in the corner of my eye. Shadows behind trees that moved out of sight when I turned my full attention on them. Footsteps behind me. I knew it was all my imagination though just my imagination. Hey, Archie's voice cut through the mist in my mind. A deer. I squinted through the darkness in the direction he was pointing. Where? I heard Sam ask. Shh, you'll scare it away, Archie hissed. He gestured with his hand to the left side of the boulder, middle distance. And sure enough, there was a deer. It was standing still absolutely stock still. It wasn't grazing the grass, it was looking around for possible dangers or predators. It was just standing there, with its head 
pointed straight, looking east. It's beautiful, ain't it? Archie said, smiling at me. I nodded, my mouth still dry with nervous anticipation. I pulled out my phone to check the time, to see how long I had left before I was left alone in these woods. But Archie stopped me, grabbing my hand and shaking his head. No, he whispered. The light from the phone might scare it away. I put the phone away and squinted through the darkness again at the still, motionless deer. We stood there for a few minutes, watching it. It hadn't moved once. Yo, why isn't it moving? Sam asked. Then the deer moved. I saw it. Just as Sam had said those words in his deep whisper, the deer turned its head to look at us. I felt a shiver go down my spine. I don't know why, but the way it had turned its head to look at us didn't seem right. The movement wasn't fluid. It wasn't like the deer was afraid of the noise and had whipped its head around to check it out. The deer had turned its head too slowly, too slowly for an animal of prey, hearing an unknown sound. It stared at us, we stared at it, and nobody moved. The woods were silent. It was as if the trees and animals were all holding their breath in anticipation of what was about to occur next. It then moved again, so slowly, so unnaturally, and slowly. It started to walk. I don't know if walk is the right way to describe its movements actually. It was more forced. As if its legs didn't belong to it. And it was trying to figure out how to use its limbs along the way. Jerky and slow movements. Moving away into the darkness until the blackness surrounded it and we could no longer see it. None of us said anything for a long time. Sam turned to us. He ruined it. Of course he would. Enough of that weird ass deer. We're here for a reason, right? I could do nothing but stare at him. My heart beating so fast in my chest and my head swimming with thoughts. Archie didn't respond. Well, Sam demanded. Archie looked at me. I couldn't move. Fear had paralyzed me. I was scared of what I had just witnessed and the strangeness of it and the fear of the dare. Archie then shrugged at me. A dare is a dare, bro, was all he said to me. Taking out his phone, he checked the time. 12.03 a little over midnight. Well, Archie began, but Sam cut in. Come on, let's get to it. It's bloody freezing out here. He pulled down his beanie further on his head and sipped up his coat higher. Do the dare and let's get home where it's warm, all right? I nodded. I couldn't believe myself. I actually nodded. Despite All my internal senses going haywire. All of my gut telling me that this was the complete and wrong thing to be doing. I had nodded. Sealing the dare and confirming my participation. The dare was on. They promised me they wouldn't be too far away. That they would be near the creek at the west entrance of the woods. About 100 meters away from the clearing I was in. Then they left me, left me all alone, alone in the dark, alone in the unknown, alone with who knows what. I silently cursed myself 
I tried to control my breathing. My heart was hammering in my chest. I let out a sigh, watching as my breath vapor steamed the cold air in front of my face. I just had to make an hour. One hour. One hour. I walked to the boulder and leaned against it and waited and waited. And that's where I am right now, still waiting. I actually shouldn't be here. I know I shouldn't. I let out a sigh, taking out my phone, squinting at the sudden bright light of the display. I checked the time. 12.42, just 18 minutes. Time was going slowly. A loud noise interrupted me from my self-pitying thoughts. The sound of a twig snapping. Someone was moving near me. My eyes were wide, darting around trying to pierce the inky blackness of where my natural night vision couldn't see. I tried to swallow, but my mouth was too dry. The noise came again, this time from behind me. I spun around, trying to desperately squint through the darkness. I turned on my phone, turned on the flashlight, and shined it through the trees. It was Archie and Sam. I knew it. They were trying to prank me. Try and make me scream. So then they could tell all of their friends that Jake was scared of the dark and was such a coward. My fist clenched tighter around my phone. Archie, Sam, I know it's you. I called out. And the noise came again from my left. I whipped around and saw it. There was a deer standing there looking at me. It was close, like two meters away from me. I could see its coarse fur and its twisting antlers and its eyes. Its eyes were wrong. Its eyes were a deep, dark red. A step backwards, those eyes, they had me transfixed. I couldn't stop staring into them. Then the deer started to move jerky movements towards me. I was frozen in shock. I thought I heard a faint noise in the distance. Some high-pitched noise, but it was for a split second, and I was left wondering if I had imagined it. The deer kept moving towards me, menacing, terrifying. I was paralyzed in fear. My body wanted to move, but I couldn't. All I could do was stand there as the deer kept stalking towards me so slowly. It wasn't a deer though. It was obvious, the eyes, the way it moved, the way it held its posture. It was clear that this was something else. What it was, I didn't know. It wasn't a deer for sure. Something was inside of it, wearing it, testing it out, and seeing how it worked. My body, then came to life. I had control of my limbs, breaking free of its stare. I turned and fled. I wasn't paying attention to where I was running to, just anywhere from that. That thing, I looked behind me. It wasn't following me. It was standing in the clearing, watching me. I turned back to look where I was going. Too late. I tripped over a log, I think. My knees with pain, pain seared through my left elbow. I scrambled to my feet, ignoring the pain, and looked behind me. The woods were silent. The only thing I could hear was the sound of my own heartbeat and my heavy breathing. I heard footsteps, pounding footsteps coming towards me. Sam burst through the foliage, panting. It, it, he couldn't speak. His chest was heaving as he struggled to catch his breath. His hair and face was slick with sweat and he had lost his beanie on the run. It got Archie. It freaking got Archie, he managed to say. He noticed my look of confusion. The deer, the freaking deer, there was one there. We were watching it. I turned for a second and, and when I turned back, Sam broke into a hacking sob. He broke down. Tears were rolling down his cheeks. 
I realized this was the first time I had seen the big guy cry. When I turned back, there were bones on the floor. The deer had gone in, and there was this thing, this freaking ugly ass creature. It, it was horrible, dude. Sam broke down again. I could do nothing but stay crouched where I was, shocked out of my wits. It transformed in front of me, dude. It had taken his skin, like in the horror movies. Skinwalkers. They take the skins of their victims. More of them freaking deer showed up then. Like about five of them, dude. Five of them. Next to the thing wearing Sam's skin. And then I... Sam coughed and spat onto the ground. I ran. Ran like hell, dude. Oh my god. This freaking there. We should have never stayed. His tears stopped coming. And he collapsed onto the log. I was breathing heavily still. I saw a deer too. I managed to whisper. It was in the clearing. I ran, cause it just didn't seem right. If I had stayed, I grounded to a halt. There was a deer walking towards us. Its eyes were red. Run, I yelled, leaping to my feet and grabbing Sam by the arm, dragging him with me. I could hear the deer following us. Then, a loud crunch, and I knew that if I looked back now, it wouldn't be a deer following us. It would be one of those creatures Sam had described. I didn't look back though, just kept running, running and running. Then we got lost. Branches whipped in our face, foliage shredded our trousers. If one of us tripped, the other would simply keep going, dragging the other along with them until they got their pace back. We got split up. I don't even know how. I think there was a tree and Sam was going around the left of it, but I was going to the right. I let go of his arm for a second, I think. When I looked to where he had been, he wasn't there. I had lost him. I kept running until I couldn't run any further. I staggered to a halt and leaned against the tree trunk, trying to catch my breath back. I took a step forward and heard a little brittle crunch from underneath my shoe. I stepped back and looked down at what I had stepped on. There was something white on the floor. I took my phone out and shined its flashlight on the floor. Bones. There were bones on the floor shattered by me stepping on them. I shined the light around more. There was a skull near the bushes. I wanted to vomit. This must be all that was left of poor Archie. I sank to my knees and I started to sob. And I started to cry, uncontrollably racking sobs. I fell onto my backside, but felt something underneath me. I sat up and picked it up. It was Sam's beanie. Then it clicked. I span around and of course, there was Sam. But it wasn't Sam of course. His pupils were red and that smile wasn't right. The thing wearing Sam's skin forced Sam's grin even wider and it said in a deep snarl, I dare you to run. Go on. Double dare. So we end up playing football. Dicking around with me. There's the white kid Tanner. Five of my cousins. And then four of their friends. In total, there were five girls and six boys. We all were around 15 to 17. We ended up just digging the day away. So we head back to the camp and pulling out some stuff for a campfire. Even though the trailers had kitchens, Tanner says that his family's property sits up against my uncle's. He wants to run home and ask his dad if he can come out camping with us. My cousin Rooster says he's going to go with him since it's going to get dark soon. And one of the girls also wants to tag along. It's about seven o'clock and it's starting to get pretty dark. They take flashlights and take the trail to Tan's property. The rest of us chill. We make s'mores, drink, and kiss on the girls. About 30 to 40 minutes later, 
There's the smell of ozone again. You could smell it over the smell of the fire we had started. It was a nasty copper smell like right after you had a nosebleed and it stopped. It wasn't exactly like dry blood, but it was that nasty metallic back of your throat smell kind of. We immediately think it's some kind of electrical malfunction or someone left a hot plate on or some shit like that. We search all the trailers and nothing is on and we can all smell it now. All of a sudden, we can hear people booking down the path towards us and Rooster, Tan, and the girl all come running into the clearing out of breath. And they don't even break stride. They all run into the trailer right by where the fire is. So of course, we all get the fuck out of there and into the trailers we go as well. They end up calming down. Even Rooster is crying his fucking eyes out at this point. All the while, the fire is going lower and lower. So my cousins say, fuck it. And they're about to go outside to get the generator out of a shed between the trailers. But then Tanner goes, fuck no, lock the front door. Ain't nobody else going outside. He's been crying too, and his eyes are bloodshot and puffy, and his pants are dirty as shit. He goes on to tell us that they went up to his house. His father said, sure, he could go out camping, but to make sure they were careful on the way back, and that maybe they should take one of the hunting rifles, just in case. Evidently, Tanner had seen something in their yard a few days before. One of their pigs had come up, ripped up, and was half eaten. They assumed it was just some big cat or coyote, even though they usually don't fuck with live animals. He had gone upstairs and packed the stuff and told his dad they would be okay without the rifle because coyotes avoid people. So they started walking back to where we were camping at. So Rooster finally stopped crying and shaking. The girl already had, but she was just staring out the window with a dumb look on her face. He says they had gone halfway into the woods towards the camp when they started to hear shit in the forest. It was almost pitch black by this time so they weren't sure at first what the fuck it was. The girl says that she heard something in the bushes right off the trail and they all beamed their flashlights over there and there was someone standing back in the woods. Rooster said they shouted at him and told him that he was scaring the fuck out of them and what a dick he was. He says that's when he realized that the guy was actually facing away from them. So they keep walking they say that they look off into the forest on the opposite side and there's a dude standing in the forest backwards slightly closer to the path so now they start power walking and Tan keeps going I should have taken the fucking rifle as they're telling the story the smell is still super strong even inside the cabin they say that after they started walking faster a kind of low gibbering has started coming from both sides of the woods. And as they started booking it back to the trailer, the girl said she had flashed her flashlight out into the woods to the side of them and had seen something jerking itself through the woods. The gibbering just got louder and louder and when they could see the light from our campfire, something had come out of the woods about 40 yards behind them onto the track. And that's when they just flat out ran as hard as they could to the trailer so we're out in the fucking woods and we're assuming at this point it's some rednecks or some shit trying to fuck with us all of a sudden my other cousin junior starts going on about how he went to school with a native kid that was telling him about the goat man or some shit like that we promptly tell him to shut the fuck up because we don't need any spooky talk right now but he just keeps going on and on about how it's the fucking goat man and how we're in his woods and blah blah blah. At that time, I had never heard of this goat man or any of that. But then a couple years ago, the year before I graduated from college, I had a native roommate and I ended up asking him about it. And to sum it up, it's basically a fucking man with the head of a goat and he gets among groups of people to scare them. It's also supposed to be kind of like the Wendigo and it's bad mojo to even talk about it. And it's even worse if you see it. Keep in mind, 
I don't know this back when I was 16. So my cousin starts saying, the goat man's going to get in and fucking get us. The girls are all terrified. And my cousins and I are all fucking trying to figure out if it's just some bullshit or some hillbillies or some animal. So all of a sudden, the smell just goes away. Like to this day, I haven't even experienced anything like it. Most of the time, smells fade away or just lessen. But in this case, it literally was there one second and then not the second after. So it's after an hour making it around 9 or 10. We stop shitting bricks enough to go back outside and stoke the fire again. We figure it was just some assholes trying to fuck with us. So we don't go back home because we think if we do, they'll chase us through the woods or some crazy shit like that. Nothing else weird happens that night and we stay another night and for the main part of the night, nothing happens. At about 1 in the morning, we're outside getting drunk and telling ghost stories. As someone is finishing their scary story, which I don't remember what it's about, the smell comes back. This time, it's so fucking strong that one of the girls literally starts vomiting. I stand up and you can actually feel how clammy the air is. I then say that we should get inside and this doesn't feel right. In reality, we should have just fucking left. We all go back inside and we're standing around. My cousin just keeps going on about how it's the goat man. And my cousin Rooster keeps trying to shut him the fuck up. And all the while I'm just feeling that something is wrong. And I can't figure out what the fuck it is. We end up sitting in there for a while. The smell is just as strong. And we're terrified and all huddle in this camper. We end up cooking brats for everybody because nobody wants to go outside. It's one of those packs with four brats. We have a total of three packs. I grill them up on the stove and give everybody a hot dog. I get mine and after a while, one of my cousins gets up and goes over to the pot to get another one. He starts grumbling about how I get two brats and everybody else only got one. And I look at him like he's fucking stupid. I tell him that everybody only got one because there were only 12 brats. If he wants more, he should open up a new pack and cook some more. That's when the girl that had been out with Rooster and Tan just starts screaming. Oh Jesus, oh Lord, get it out. She's crying and shivering, and then it dawns on the cousin standing up what the fuck is wrong. Me and him both glance around the room, and then I feel my heart fucking sink. I run the fuck out of the cabin, and the girl runs out with us. The trailer door is banging against the side of the trailer as everybody books out of the cabin. One of my cousin's friends then asks what the fuck was wrong. I start counting all of us, and there's only 11 of us now. I shit you not, my cousin verified. There had been 12 people in the cabin, but being that everybody didn't really know each other well, nobody had really noticed the whole fucking time that there was an extra person. And then I realized earlier that I had kind of noticed something was off. You know how when you're just dicking around having a good time that you don't sweat the smallest shit and you don't always keep track of certain stuff? I'm dead sure that someone else had been in the trailer with us and that they had been there for at least a fucking day eating with us. What makes it worse is I could figure out which one because I don't think anyone ever actually interacted with the other person slash the goat man. The girl kept praying to Jesus and we're all sitting outside. Eventually, we get big ass sticks and go back in the cabin, but there's nobody in there. We count again and there's 11 people. We go back into the trailer and lock the door. We explain what the fuck happened and the girl says that she also realized and that when he was about to say something, the person sitting next to her had grabbed her leg hard and leaned over towards her and said something she couldn't understand. So we are pretty much scared as fuck as we huddle together and I fall asleep. When I wake up, the sun is just coming up and half the people are asleep and the other half are packing our shit up. We all want to walk back home, but like four people want to stay until the sun is all the way up and some people think that we're just fucking around and still want to stay there. I just want to get the fuck out of the woods to be honest. The girl's name was Kiera, the one that the goat man had touched. 
Anyways, I asked her if she really thinks it was something bad, and she says that she just wants to go home, and she doesn't want to be out in the woods alone for another night. So we decide to split up. The four that want to go can go, but I have to stay because I have the keys to the cabin, and it's my uncle's and I have to lock up. I'm super pissed off at this point because I feel like people aren't taking the shit seriously, and I definitely didn't want to be out in the woods for another night. I spend the rest of the day trying to convince the rest of the people, which is now four girls and four guys, to get the fuck out. Tanner leaves with them to go get a rifle and says he's going to be back. So now there are just seven of us left by 4 p.m. At around 5 p.m., he hasn't made it back yet and we're getting extremely fucking nervous. And the only reason I stopped begging them to go back was because he went to go get a gun. It's about 5.30 p.m. or so when the one cousin that did stay says that the girl Kiera is outside. We all look outside and sure enough, she's standing by the fire pit with her back to the cabin. I'm thinking to myself, if she was so fucking scared, why the hell would she come back? And then I get this nasty feeling in my gut. Keep in mind, the whole time the coppery smell has been gone. Now, I realize... I can smell just a little bit of it. I say this to the rest of them and everybody. And these are the people that wanted to stay in the fucking woods after we had the goddamn goat man in our midst. It's laughing at me and asking if I set this up to scare them. I'm looking at them like, I'm not fucking bullshitting you all right now. I then demand to know why the fuck would I play like that. So one of the girls goes outside to get Kiera. She gets halfway to her and stops cold. Kiera starts heaving. I don't know how the fuck to describe it. Sort of like if someone with their back turned was laughing without actually making any sound. It was this fact that made me realize there was not a fucking sound in the whole woods. It was dead silent. This was like later in September, so it was still fairly hot at the time, but it was super chilly some days too and you could usually hear some big ass geese honking or some kind of birds or squirrels chit chatting. So I step out of the door and tell her to come back in the fucking trailer. Right fucking now. She backs up into the trailer and we lock the fucking door. We pull down all the shades except one and put a guy there in a chair to watch her. She stands there for another 20 minutes or so. The guy then turns to say that she's still there. And then there's a huge fucking bang at the door. We all jump the fuck up and scramble around the living room. The banging is super fucking loud. So now my cousin is holding one of the girls and the other two are kind of giggling, nervously laughing. And me and the other two guys are shitting bricks. Then we hear Tan. He's screaming. Let me the fuck in. Stop fucking playing. So we go over to the door and open it, and he stumbles in with a rifle. There's nobody else outside. Evidently, he had walked up to the campsite. Nothing weird happened in the forest, but he had seen a girl. Mind you, he said it was not Kiera standing there. When he had gone into the edge of the clearing, she had turned towards him with a slack jaw look and just stared him down, slowly tracking him as he walked around the outside of the clearing towards the camp. He said it wasn't until he was almost halfway to the trailer he had realized that she was getting closer to him. She had started off by the fire and without him even seeing her move she had been turning inches closer. He said he just ran the rest of the way back to the cabin thinking it would open and when he got to the door it was locked. He turned and it was about half the distance to the door. He looks around the room and then gets super pale. He pulls me to the side and whispers in my ear. You know there are only seven of us in here, right? I get that feeling where your stomach drops to your nuts. It had been back inside a trailer. While we were out sorting out who was going where, and then when we all went outside to talk earlier in the day. It has just slipped right back in. We looked out the window, and there is nobody out there. So we recount everyone, and then basically... I go over and ask everyone how many people were here earlier, and everybody says eight. 
I then say, well, how many are here now? They all do the count and then realize there are only now seven people in the cabin. So Tan had brought back a couple of boxes of ammo and his rifle. And he had told his dad that there was some kind of animal in the forest because he didn't think his dad would believe him if he said it was the goat man. He said that his cousin is supposed to be coming down in a few hours and that in the morning we can all go back to his place and his cousin will drive us home. Now I'm really fucking terrified. But I at least feel better because we can be American and shoot the fuck out of whatever it is if it comes back. But then my cousin gets into this huge argument with one of the girls because she thinks that I'm trying to be funny and prank them and that she's getting really scared and that I'm not funny. He keeps telling her I'm not that kind of person and she says, well, how do we know the girl wasn't just Tanner in a wig? Or if it's really the goat man, how do we know that this is real? How do we know that this is the real Tanner and that the goat man just didn't kill Tanner in the woods and take his gun? So we fucking get into a huge argument about this, where me and Tan are like, we could seriously be in danger because at the very least someone has been sneaking themselves into our fucking trailer, without us knowing and mingling with us, and at worst, something bad is in the forest fucking with us. One of the girls starts crying and saying that she wants to go home right now, and we're trying to tell her that we shouldn't because none of us are walking through the woods in the middle of the night. At this point, the sun is starting to go down and it's getting a little cloudy outside. We eat something and turn on the radio for a while, but we really can't get a station out there with anything decent. So we turn it off at about the time that Tan's cousin shows up. He was like 19, I think. At this point, the sun is just barely over the horizon and he has one of those heavy duty lantern flashlights and another rifle. He walks up to the trailer and we whisper to Tan, asking him if he's sure that's his cousin, and he says, yes. The guy looks behind him and all around the camp, then walks in. He kind of glances at all of us and looks a little confused. He says, where's your other little buddy at? I figured she would meet up at the cabin. Is she a little slow or something? He also asked whether we had been cooking blood in the cabin because it smelled like blood and hot pants all the way up the trail. We all say at the same time, fucking nope, but we ask him what the fuck he's talking about with the girl he saw. He had come down the same trail Tan had been using, and he had come up on one of your guy's buddies, standing in the middle of the trail, looking at him, slack jawed. He had asked her a bunch of questions, but all she did was just look at him. Then she smiled at him, and he said he kept walking. She couldn't seem to keep up with him and kept lagging a little behind him. He said he asked her if she was hurt or something and if she needed any help, but she just continued to stare. Eventually, he had been walking and turned around a bend in the trail, but when he turned around and went back to see if she was okay, the trail was empty. So he assumed that she must have taken a shortcut through the woods to our trailer. We tell him the whole story of what's been going on, I half expected him to say we were full of shit, but he just listened and then sat down on the couches in the living room. Tanner's cousin gets back to the girl, he says, when she had kept trying to lag behind him. It had kind of weirded him the fuck out, so he tried to keep her in front of him, but no matter how slow he walked, she was always lagging a little bit behind, and that he smelled this nasty smell and it got stronger as he got to the camp. Eventually, it got really strong. She had said something really low that he didn't catch. And when he had turned around, she had been right the fuck up on him. And he stepped back from her. It was at this point he asked her if she was okay. And if she wasn't, he would carry her back the rest of the way. But instead, she stayed quiet and just kept staring. He said that's when he reached out for her. As in to grab her on the shoulder. But he must have misjudged the distance because she was off to the side where he had put his hand like she had moved while he was looking dead at her. So at this point, we know the shit's real unless Tan is playing a joke, which we can tell he's not because he's almost pissing his pants. So they load up their rifles. We eat some more 
and we just kind of sit around until about 11. To this fucking day, every time I think about this, I really pray to God that it's not some huge prank that my cousins played on me and just never revealed, so I was shit for the rest of my life. At around 11, the stink of copper turns into an actual nasty, gross, blood-like smell. Like cooking blood and hair. Tan and his cousin Reese get the fuck up instantly and grab the rifles. There's like a half knock, half claw at the door. And I shit you not, there's this voice. And it sounds like when you see those YouTube cats and YouTube dogs whose owners teach them how to quote talk. So after the half knocking and half clawing at the door, it says in this weird toned voice, let me the fuck in, stop fucking playing. It made my fucking nuts creep up against my body. And one of the girls just starts crying and calling on Jesus. It was so fucking obviously not a person talking. It didn't have the right cadence. And that's some shit that I never realized until that moment. But all the people have a certain cadence when they talk, no matter what language. All people have a certain kind of rhythm to talking. This shit didn't have any kind of cadence. One of those YouTube cats, that's what the fuck it sounded like outside the door. So now I'm in full on terror mode. We keep yelling outside, who is it? Stop fucking around man. And just keep saying, let me the fuck in for almost about 15 minutes. Let me the fuck in. Let me the fuck in. Let me the fuck in. But if you can't imagine how this shit sounded, then you can't imagine how fucked up the whole situation was. So then the smell goes away for a while, and for the next hour or so, you can hear someone basically creeping around in the woods. Every couple of minutes, it comes back into the door and say something. Finally, when the smell fades away, it's around 2 in the morning. Ree says, man fuck this, and opens the door and walks outside with his rifle. He fires a shot into the air and says something to the effect of, in the name of Jesus Christ, go away, go away. He fires two more times, but then, from the woods, right up against the river, across from the trailer, there comes this sound, like a slowly gibbering and hooting sound. Then it starts screaming, and it sounds almost like a woman and a cat in a bag screaming together. Like, I seriously have never heard any shit like that. Reese fires into the tree line, and then starts backing into the house. We lock the door, and we can hear the shit keening and screaming. Reese says something had come out of the bushes, super low to the ground, and crawling towards the cabin. He had shot at it, but pretty much that was how the rest of the night went. It was literally screaming constantly for the next two hours and we could hear shit moving out into the tree line but it never came back up to the cabin until everyone had finally fallen asleep tan had been sitting in the chair watching the door with his rifle nobody else heard or saw this and he told me two days later after the whole thing was over he said he had been nodding off after the screaming and noises finally stopped and he had been almost asleep when he saw someone come out of the bathroom and then lay down in the middle of the floor and go to sleep. He just assumed it was one of us and he had nodded off. Then he said he kind of realized something was wrong and while pretending to be sleeping, he counted us. There were nine people in the cabin. He basically didn't want to try to shoot at the fucking thing in the cabin and have it kill us all then and there or have Reese wake up and start shooting and then we kill ourselves so he just stayed awake all night pretending to be asleep he said sometimes it would stand up and kind of do this weird jittery thing or heave like it was laughing but then it would lay back down the story closes pretty weak because from my perspective nothing happened we woke up and i noticed that tan was a little jittery and that he was avoiding looking at all of us but we ate some breakfast packed up and started walking to his house. He stayed last in the cabin and he would lock up and bring me my uncle's keys to just start walking and he would catch up, which I didn't really want to fucking do. When we got a little bit up the path and when he came running up, 
Basically, we just jogged back to his house. His cousin took us home. There was a window in the bathroom. We were too stupid to lock a screenless window. The window was fucking up when he went in there. Now, as you can imagine, I'm guessing it must have been doing that all night, waiting for us to fall asleep or slip up and then getting in among us. As a matter of fact, it walked with us all the goddamn way back to his house. And then he said it lagged to the back of the group and looked him dead in the eyes before walking back into the woods.